still need to complete the army for remake. All right. Welcome 
Hello. Welcome Hello. to the mental illness. I mean, the Resident Evil stream. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome, Foxy Gamer. Hey, Neon the Cartoon. Hey, Nyx. Hey, Nano Abyss. Hey, Mish. Hey, Fantol. Hello there, Keyboard Smash. Hey there. Glitch Crown. Hey there, Meredith. J-Rex, Dr. Joker, James the Diamond Sword. Hey, Ashers. Ashers are streaming right now, by the way. Hey, Emerald Sword. Hey, Monk Balls. Hey, Purple Max. Hey, Nutella. Hey, Shark Jumping Walrus. Welcome to the stream. Sorry for the delay. Uh, there was too much lore. <laughs> there was there, way there too was, much there lore. Was... There was, there was so much lore, and I needed to be thoroughly scared before we started. For those that weren't uh, on the know... Hey, Cornelius, thank you for the eight months. I'm so excited I am to hear you guys gush about cool stuff, even though I already did that half an hour ago. Oh. For those that weren't here uh, on, you know, Poster's channel, uh, we were streaming Anatomy a few hours ago because I was obsessed with that game and I really wanted to see Zach's reaction to it while I was finishing up the PowerPoint presentation for this stream. And then I ended up not doing much because I got way too engrossed on the stream and his reactions. I was gonna say, there was a certain point where it didn't even sound like you were working on the slideshow anymore yeah. and you were just like glued to the screen. I was glued to the screen, sorry. <laughs> but we're still, we still have a semi-rushed, fucked up version of the PowerPoint that I was working on ever since the morning. Mm -hmm. I think that it still came out all right. The only good one is- I have nothing for the 16 months. PS3 with a PS Move controller too. We are going to be talking about some Resident Evil lore. This has been in the works for Very months. For this dream, I blame you for making me get <laughs> Thank you, Alderite, right, for the five months. Now I have a new favorite franchise thanks to you all. I and love Pog. Like for, for those that weren't here, I forced my audience to like Resident Evil. Uh -huh. I I played Resident Evil 4 back some long time ago, the original RE4 to show my audience, because I loved, I loved the series, and that game specifically, because it's like one of my, this, me, my favorite game of all time, Resident Evil 4, the original, uh, and also the remake that came out, like, recently. And that stream this had, like... This is about to go very well, or anything <laughs> absolutely awful. Can't wait. Thank you, JP. The, that stream had like what a hundred viewers or something like barely nobody cared at all right because I was just I was famous in that so time for playing mask of horror games, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I clawed and fought and screamed To make sure that everyone on the channel understood Resident Evil is What's up? I love Deltarune. I love Undertale. I love a lot of Masked Horror games. I have a lot of interest on the channel, but Resident Evil is one of the main ones. Hey, Queen Voodoo, hey, thank you for so, five. Pastry and Nick, hope y'all are great. Ever since then, I streamed Resident Evil One Remake. I streamed, I streamed Resident Evil Two, Resident Evil Three Remake, which I mean, bleh, but whatever. Uh, Resident Evil Four, Resident Evil Four Remake, Resident Evil Five with Nick, Resident Evil Seven. Resident Evil uh, 8! Phil, yes? Well, um, you forgot one game that we have to play. Don't no, worry no, no, about we it! No, we didn't. Don't worry about it! Don't worry about it! Another game? We don't worry play. about it! That'll be later! But, <laughs> we... We went through a lot of stuff here on the channel to get to this point. Hey, or I think for the 18 board. months. The here might be evil. evil. We... I already played through most of the games on the mainline series, but there's still a lot to get through. Is that mm -hmm. Exol? to mess with you and the co-host. Have you guys seen the Silent Hill combat? Oh, we have, and we've talked about oh, it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Hard. It was really bad. Yeah, it was it's really bad. bad, but this time it's Resident Evil, not fucking Silent Hill. We're gonna talk about that later. Don't worry about it. It's Doodle Think for the Five. One of the re remakes but with a bunch of ridiculous meme skin mods installed. That's pretty fun. I think someone replaced Mr. X with Buff Pooh Bear. We are going to go through the story of every single Resident Evil game that we've played on the channel, plus the ones that we haven't, just so that everyone can get caught up to speed on the story of this dumb, <laughs> dumb series. I've been playing the I have to jigger, think you have five. So this is gonna be fun. Look. 
Resident Evil story is bad. Like, we did a we did a lore stream before for another game that had a really bad lore and story, but it doesn't compare. It doesn't compare to this dumb bullshit. This Not is at all. categorically the dumbest fucking story for like a horror franchise that I've ever seen. I'm not the biggest fan. And I love it. I, love I was going to say so Resident Evil fun. is one of the few game franchises I can name where the fans will collectively say, "Yeah, the story sucks, <laughs> but god, do we love it." I want more. <laughs> Give me more slop. Capcom, please more slop. <laughs> like we, you, we get the new games, and the new games are like very disconnected from the rest of the fucking universe, the stupid goddamn universe. But every time that Umbrella comes back, or the connections comes back, or or like the family, or like the C virus, or whatever, like we go like, oh, the, this dumb shit. They're talking about the dumb shit again. Yes. <laughs> Umbrella. <laughs> Umbrella. That was literal. That was literally Village. That was literally Village. Just yeah. like, oh, it's super it's disconnected. Oh, oh, the dumb shit's back. The oh dumb my shit god, back. Oh, I miss, I miss <laughs> the dumb shit. I miss you. Like, like Capcom, like Capcom is very afraid of talking about the dumb shit because, like, they went crazy back in like the 2010s. So, like, they're just like slowly sprinkling it nowadays. So, some of you that are just getting into the series right now may not understand the extent of the dumb shit. So we are, don't worry, we are here to provide you with a thorough explanation of the entirety of the Resident Evil storyline. Hey Boo, thank I you for the vibe. You know what? Mm -hmm. you, you know what the funny thing is too about like Resident Evil lore dumbness? Mm -hmm. I, I hear a lot of people say, oh, Resident Evil really jumped the shark after four or five. Ooh, Resident Evil got really dumb after those games. I personally believe that Resident Evil lore was dumb right from the very beginning. Like, Bitch. right from the first game, it was ridiculous. Bitch, we had <laughs> bipedal, dumb lizard hunter motherfuckers in a far away mansion in the middle of the woods that explodes and then the the game right before that is about a fucking sentient colony of leeches like possessing and reconstructing the body of an old man and transforming him into an anime villain shut the fuck like, up <laughs> resident evil was dumb right from the get-go <laughs> there was no point in which this series was not dumb it's kind of beautiful. Baby for mate. Thank you. Though, the last two are purely because of Pastra's praise for the baby and his whining over Nemesis. Oh, Schnoodle, thank you for the ten dollars. Uh, Dav says, "Why is the Resident Evil? Is he stupid?" Okay, so like, th thank you for the donation. That's a very big donation, just to make a joke. But honestly. 90% of the reasons for why people do shit in this goddamn series might actually be just they're just dumb. They're just dumb. No, yeah. Like, dude, there's, there are certain characters me. where, like, we're going to get into talking about their motivations yeah. and what made them the characters they are. And it basically boils down to they're stupid. Yeah. They're yeah. either they're really stupid. Motherfuckers. They're either stupid, really horny, or like a combination of both. There's a guy. There's a guy that blows oh up an entire God. island because he suspects that his higher ups maybe want to fire him at some point. <laughs> there's two, actually. There's two of them. If you don't count Birkin, Birkin did that shit as well. Technically, there's a yeah. lot of dumb shit in this series, and we are very glad to show you show it to you. Now, happy birthday, by the way, Zach. Well, birth the oh, birthday was yesterday. Yeah, belated birthday. My my birthday was yesterday. Um, I spent, I spent. Pretty much the entire thing watching Resident Evil movies and the Ring movies. Hell so yeah, studying I, for this play for this time. Oh, I was, <laughs> I was, I was both adult. I was indulging two hyperfixations at the same time. Like yesterday was wonderful. Me and Nick, like a few days ago, like Nick came over to my place and we watched two of the dumb Resident Evil animated CGI movies that are canon to the games. And, yep. so and like the, and we went into them like, okay, the first one kind of sucked, the second one kind of good, but that. We realized and we We're talked about the story. Ones. Yeah, we talked about the story and we went like, hold on a second. This movie is actually just useless though. Nothing happened. Nothing actually happens to move any anything forward. The Leon could have just left within the first 10 minutes of the movie and everything would have just turned out the same. It's <laughs> you, you know what? You know what's wonderful about that too, by the way, that yeah. I didn't bring up before stream? 
Mm -hmm. You guys watch the movies that I need a refresher on. Yeah. I watch the ones that you need a refresher on because I watched the two that you didn't. Perfect. Right. <sighs> yeah, we are perfect for this. Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. I think I think that's mostly it. I think I presented what we're going to be doing pretty well. Is everybody confused? Uh, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page as us, we are going to be covering the games. <coughs> Hold on. <clears throat> Let me get the list. Hold on. <laughs> I, I would like be moving around papers, but like we don't use paper anymore. We use like Discord DMs. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> we were we were freaking in each other's DMs. Like, oh, throw this game in there. Throw this game in there. Oh, we need to talk about we this. Yeah, we need this one. So we are going to be covering Resident Evil One Remake, Resident Evil Zero, Resident Evil Two, Resident Evil Three, Resident Evil Code Veronica X. Resident Evil 4, Resident Evil 4 Separate Ways, Resident Evil 5, Resident Evil 6, Resident Evil 7, Resident Evil 8, Revelations 1. Hey, Rocky Star, Star, thank you for the five pounds. I'm doing well. Hell yeah. Just here to say have fun talking about Relore. Also, we have tap news on Glitch channel. Great. Oh yeah, I think there's a cane plushie going on right now. I'm going to buy oh, the yeah. shit out of that after this is over. Oh, really? It looks really cute. Yeah. Uh, Revelations 1, Resident Evil Revelations 2, Resident Evil Survivor, Resident Evil Chronicles, Umbrella Chronicles, and Dark Side Chronicles, the Resident Evil Degeneration, Damnation, Vendetta, Death Island, and not Infinite Darkness, because that one really fucking sucks. I don't really, I don't want to care. I don't yeah, want to talk about that Darkness one. Yeah, Infinite Darkness just kind of sucked. Yeah. I haven't seen it. We will not be talking about the Resident Evil live action movies, because those occur in their own separate continuity. And all the good stuff that you can take from that is just ripped off from the games. Someone asked about Gaiden. Isn't Gaiden like RE1? No, Gaiden is... Okay, Resident Evil Survivor 4 Gaiden Dead Aim is a game that came out not in America. It was like Japanese only, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that one is not really canon because oh, okay. it is never mentioned anywhere ever again and is like made by a completely different branch away from Capcom. It is still very stupid though. There is actually a trans villain in there. One of the main uh, villains of that game transforms themselves into a sexy lady tyrant with electrical okay. powers and with bio heels. But aside I mean, from that- I remember oh, that. Girl. But aside from that, there's not much to say about it. Like, it's just some guy goes into a boat, finds, like, a Chinese super spy, and stops a, a, stops a guy that, like, like an ex-Umbrella employee, like a disgraced Umbrella employee from, like, destroying mm. the world, and that's about it. But that's... Uh, go, going into a boat to save the world is, like, par for the course of the, in the Resident Evil universe at this point. Yeah. Electric boobies! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's about it for Gaiden. Like, we're not gonna talk about that one, because, like, it's way too much for way too little, to be honest. And we need to we need to focus on the main ones, because we're gonna be here for eight hours. We uh, are going to... Just from Resident Evil 1, we're gonna be here for so long. I, I have to mention, chat, and I will say this to both Zach and Nick. Mm -hmm. If it's been, like, five hours or eight hours, and we're still in Resident Evil 3 or 4... We're gonna pause the stream, and we're gonna continue next week, cause... Okay. I... Sure. We, for the last lore stream, we were here for, what, 10 hours? 11 hours? 10 and a half. 10 and a half hours. And that includes just like 8 games that barely have any fucking story. This is- uh, this- yep. this series actually has a story. So, and we don't know how long this is gonna be. I give way more of a shit about these games too, so I'm gonna have more to talk about. I'm gonna have much more heated opinions. Yeah. So we are gonna be here for a while, and if it comes way too, it becomes way too long, we will split the stream into a second part for the next week. Hopefully, that's understandable for everybody. Did you see any of the Netflix show? No! 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 Oh, I did. You did? I did. I did. Was it good? Reluctantly, I did. Oh. No! No! <laughs> no! <laughs> you insane? Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, we're not gonna be talking about the Netflix show. That <laughs> is... not really oh, relevant. I forgot about it. 
Remember when the, the creators of that Netflix show said that the that it was canon to the games and it was taking inspiration? Yeah. It's like, fuck you, fuck you, it isn't, fuck you. What the fuck are you talking yeah. about? Somehow. <laughs> uh, you ever see, uh, do you ever see Welcome to Raccoon City? No, no. I haven't. But I saw yeah. the cow flying off after the city was blown up at the end. That shit was yeah. funny. The like, shit somehow they, they mixed uh, one and two, and I, I don't think that works. At all because, I think the city was you know, burning down while Stars, Bravo, and Alpha Team was exploring the mansion, which makes no fucking sense. Yeah, that makes no sense. Also, you get to <laughs> see fucking, like, Lisa <laughs> Trevor at the RPD, <laughs> if I recall correctly. Shut the fuck up! Really? What yeah. the fuck? Ugh. She fights a liquor. <laughs> she's trying to fight- she's trying to fight her mother in the RPD?! What?! Yeah, doesn't find her there, if you believe that. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Raven Lockwins, for the ten dollars. Okay, uh, we're gonna just start. Uh, I'm gonna thank everybody for the donations, and we're just gonna start talking because, like, we need okay. some kind of structure for this stream. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> thank you, Raven Lockwins, for the ten dollars. Thank you, Cartoon Queen, for the five dollars. Thank you, Chrissy, for the two euro. Thank you, Static Soul, for the five dollars. Thank you, Rocky Stan, for the five euro. Thank you, Kind of Graceful, for the two dollars. Thank you, JT, for the sixteen months. Thank you, Lugs, for the super chat. Thank you, Nano Abyss for the five dollars. Thank you, Dav, for the super chat. Thank you, Static Soul, for the five dollars again. Thank you, Not a Soviet Spy, for the two dollars. We're gonna talk about fucking Vladimir. Oh. Anyways, thank you, Snoodle, for the ten dollars. Thank you, is. Boo, five for the five dollars. Thank you, Rolling Kirby, for the fourteen months. Thank you, Purple Shannon, for the five dollars. Thank you, Foolish Fiend, for the two Canadian dollars. Thank you, Octo Joker, for the five dollars. Thank you, Neander Cartoon, for the two dollars. Autism stream. Let's go. Let's go. Thank you, Static Soul for the five dollars. Thank go. you, Snoodle for the five dollars. Thank you, Ori for the eighteen months. Thank you, Fun Time for the membership. Thank you, Kind of Graceful for the five dollars. Thank you, Queen Voodoo. Thank you, PSX something. Thank you, Shy Mike for the one gifted. Thank you, Lori for the two pound, and Wildcard for the five dollars. Woo! All right. Let's go. It's time. It Welcome time. to Resident Evil. Hey, I'm still relatively new to the real lore, so I'm excited to see how Leon, Claire, Chris, and Jill somehow end up in Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> Back in 1990 something. Capcom released Resident Evil for the PS1. This is the intro to that game. Look at that crunchy ass fucking intro. Oh, oh, oh I'm so ready to see this old ass opening. Oh, the live action one? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Resident Evil. 1996. Oh, I was really hoping this would be the one that shows the whole cast with live action yes. actors. Yes, don't worry. Okay. So this okay. game was released by Capcom in 1996. And it blew the hell up because it was like an actionized spiritual successor to Alone in the Dark. Alone in the Dark was a PC game that's like... Very primitive graphics, like pre-render graphics with like extremely low poly characters that had like weird magical bullshit and shit. This is basically Capcom's take to Alone in the Dark, and it turned out to be one of the biggest horror franchise ever made. Because of the gameplay, because people found it very scary and like the, the story was great and like it, it became like a cultural phenomenon both in Japan and in the West. For those that do not know... Resident Evil is actually called Biohazard in Japan, and they changed the name to Resident Evil in America because apparently Biohazard was like a band in America and they didn't have the copyright for that. He already thanked me for it. I think I'm one of his favorites. Thank you, Snoodle. This is the story of Resident Evil 1. Oh my god, the old oh. the character selection! Yeah! In Resident Evil 1, you play as either Jill Valentine or Chris Redfield. Canonically, I do believe that Jill is the canon storyline for Resident Evil 1. Mm. 
1998, July. Raccoon City Forest. Alpha Team is flying around the forest zone situated in Northwest Raccoon City, where we're searching for the helicopter of our compatriots Bravo Team, who disappeared. So fucking it's stanky old. It's so crunchy looking. Bizarre murder cases have recently occurred in Raccoon City. There are outlandish reports of families being attacked by a group of about 10 people. I've never seen this Victims problem. were apparently eaten. The Bravo cool. team went to the hideout of the group and disappeared. Can I put on subtitles? No. Look, Chris! <laughs> <laughs> That's the first line of Jill Valentine in the entire series. Look, Chris! This live action footage! That someone filmed in like the back lot garden of the Capcom offices. It was Bravo Team's <laughs> helicopter. Nobody was in it. But strangely, most Mary. of the equipment was still there. Wasker! <laughs> However, we with Wesker. the fucking glasses! <laughs> this voice acting sucks. You don't even know. You are not ready. Someone said Mustard Wesker. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, that wasn't me who donated. That was an alternate. Oh my oh. god! Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> it's so low FPS. Man, Resident Evil became so ridiculous Joseph! after four. Joseph! <laughs> yeah, specifically. Yeah, yeah that four, one take, yes. one take. It was fine. That was not. You just needed to say one name. Oh shit! And that's all you could do. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph! <laughs> like she ran away and shot at nothing and then eventually waited to say that line. No! Don't, don't go! go. Stretches out his arm. Oh. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. Oh man. Damn. Kill, run for that house. The mansion. <laughs> here we go. Let's go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Chris Redfield. Give it up for my 14. Jill Valentine! Let's go! That's just a kid. That's like a, like a teenager. Yep. We got for this fucking live action bit. Barry! Barry! Rebecca Chambers. Oh, Rebecca! Yeah! yeah! Whisker! Blood typo! 38 years old! Resident Evil. Yeah! They have escaped into the mansion where they thought it was safe. Yet. What is this? Wow. <laughs> what a mansion. Captain Wesker, where's Chris? Stop it. Don't open that door. <laughs> like a fucking YouTube poop. It's like for for those that don't understand, 
I love how the dogs sound like sharp tooth from land before time. For those that didn't understand, the reason for why the voice acting in this original game is so, so, so bad is because this was made by Japanese people that had no knowledge of the English language. It'll never be House of mm -hmm. the Dead levels of voice acting. No, it gets there, Matthew. Like, I fully believe that it's up there with House of the Dead, too. Like, the Japanese developers took a bunch of, like, foreigners off the street for the Resident Evil 1 and just told them, hey, can you say English words at, at the script? Can you read the script? Can you say words at the script? And they say, yeah, I can, no problem. And then we ended up with this magnificent piece of voice acting where they took every single syllable that the character said and they edited it together to make it sound the coolest in the Japanese like developers heads they didn't understand what they met they said right mm -hmm. they didn't know what the characters were saying so they just took every single sound bite that they produced and cobbled it together into the most coolest version of that line possible so you get this awkward like stop it don't open that door <laughs> stop it don't <laughs> open that door right what is it Maybe it's Chris. It's art. Now, Jill, can you go? I'm going with you. Chris is our old partner, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this. I love oh Barry so much. Stay alert. Stay alert. <laughs> All right. So that is the intro to Resident Evil One. Ah. Who wants to start? Ah! Stop it! Ah! What the fuck? <laughs> what? What? Where? Where's it coming from? It's, it's, playing the, it's playing the video. It's playing the video. There we go. There you go. <laughs> ah! Stop it! Ah! <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna change sprites. Otherwise, it's, it starts again for some reason. <laughs> ah! Wait! Why? <laughs> stop it! <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, now, now we should be good. That should be okay. good, right? Okay. Ah! Why? <laughs> okay, we're just gonna keep we're just gonna keep it in 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 in, in this mode for now. <laughs> Getting flashed! <laughs> oh my god. Okay, who wants to take the floor first? Does anybody want to start? Zach, you want to say something? Nick? Sure. Okay. Did okay. I, didn't so even, like... I didn't even finish this this game. <laughs> so... Yeah. Okay, Zach. <laughs> We want like a brief summary of the opening, the basic plot synopsis of RE1. Yes. Okay, so as shown in that immaculately filmed opening from the original game, the whole deal with Resident Evil 1 is that it takes place in the Arkley Mountains uh, by Raccoon City, which uh, that's going to be a place you're going to hear about a lot. Just get ready for that. Where basically... Uh, a string of murders have been occurring around the mountains where people have been reporting groups of uh, people attacking uh, attacking a bunch of civilians. People are coming up uh, with corpses that are literally found mangled and half eaten. Um, and the STARS unit, Special Tactics and Rescue Service, was essentially sent to these mountains after another team went missing to uh, go and investigate what was going on up there. So, uh, we've got, uh... Oh. Complete awkward silence, so stop you. Sorry, don't worry, we, don't, don't worry, the aesthetic soul is referencing. We have an entire 10 minute video wa like to watch the fucking horrible voice acting, so don't worry. You're do wondering roughly the $10. Do you think they should add <laughs> yeah, so, um... Since people that yeah, Star Stars ends up going up games. into the Arkley Does Mountains to try and find where Bravo Team video. went. And upon arriving there, they are attacked by a group of mutated dogs. Uh, which forces them to run into this seemingly abandoned mansion. Um, and as shown there, uh, the STARS unit consists of quite a few characters, but the most important ones for Resident Evil 1 uh, are Wesker, Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, Barry Burton, Rebecca Chambers, um, our homie Brad, who wasn't in yeah, that yeah, yeah. Uh, cutscene, but he's important, he's important. Don't he's forget about Brad. Pilot. Exactly, we all love Brad. Oh, and don't forget Joseph! Joseph! <laughs> yeah, so, um... So, yeah, Star's unit ends up getting trapped inside this mansion. Uh, Jill and Chris get separated and go on their different this campaigns, is which is really confusing, because 
both of their campaigns are like proposed as being like happening at the same time, but also stuff happens in both campaigns that, you know, happen at the same, like happen to both characters just swapped. Mm -hmm. Like it's really, it's really, really weird. The, 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 the two different story routes for both Jill and Chris are weird. That is um, something that I have to explain. Uh, there are actually, many of the Resident Evil games have multiple endings. We have in the first one, a scenario for Jill to explore the mansion, and we have a scenario with Chris exploring the mansion. Now, we also have the remakes to take into account for the story. There will be a lot of times here in this stream where we will just talk about the general story of the games, but some of the minor details will have to be left out because the canon here is very fluid. You will have scenarios where characters start referencing past events and future games, and those events make no fucking sense because mm -hmm. characters start dying and reappearing and appearing and getting trapped or like getting kidnapped in various locations seemingly with no coherence in the timeline because sometimes they have to be there to help out one character escape and one to kill another character like in Resident Evil 1 if you choose Jill to play Chris is stuck in a prison for the entirety of the Resident Evil storyline. But then, future Resident Evil uh, stories show Chris and Jill exploring the mansion together, which is incoherent because the entire game relies on Jill wanting to find Chris or Chris wanting to find Jill and discovering the reason for why they went missing. It is stupid. <laughs> yeah, really and like, weird. adding on to that too, um, I won't go into detail about how Resident Evil 1 ends, because that we'll get to that. But like details like the ending, for example, the ending of Resident Evil 1 plays out the exact same way no matter which campaign you pick, except the character you pick is just in the place of the other. Yep. So if you play as Jill for her campaign, the ending plays out the exact same way, except it's Jill doing it. If you pick Chris, exact same ending, but now it's Chris doing it. So it's like both of their campaigns are treated like separate storylines happening at the same time. But there's overlap there where it's like, okay, so which one's the canon one who was here in this ending? Like, for this game, you have Jill being accompanied by Barry Burton trying to find Chris. And then you have Chris being accompanied by Rebecca Chambers trying to find Jill. And Resident Evil Zero is a prequel to this and establishes that Rebecca was inside and survived the events of the Arclay Mountains. Which means that Chris, exploring the mansion with Rebecca, is 100% canon because that's her story. That's what she's supposed to be doing in the story of these games. But then you have Barry, which appears in Resident Evil 3 to help out Jill. So their stories are also concurrently also canon at this. Weird Nem says on the chat, it's all canon if you try hard enough. Like, we're already at the start of the series as the first game in the franchise. And we are already merging canons together in one single game. All y'all motherfuckers with your mascot horror games ain't got shit on this stupid fucking thing. It, we we are trying to find out what's canon or not in this franchise, and we, you know what? We enjoy it, because it's fun. It's fun speculating about this dumb bullshit. Anyways. Yeah, like, I think the general rule of thumb to have as a Resident Evil fan to help you understand, uh, in, a, in future titles, the canon ending to things is just whatever suits the story at the yes. moment. <laughs> the canon ending, if some if something is referenced in future titles, that mean that means that it was canon in the previous game. If not, yeah, forget about it. Anyways, yeah, exactly. So both Chris and Jill go through this mansion, the Spencer Mansion, a spooky mansion in the middle of the woods. And they find zombies in there, and they find tapes, and they find little notes around that talks about a mysterious corporation. This corporation... Oh, <laughs> no, hold on. Oh, oh, no, the, oh, no. the Jill Sandwich. <laughs> the, the evil Jill corporation. Sandwich. <laughs> this they... corporation is supposed to be behind the events of the entire series. It's called the Evil Umbrella Corporation, a pharmaceutical company 
that is pretty much behind the events of every single event in the entire of the franchise. But before we get to the Umbrella Corporation, I want to show some dumb shit. Because Resident Evil uh. 1 Original has some of the best voice acting in the entirety of the video game industry. One of the most iconic scenes that you need to pay attention to, because this gets actually brought up later, like 20 years into the future, is the infamous Resident Evil Jill Sandwich scene. Thank you, Night Demon. Hey, what's going on? Jill? Is that you, Jill? What happened? Barry? Help me, please. The door won't open. Quick! Stay away from the door, Jill. I'm gonna kick this door down. <laughs> Hurry! This way! Oh, Barry! That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. Barry, thanks for saving my life. Yeah. But Barry, didn't you say you're going back to the dining room to do some research? The Why silence. Are you, are you here? Uh, I just had something I wanted to check. Now, let's get back to searching for the lost captain and Chris, shall we? Bye bye, Barry. Thank Barry is so good at hiding secrets. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, oh thank you, Night God. Demon. Thank you. Eh. Anyways, so continuing on from there. Oh. Fuck! Stop! Oh my God, no! <laughs> okay, leave it like this. Every time there's a video, we need to not right not... before. Right before. Okay. So what's actually happening in the Arclay Mountains, Zach? <laughs> Thank you for giving me the floor. I want to talk about Lisa Trevor so yep. much. Okay, so uh, basically, to give you the simple rundown, in the Arkley Mountains, the Spencer Mansion that this entire game takes place in was the home of Umbrella's founder, um, one, uh, oh my god, what was his name? Oswell, Oswell Spencer. Oswell Spencer. Oswell Spencer. And essentially, this mansion and its purpose was both his living quarters as well as a secret laboratory where they were testing and experimenting on an on a virus called the progenitor virus this progenitor virus would later on be um would, would later on be mutated and changed into what the series is no like the most iconic virus in the series the t virus but at the time it was just the simple progenitor now um, what ended up happening was that there was a massive outbreak of this virus in the facility, which ended up causing all the zombies to start turning and killing people. Um, but as well as that, there were some other bioweapons and monsters that were experimented on and got out. Uh, the one that I'm most fascinated by and easily my favorite monster in the original Resident Evil yeah. is that freaky tentacle monster over to the right named Lisa Trevor. Um, now fun fact about this monster. Lisa Trevor was not in the original game that we keep using clips from. She was actually added in the remake of Resident Evil 1. Wait, and really? she is yes, she was she was know. added retroactively to the remake and she is easily one of the most oh. interesting characters cuz if you look at that photo next to her of the family um that is the family of the architect who was responsible for building the Spencer mansion. Um for I'm, I'm blanking on his name. Was his name George Spencer? Am I remember? Or I, not Spencer? Oh my God, Trevor. Yeah, George Trevor. Thank you. George Trevor was the architect who was responsible for building the Spencer Mansion, um, as well as the secret lab that was underneath it. Uh, and once he had finished constructing this building for Spencer, um, Spencer immediately was super paranoid about keeping this guy alive because he's the only other person alive now who knows about the secret lab's existence and knows the layout of this entire building. So Spencer made quick work to kill uh, George Trevor, who spent a long time like hiding within the building after he found out they were trying to kill him. But eventually I believe he starved to death uh, hiding from Umbrella. Yes. Um, yes. And Spencer, Spencer uh, first thought the job was done, but realized, oh shit, no wait, George Trevor had a family. He had a wife and a daughter. I need to get rid of them too so that they're not suspicious. So what ended up happening was uh, the Trevor family 
was taken to the Spencer Mansion as a tour of, uh, of the father's creation. And yeah, no, no. Turns out they were there to get killed. Yep. So Spencer up ended tracks. up kidnapping. Exactly. Spencer ends up kidnapping George Trevor's wife, as well as Lisa Trevor. And the two of them became experimental subjects for the progenitor virus. Um, the mother, who I'm blanking on the name of. Um, Lisa? No, that's the name of the daughter. Yeah, that's the daughter. Uh, the mother ended up not being a suitable host for the virus, so they end up killing her. Jessica Trevor. L Jessica Trevor, thank you. Jessica Trevor was not a very suitable host for the virus, so they ended up killing her. Lisa, however... She's special. Was a, she was very, very special. She took to the virus incredibly well. Um, better than any of their test subjects, even. So what ended up happening to Lisa Trevor was she was given possibly one of the worst fates of any character in this entire franchise, where any time they wanted to test a new strain of this virus any form of mutation or change in it, Just they would first it to use it. Exactly, they would first use it on Lisa. So most monsters you see in the Resident Evil series, they are a byproduct of one or maybe two different viruses. Lisa, however, is essentially this amalgamation of every single different strain of the virus that Umbrella came up with, because she was just like their favorite guinea pig to test on. She is seemingly immortal and now roams the mansion. Now that everyone is infected and like dead inside of the mansion, she basically just roams trying to find the rem the remains of her like her mother. Cause that's the other thing, is that um while they experimented on her, um, she was obsessed with getting back to her parents without knowing like she she had no idea that they were killed already. So Umbrella, now scared of this immortal monster they created um in ended up trying to find ways to control her they would shackle her up and most notably was that they began taking other like staff members who vaguely resembled her parents and they had them play the role of essentially imposter parents that would pretend to be both george and jessica trevor thing was though lisa could tell the difference between her real parents and the staff members of umbrella so she began killing every single pair of staff members that was given to her to be her fake parents, she would rip off their faces, sew Ugh. them together, and create a mask for herself that was a sewn together amalgamation of all her fake parents' faces. Because her own face from all of the experiments they did on her was literally rotting off, you and she was waiting the, for the day. The bones <laughs> and the fucking, the, the, the sinew and the like the the pink part of the teeth you can see it like right underneath all the mask and it's just completely screwed up i don't think jay even yeah. has a jaw i don't think she does her entire face is just like gone and the whole thing is now she's roaming around the spencer mansion to try and find her parents so they can give her her real face back and in the meantime she wears the faces of all her fake parents um another fun fact about her is that Eventually, Umbrella was so scared of her that I, they tried terminating her and just getting rid of her. Didn't work. Uh, she came back. She just she just freaking got up again because they just created an immortal monster. And yeah, that's the role she plays in Resident Evil 1 is she's kind of like in, in the Resident Evil 1 remake. She's kind of like your stalker type enemy. She You have random encounters with her. She is impossible to kill. You just have to avoid her to the best of your abilities. And yeah, in Resident Evil 1, she spends the entire game just roaming around the abandoned mansion, shackled up, trying to find her dead parents, not knowing that they're already gone. You can see how fucked up the corporation of the... the Umbrella Corporation of the Resident Evil universe is. So, Lisa Trevor is pretty much the heart of the Resident Evil 1 remake, but even in the original, you see all these notes of, like, test subjects and, like, humans that were, like impacted negatively by the Umbrella Corporation. And it's all just tests for a pharmaceutical company that decided, hey, instead of making good medicine for people to like, help them heal, I think it's actually much, much, much more profitable to be like purveyors of war and like create these bioweapons that to sell them to the, like the black market and sell them to like, uh, like, vulnerable countries that are like looking out for the like experimental weapons to like help them in their conflicts the latter half of the resident evil storyline is all about 
the impact that Umbrella had on the world, because terrorists and a bunch of, like, evil people discovered that these bioweapons could be used for, like, conflict, so just... Umbrella is essentially the originator for, like, the biggest arm race in weapon like new type of weaponry for the entirety of the world they they're like the originator of evil in this universe not because they did everything bad although they did a bunch of shit bad but they basically kick-started the arms race for the entirety of the world to use these fucked up evil bioweapons against each other so most of the games mm -hmm. are about the aftermath of what happened with Raccoon City and their Arclay Mountains and the experiments that happened in there. That's why this is so important, and that's why we're putting so much emphasis in the Resident Evil 1 game. Because even though this game is so old, it's so, so old, it's so old that the remake of it is like 20 years old. It is still <laughs> yeah. the lynch piece that connects all these games together. So yeah, mm -hmm. there's... Anyway, so, if you, recap... Mansion filled with zombies, experiments going on underneath by the Umbrella Corporation. But there's one more wrinkle to this story because the people that went into the Arkley Mountains are not just anybody. They are the STARS unit, a paramilitary group that is filled with like a crew of the most like talented people in the entire world like chris is not just a random schmuck R like chris was like riding on fucking jets like on the age of 16 he was a, like a like a like a jet pilot when he was like a teenager all these people that got sent into the arclay mountains are like the best of the best N uh, not a swat team uh cola more than just a swat team they're like the best super soldiers out there that the world can find, which is fucking stupid because they are a side unit of the Raccoon City Police Department, which is supposed to be for a town of like a hundred thousand people. <laughs> yeah, they're they're a side unit of a police department, but they're also an anti-terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. Like it is it like, is like ridiculous but yeah apparently the ba the best soup the best soldiers of the entirety of the world are just a sidearm of like a random police department in a random city in america but they're also very valuable which means that umbrella upon finding out that one of their research bases got absolutely destroyed and everyone else there is a zombie now decided you know what maybe we can actually use this to our advantage what if we make sure to cover everything that we did inside of this mansion up by luring in the local police department and the stars team we lure them into the base into the into the mansion and we re secretly record everything that they do inside of that mansion and use that as combat data for our future bioweapons this is a concept that is going to be crucial for the future of the stream because the word combat data gets used in every single installment going forward right. and like I i'm so get, i'm I sorry get what they mean with combat it's stupid data. Like, no it's stupid like, what it makes no sense it literally makes it makes no sense it is actually nonsense for those that do not know combat data literally just means we recorded a bunch of people fighting the bioweapons. And because we recorded them doing that, that will be useful in developing future bioweapons that will not get killed by the regular ass people. That is what yeah. they called combat data, which is apparently is worth millions of dollars. Like snuff films of people getting killed by the, the bioweapons is worth like millions of dollars in the black market. And they're very, very, it's very, very useful. It's like the lynch point of like the the motivations of like half the fucking villains in this, in this goddamn series. And one of the people that considered combat data to be extremely useful is one of the captain of the stars unit, fucking Albert Wesker, who in actuality, and actually, is not only the captain of the stars unit but is also secretly working for umbrella this entire time 
Ooh. Oh, oh my god! Oh, <laughs> you can I see it. You can see at the top right a fucking a, like real ass photo of like <laughs> workers with lab coats and like Wesker's and fucking face Wesker. photoshopped. <laughs> And it's like the right so guy the shades. with the shades, yes. Like they have the PS2 model, like photoshopped into like a real ass photo of some scientists. So funny how he always has his like glasses. He loves on. shades, yeah. Albert yeah, Wesker. Albert Wesker is a blonde guy with sunglasses, and he never takes those off ever. Not even in the dark, fucking Arclay Mountains or the fucking oh, Spencer oh. Mansion, where it's pitch fucking black. This guy will never take off his glasses. Oh he God, refuses. That, that reminds me of one of his like weaknesses in like Ari. Mm -hmm. oh yes, God. yes, yes. It's oh fucking stupid. So, anyways, oh <laughs> now we have this corporation. We have the Umbrella Corporation that fucked up and basically killed all these people in the mountains and released this virus out into the wild that is like killing people on the outskirts of Raccoon City. You have the uh, founders of Umbrella, which are. Oswell E. Spencer, James Marcus, which is the guy on the right here, and mm -hmm. uh, I think it's Ashford, one of the... Uh, Edward Ashford. Those are the three founders of Umbrella, and every single one of them gets a focus in, rest, in future Resident Evil uh, installments. But for now, we're... This is Spencer's mansion. He is the main guy, the main dude that thought up of the concept of Umbrella in the first place, and his ultimate goal is to construct the, ult the ultimate bioweapon, which is that guy on the bottom right called a tyrant. A tyrant is a special test subject that is infected with a T-virus, but instead of becoming a regular ass zombie, they become a super mega super soldier with a giant claw, with a giant like knife arm on the right, and like an, a giant exposed weak point heart in front of him because fuck you. Uh, that is under complete control of Umbrella. Hey, Matthew, and, thank um, you for the five dollars. And uh, if I may interject at this point too, mm -hmm. I feel like it's time that we uh, talk about something that I feel like is going to be a very important factor of the stream that we're going to need to do. Yes. Because mm -hmm. you brought up T-virus, oh. and earlier I was talking about progenitor virus. We're mm -hmm. going to need to bring up the differences here with right, these different right, right. viruses in these games. Because there's a lot of infections, and they're very- they're all important in some way. Okay. Um... Hmm? So... <laughs> basically, Umbrella is a pharmaceutical company that is experimenting with bioweapons. Thank you, Static Soul, for the five dollars. Umbrella found somewhere in Africa a very special little flower where inside of that flower, there is a virus. And that virus is called the progenitor virus. Spencer just found it in a fucking random temple while he was exploring Africa because like young Spencer loved exploring the world for some reason. Uh, the progenitor we'll virus, the yeah. <laughs> the progenitor virus is a very kind of weak virus that just kind of enhances a person's natural strengths. It provided comfort to the people in, or in and around the temple by just, you know, consuming the flowers. They got infected with this virus that didn't really actually do much for them. However, using this virus, if you take it and mutate it and adjust it, you can basically create every single virus of the entire series. The main one is called the T-Virus. Named after Trevor, the Trevor virus or something, I think, maybe. Tyrant. It's the tyrant. Oh, the tyrant. Make tyrants. Yeah, tyrant virus. Right, right. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, the tyrant virus, which, upon infection, transforms the body of the victims into essentially super durable but super mindless cannibals. This is going to be very controversial. And actually, mm -hmm. this gets actually, like, retconned and unretconned during the series, but all the zombies that you meet in Resident Evil are not actually zombies. They are not oh, undead yeah, corpses. Right. They are manic, aggressive, living human beings infected by the T-Virus that are very durable, 
and their flesh is like rotting away because of the super mega metabolism of the T-virus, but they're not actually dead. Which is a very important point. Because, like, future installments will fuck around with that and try to, like, resurrect other people and stuff like that. But the main T-virus does not actually revive dead tissue. It just makes everything that it infects go crazy and bite people so that it can spread the virus through those bites. Yeah. Eventually, researchers at Umbrella use the T-virus with tyrants, which are basically people that have a very special like, resistance to the virus, similar to Lisa Trevor, and using the virus and some medical science bullshit in like a test tube in a lab or some shit, they're able to create the tyrants, which are special infected that can sustain the virus mutations and they're able to be controlled and they're super strong and they're super deadly. And they essentially want to sell these monsters to the black market so that they can get rich off of people's suffering, I guess? Sure. I guess. I guess, Super yes. Super soldier. Super soldier. Uh, it is actually very funny because... <laughs> this is super fucking funny. Uh, mm -hmm. In Resident Evil 1, you see the very at the very end, you go down into the lab. And Wesker shows, like, it reveals himself as the ultimate villain, uh, the traitor of the stars unit, and shows either Chris or Jill the tyrant in the lab tube thingy at the bottom of the lab and he says right. like oh my god this is like the ultimate bioweapon it's so amazing oh my god this is such a uh, amazing cre oh, it's like he go he fucking he's like going crazy over this magnificent um, pinnacle of technology but what they don't know what capcom doesn't know is that in the future tyrants are like fucking mass-produced like that no problem like over and over and over and over again resident evil 2 has tyrants resident evil 3 has tyrants like the movies have tyrants like for some reason this one tyrant specifically was very dear to wesker but in general tyrants are like whatever for the umbrella company there's an entire island that mass produces them but for some reason the tyrant that was inside of the arclay mountains was really special to him it was never explained because well in the original, it was thought that it was the only one tyrant that survived. But no, later right. it's revealed that it, there's like a fucking hundreds of them later. <laughs> so fucking well, stupid. okay. Um, there, I, I think there is kind of an explanation for that. Mm -hmm. Um, because th as far as far as I know, I may be wrong. It's been a while since I've played RE One. Right. This was the first proper successful tyrant. Right. And the reason why we see tyrants get mass produced later is because later on, uh, the friggin' Mr. X Tyrant in RE2, they got that one's DNA and started cloning him. And that right. Tyrant was made after this one. Okay. So this was the first successful Tyrant that Wesker would have seen. And after the events of RE1, they made the bigger, better one that would be mass produced. So that is a good assumption, Sack. And if you oh, go through no. the main, the main storyline of the Resident Evil games, you may be correct, but Resident Evil Chronicles... <laughs> oh boy, here we go. go. Resident Evil Chronicles would like to disagree with you. Just, I'm just gonna... Like, we're, we're gonna continue. We're, that, that's gonna be for later, but no. That's a good assumption, Sack, but no. There is, in fact, mass-produced tyrants that are way more powerful than this tyrant currently existing in the timeline when this... when Resident Evil 1 takes place. Don't worry. Okay. For, it's just for some reason Wesker likes this one. Like, okay, because eh? I, I think I I think it's also important that chat knows that when it comes to my knowledge of Resident Evil, it mainly comes from the animated movies and the mainline games. So stuff like these Chronicle games you're yeah. bringing up, I'm completely in the dark about. So if there's some fact in those games that completely proves me wrong, I have no idea. Zach, just to show you how much how hard it fucking proves you wrong, like Wesker at the end of the Resident Evil One escapes the Arclay Mountains, but right before he does it. In the Chronicles games, he gets to fight two super tyrants what right, do you mean? right what? near outside the Arclay Mountains. <laughs> no, wait, never mind. No, wait, never mind. I'm actually wrong. No, he gets to fight two super tyrants before the events of the Arclay Mountains, before he meets up with like fucking Alpha Team. No, oh. you're joking. Yes, oh. yes, it's canon. <laughs> anyway, this series is fucking stupid. Anyway, so Wesker killed. Two fucking tyrants, 
before the events of Resident Evil 1, but for some reason, he wants to gather combat data of the Arclay Mountains and get, like, like release this super amazing version of the Tyrant at the end of Resident Evil 1. Uh, I didn't like this one so much. This was like the weakest tyrant we ever see. Epsilon says not super tyrants, just Ivan tyrants. They are more powerful than the uh, fuck than, than that fucking tyrant, though. Anyway, so essentially, Wesker wants to kill the entirety of his team to gather combat data, while also salvaging the tyrant project stuck underneath the arc, the the the, the Spencer Mansion, stuck between all these, like, infected people that were victims of the T-Virus that got out in Resident Evil 1. That's the plan that Wesker wants to do. <laughs> so smart. <laughs> so smart! It's so fucking smart. Such a mastermind. You can tell by, by, the, by the fact that he has, like, sunglasses and all. Oh, and all yeah! That. Just yeah, another thing, so another smart. twist, by the way, that uh -huh. got introduced in Resident Evil 1 what? remake. Uh, actually, it turns out that Wesker did not actually gather the combat data for Umbrella Corporation. He actually was doing that, double-crossing the Umbrella Corporation because he was secretly going to give that combat data and Tyrant Project blueprints to a rival company of Umbr right. to Umbrella. Wesker was actually double-crossing the double-cross of the double-cross Umbrella, was double-crossing both the STARS unit and the Umbrella Corporation, so that he could gather the combat data for another rival company that is NEVER NAMED IN THE SERIES EVER! Which, by the way, adding on to that even further, Wesker <laughs> also confirms in this twist that the entirety of STARS was formed as his personal pet project that he made to do his own bidding, and they were not formed to help people, but instead used that as a front because they were all Wesker's secret minions without knowing. <laughs> I see everyone in the chat go fucking crazy. It's like, oh, you, you thought your fucking bear game with the with the souls infecting another, another bear was fucking... Complicated horror, 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 fuck you. This is the real shit. This oh, is the real stupid shit. I'm so lost right now. I think, I think my favorite <laughs> detail, by the way, my favorite uh. detail, my favorite detail about this twist with Wesker <laughs> is specifically involving Barry. Because yes. Wesker's such a petty piece of shit when it comes to Barry. Because we find out during this twist that Barry was actually in on Wesker's scheme. Yeah, he betrays Not Jill in this story here. You can see yeah. the gun. But it's not because Barry's evil. It's because Wesker told Barry that he was under direct orders from Umbrella that if Barry were to, you know, try and stop him, they would kill his family. This wasn't true. Umbrella had no <laughs> idea that Wesker was doing this. He just told Barry that because he likes using Barry as his personal henchman. And if Barry ever did anything wrong, he would personally just shoot his entire family. Umbrella had no idea that was even a thing. Poor Barry. He literally says that after saying, Gaslighting. Gotta love Barry. Gaslighting, exactly. Now, chat, I know that might have been a lot to take in for the first game. But the reason for why the, the first game is so complicated is not because the first game is actually that complicated, is because retroactively, future games make the make events of the make the events of the first game so much more complicated. Oh my god, when we get to like five and village. Oh yeah. Oh. So 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 so. I'm not even gonna begin with that. We're gonna leave that by the end. Anyway, so I know that this is this have this may have been a lot to take in, and I am very I very much apologize for that. So I've prepared something for y'all. What? Since we have- <laughs> my brain hurts, thank you, Sheriff Puppet. Now that we have explained most of what's going on in Resident Evil 1- one... Oh yeah, they made fucking weird- the T-Virus the can make weird fucking super mutant lizards, by the way, I just- Oh yeah. That happens. Yeah, let's not forget about Plant 42, the uh, giant plant that they just grew in their basement that started killing people. Yeah, the t Bill, it, yeah you can inject the T-Virus into a, a lizard and they become like super hunters. I have a question. What? What about the the sharks? Are they like normal sharks? Oh yeah, the the or... mansion and the mansion like in one side of the mansion in Resident Evil One, they have like a fucking aquarium the size of like an actual water park. 
mm-hmm. they just have sharks in there and they inject them with the T virus and they become like super evil sharks. Oh yeah. That that oh, was yeah. that was a detail. That was a detail <laughs> you missed out on when explaining the T virus. So get this chat, right? The T virus operates under the specific rules that Phil described, where someone who's infected with the T virus, they essentially lose all form of intelligence, but gain the ability to like regenerate at a rapid pace. Yes. So it it like makes you biologically stronger, but you're not intelligent. However, when it's injected into anything but a human, or it a just dog. makes them big. Or a dog, it just makes them big. Yes. That, For that some reason, it. It just makes them big. if you're not oh, yeah. a dog or a human, the T virus will transform you into a giant, hor- horrific version of yourself that wants to kill everything. They get, like, There's fucking, like, spiders become double the size of dogs. Like plants become like tentacle oh, monsters. The snake. Yeah, snakes the become snake. snakes oh become the size of a room. <laughs> Just a regular ass snake. Hey, David Varon, thank you for the seven Canadian dollars. The part where Huggy Wuggy starts a gun running <laughs> Thank you, David. So, oh yeah, and that's also like T virus infested like elephants and Resident Evil outbreak that also become like oh. super giants. The lion. I know there was a lion there's at one a point. There's a fucking lion at some point. Really? There's, a, there's a gator in Resident Evil 2. Like, every single animal that's not a dog or a human becomes super large and evil for some the fucking reason. fucking grave diggers that were just earthworms. Yeah, the, the worms become, like, fucking graboids sized. It is stupid. And those are not experiments of the Umbrella Corporation. Those are just regular animals that got exposed to the T-virus. Ooh. We're, we're, we're talking about the original R3. I can talk about the grave diggers eventually, right? We're going to talk about the grave diggers eventually, yes. The Let's what? fucking go. I love those monsters. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the one that, that got cut from the Resident Evil 3 remake. A- anyway. Yeah, because fuck Catcom. <laughs> Anyways, so I, am so I do apologize once again for offloading all of this information into you. I promise that it's for the next few games, it's not going to be as big as this. Because most of the future games kind of build off, off of the information that you get in Resident Evil 1, right? So to end this section in a in a way that's gonna like uh, refresh people's brains, we're gonna put some uh, brain bleach on. We're gonna actually go and look at the fucking voice acting cutscenes of Resident Evil One for like a little bit. Yay! We're gonna we're gonna oh, look at some cutscene and some funny cutscenes for people to Yay, for people slow. to like calm down. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> oh my god. Uh, I have not I re- played the original Resident Evil on the channel. I've only played the remake. And the remake has stupid voice acting, but nowhere near the level of this. Yeah. They toned it down a lot for the remake because they wanted it to be scarier. So keep in mind, oh, everybody, this is a multi billion, uh, almost, almost billion dollar franchise. This is the voice acting that appeared in the very first game back in 1996. Rebecca. What are you doing I'm in this place? I'm gonna turn my brain off. This better have that, Chris. Stop it. What are you doing? It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> Don't scare me. That's what I was going to say. But just take a look at this. Take a look at this. <laughs> almost breaking it's a song. Forest. Oh my god. It's awful. I'm going to find out what caused Forrest's death. Thank you. It looks like he was killed by a crow or something. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> this hall is dangerous. There must be a yeah, back door somewhere. Let's try to find it first, shall we? It. Just a moment. I found something. What is it? It's a weapon. It's really powerful, especially against living things. <laughs> yeah, you mean like a normal gun. Like a normal weapon. Yeah. Uh, I love you, Barry. <laughs> I love you, Barry. Hey, what is this? This house is dangerous. There are terrible demons. Ouch! <laughs> this house, they're terrible demons. Ouch! Demon attacked you. It was a huge snake, and also poisonous. Oh. 
Snakes are venomous, you fucking idiot! <laughs> you dumbass! Uh, I told you, don't worry. I'll just go and get some fresh air and be eaten by a monster. What? You saved okay. me! Yeah. <laughs> Barry, you saved me! You saved me! Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love it half of Barry's dialogue, he sounds like he's trying to be super considerate, and then half the time he's the most apathetic uh, asshole that's alive. Like th this may for 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 those that are watching this for the first time, this may be like the fucking. You may have found like the Pandora's box of the channel because I swear, in like almost every single stream. I make a reference to one of these stupid fucking lines. Like I said, like, take a look at this. It's so powerful, <laughs> especially against living things. Don't open that door. That was close. Thanks, Barry. Yeah. Don't mention it. What a monster. <laughs> I can't believe. What the hell is this place anyway? <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Now, there are a lot of rooms in that mansion that we can't get into because they're locked up. Yeah. I have been looking around for clues. Okay. I'll go to the other house and see if I can find any clues. Will you do that? I'm counting on you. Can't see very well. How about going down to check by yourself? I have a rope here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you? Well, then I'll try to go down using the rope. Yeah, the rope! Jill. Smart Jill. You're here, too. Yes, you're here too? How come both Umbrella and you can intimidate him by taking his family as hostages? Umbrella? Well, I intimidated him, but it had nothing to do with Umbrella. He's such a prick! <laughs> you see, there's the twist Asshole. I was talking about. Umbrella had no idea he was threatening Barry's family. He just did that shit for fun. He's just a prick! I just used him for my personal purposes. Do you think we could see tyrant now Bear yes barry we can see tyrant now don't you worry buddy <laughs> you're, you're so, so optimistic <laughs> this is really beautiful all this power will be mine you killed two of them a few hours ago for the sake of an awful creature don't be upset all weak people exist to be eaten. Don't come this way! No! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Whoever edited whoever? that. Whoever yeah. edited that. <laughs> I was gonna say, whoever edited this video is a comedic genius. <laughs> oh, Wesker, you dumb motherfucker. Jill. It's you. Barry? I'm really embarrassed. To see you now. What? <laughs> just, just leave me. Go, go quickly. Oh, okay. It's a... Oh, Mary. Wesker's dead. Is that so? Jill, will you do me a favor? This is my last wish. Oh, Barry. Please give this photo to my family. Oh, Barry. My God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which, um, oh, no. I, I, I can't believe I'm forgetting this. That was something they changed with the remake, is that Barry does not die. Yes. No, well, yeah. no. Ba you, Barry could also oh. die. If you don't trust Barry by giving him the gun oh, yeah, you can to kill, kill Lisa Trevor... Or something. Uh, he right, actually right. He, Lisa actually kills him by fucking throwing right. him off, like, a random bottomless pit underneath the mansion. Right, I remember now. He can be killed, but there is a way to save him. Yes. Canonically, Barry okay. lives, by the way. Like, you just saw Barry fucking die. Don't worry about that. He, that's not canon. <laughs> you must be kidding. After we've come all the way here. Ladies first. Go first, Jill. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I love how he says that ladies <laughs> first. <laughs> I, mean, I want to hear that again. God. Oh no, you must be kidding. After we've come all the way here. Ladies first. Go first, Jill. <laughs> but Chris. 
<laughs> Ladies first. Go first, Jill. Why does he sound like a fucking Marvel vs. Capcom announcer? He does! <laughs> he kind of thought. Give me a chance to play nice guy. What? What? Ladies first. Yeah. My wife and kids, uh, they always wait up for me. Even uh, today, uh, eldest daughter. He's so uh, red. I'm sorry. Don't worry about that. I know he must still be alive. Barry, where's Barry? Oh, this is uh, Chris's side of the story because like th those were All the right, cutscenes yeah. for Jill. This is the mm -hmm. the cutscenes for Chris. I am so oh. glad that one of the best cutscenes is at the very end of this video, where like <laughs> Wesker shows Chris the tyrant. Yep. That's I was the best say, one. <laughs> when Wesker oh, yeah. shows Chris the Tyrant, that is my favorite moment from the original game. I know this doesn't make sense within canon that it's probably that Jill fucking showed uh, Wesker showed showed Jill the Tyrant, but like I fan canon like within my head, I have a fan canon that the reason for why Wesker fucking hates Chris so fucking much is because of that one moment because she just got fucking pissed at him for reacting the way that he did. I know, well, I'm I know. Sorry, but he's probably. No. No. What? <gasps> what is that? I'll go and check. Whoa! What is it? What? Oh! Oh, Rebecca! No! Are you the- <laughs> I just want to point out. Rebecca fucking used a healing spray on Chris there? Because she didn't have any weapons or anything? And she was like, oh my god! Oh no! This is the woman that killed an- Slug man based anime villain literally a few minutes before this cutscene. What? I love Rebecca. Oh, She's my favorite character oh, in no. stars. Oh no! Are you the only person here from the Bravo team? Well, because the helicopter made a forced landing, I just ran into this house anyway, but I, uh. I see. There's nothing else you could have done anyway. It's. <laughs> She's leaving out so much information. You're here. She's leaving out so much of the shit she did. It's me, Chris. <laughs> Is that you, Hi. Rebecca? Can you play? Wait, what is that? See? Just relax and play. Rebecca. Back away from the mic! I know, I know, but just a little longer. Chris! Chris! You like it? Oh, that was great. <laughs> what is that? It's a monster. Oh, by the way, I just want to point out the reason for why the Alpha team and the like why the Alpha team even was able to find half the fucking things that they did in the mansion is because either Rebecca or Jill spent like 30 minutes trying to learn how to play a music in the piano. They didn't know that something was gonna open up in that room. They just like saw a, like a music sheet in like a room in the shelf and said, "You know what? I'm just gonna chill for a little bit and play some piano in like the in the main bar area of the mansion." And it just opened up a fucking secret secret path. Could you imagine, like being Spencer, right? Yeah. Hire this guy to fill this place with all these puzzles so no one will ever find your secret lab. And some, just just some random stars members like, hey, Chris, look what I can do. And suddenly the wall opens up and all that work was for nothing. <laughs> In the Jill scenario, she already was a pianist and knew how to play the song. She just needed the music sheets for it. Like, just coincidentally, the stars members just really love pianos. I guess. Even though they're which, in the middle of this fucking deadly scenario with zombies and dogs and shit. Which, but that conversation reminds me. This was something we didn't really bring up, but it's just a detail I love about Resident Evil lore. Mm -hmm. Every single game yes. has a really stupid, convoluted reason for why every area is full of all these puzzles. Yes. Uh, <laughs> in the original game, the reason for why the mansion is filled with, like, weird puzzles is because uh, Spencer is a kooky guy. And he really likes secret entrances and shit, so he commissioned the mansion to, like, uh, Trevor. I mean, uh, to, 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 uh, what's his name? Sorry. George Trevor. George Trevor to 
fill the place with random death traps for some reason that the researchers had to fucking go through every time that they wanted to enter the lab, by the way. Because, like, the, the main entrance to the lab, you need to, to... To open up the lab, you need to gather two different books from different locations of the building to have two different medallions, like lion medallions, to open up a fountain in the side of the fucking building to enter the mansion. A fucking what? <laughs> And it just gets dumber. Yeah, because at least you understand that Spencer is like a kooky guy. So of course he would have like all these death traps in like a faraway mansion that he owns. But then you get to Resident Evil 2 and that's like in the middle of like a metropolitan city. And or it's just... 3 where it is literally an <laughs> urban city. It's the best. It's a monster. Richard! No! <laughs> Richard! Richard! Be careful! Richard! Richard! Are you... Yeah, so much for him, we got to the root of the problem. Shut the fuck up, Cre- Oh my god! That was Chris. after he killed Plan 42! Shut the fuck oh, up! Oh, fuck Except off. for your major injury, would you like me to? Yes, please do something for me, temporarily. Calm down, she's 19. <laughs> Chris, you're alive. My words exactly. Where's Jill? Aren't you with Jill? I'm sorry. We were attacked by a strange monster. I lost track of her. While we were scouting around. That's the best fucking excuse he can make. <laughs> and no, I no, Rebecca okay. does not die. No, Rebecca's alive, don't worry. It's, this is just our alternate timelines. I see. Well, it's not your fault. This place is crazy. If we stay here, all of us will end up dead. I just love this specific scene. Because these are just two dudes hanging out in a hallway. But eventually in like... Ten more years, they're gonna be fighting in a fucking volcano. And I, I just love the contrast of these two fighting assholes being like, Hey, Wesker, how's it going, buddy? Is everything okay? Oh, the mansion's pretty spooky. And like, eventually they're gonna be like, one of them has like matrix powers, and the other one has biceps the side of his head. And he, they're fighting in a fucking volcano. While, the, while <laughs> both of them like fucking scream each other's names. With rocket launchers. With rocket launchers and shit. What should yeah. we do, Wesker? Rebecca! See, she's okay. Chris! Yay! Thank God you're safe! I'm sorry that you were worried about me. We are in great danger. <laughs> we must organize a search for the others and get the hell out of here. <laughs> Understood? <laughs> yes, sir! Okay. I'll go I'll first. Rebecca so much. Proceed with your own judgment. All right? Can you do it? Yes, I can. <laughs> Good. I love Luck. Rebecca so much. Enrico. Oh yeah. Uh, what do you think, Chad? For those that haven't seen Resident Evil, what do you think this room is? Even I don't know what it is. What do you think what? this room is? With the walls? Like a, does, does it remind you of anything? It looks like a prison. Like a, an abandoned prison. Garbage room. Yeah. The labs, kinda. mental room. It's a fucking cave. Oh. This is the fucking cave of the game. I don't know it's why- It's a square cave. It's a square cave. <laughs> hey, Rico. It's so weird. Don't come any closer, Chris. Huh. Wait, what happened? Double crosser. Don't! Uh, uh, hell. Umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it? I is someone there? Minecraft looking ass. What do you mean Chris, is someone there? He got as shot. my subordinate, you have wonderful talent. I would never work for a company like Umbrella. Wesker is holding Chris at gunpoint here threatening him to kill him, while Chris is holding a rocket launcher! <laughs> and Wesker, you were formerly with Umbrella. What do you mean? Since when have you been an Umbrella agent? And a traitor to the stars? Now you're wrong! 
Would you like to see it? Come with me. Here we go. I'm Here we go. For my lack of manners. Here we go. But I'm not used to escorting men. What? 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 <laughs> I don't Hello? remember that line! Hello? 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 Gay, gay, I'm homosexual, man. gay? I was gonna say, the actual sexual <laughs> tension in this scene, what? What? <laughs> Wait, I didn't listen, what? See it? Come with me. I'm sorry for my lack of manners, but I'm not used to escorting men. Is this? <laughs> okay, oh, oh. Okay. This this reminds me. You know, you know the line he says in Code Veronica where he goes, "Come, little fish. Yes. Come see my hook." We will see that in like fucking three more hours. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, no. We're still in Resident Evil One. <laughs> oh, it's been God. an hour. Over an hour. Anyway, so this 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 next one is the best cutscene in the entire game. Escorting men. Is this? That's right. This is the ultimate life form. Tyrant. <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Whisker, you're pitiful. <laughs> this is your savior? You say this failure is your savior? You can't kill me. I love. I just, I just love the, I love the pathetic little Chris. Yeah. Stop, Stop it. it! Stop it! Stop it! You say this failure, your pit. Stop it! Rent. <laughs> Chris. Stop it! <laughs> You can tell Wesker thought that he was the shit when saying that. And when Chris started laughing, he was so upset. Yeah. I, I so wholeheartedly sad. believe that this is the reason for why Wesker has such a fucking hate boner for Chris in the future of the series. Oh, do you want to impress him so bad? You're pitiful. I also have a little fucking animation to show you guys made by Spidoru based off oh. of yes oh. yeah we're going there cuz i cuz oh my god cuz this cuz this line is so famous because of the way the way the Wesker says it that people have made animations based on it and this is my favorite one <laughs> That's right. It's the ultimate life form that I created, Chris. Tyrant. <laughs> <They come. laughs> Stop it. Wesker, you're pitiful. And you're gay. Please stop laughing at me. I worked so hard. I worked day and night on him. Please stop laughing. I'm getting real angry. <laughs> so yeah, fucking Tyron kills him at the end of the game. Yep. <laughs> yeah, because because that's the thing. Justin. Chris laughs and he goes, "Ooh, I'll show you, Chris. The Tyrant's gonna kill you." He wakes it up. First thing the Tyrant does is kick his ass. First fucking thing yep. he does, or does he? Like Nick said, we're gonna be. Don't worry, don't worry. Uh, it's gonna yeah, be for later. So, um, yeah, so, no, the tyrant kills him, but uh, spoilers, it doesn't kill him, but it does. <laughs> but it does, yeah. It, so, he dies at the, the end. The actual or ending does. of Resident Evil 1. We're finally gonna finish the first. Finally gonna finish the first game. The actual ending of Resident Evil 1 is after the tyrant kills Wesker, Jill, Barry, and Chris. Decide to get the fuck out of there. They manage to escape the tyrants. And then, after using a little fucking signal rocket thingy that was just lying around in there at the end, and like the, a random, heli random helicarrier, they manage to contact like a helicopter there to help them escape the mansion. Oh, by the way, the mansion is exploding right now? 
I just wanted to point that out. Like, oh. we, oh, Wesker set the building to explode to cover oh. up everything that Umbrella did in the in the Spencer right. Mansion. Because right. this is going to be a running theme for the, for the entire rest of the series. At the end of almost every single game, the entire location the game takes place in gets blown up. Completely. Mm -hmm. For some reason, right. there is a there is a self destruct sequence, or someone implodes a place, or like they send on a rocket or a nuke or whatever. Every inch of square inch you fucking explore during the game gets exploded by the end because it's cool. Yeah, exactly. Weird name. So you get to the very end of this, the Arclay Mountains or like the the Spencer Mansion is exploding, you and then. It you get a fucking final boss time against the tyrant that just digs itself out of the lab, I guess? Destroys oh. everybody. Chris is a bitch. I believe it's canon that Jill kills the tyrant at the end. Like, Jill did a lot in the first game. Chris is considered the protagonist of the entire series, but I'm pretty sure that Jill did most of the work in the Arclay Mountains. I also just like, I also just prefer it being Jill who killed the tyrant because of stuff with RE3. Anyways, we're gonna skip around here. So eventually, you get Brad Chickenheart Vickers coming in to rescue everybody from the Spencer Mansion, has just a random rocket in the helicopter and he throws it down Jill, use it. Kill it, whatever it is. to help out Jill in killing the tyrants. And almost every single game does this. You get the big weapon, aim it, and in a cool cutscene, oh, he dead. And then you escape by a helicopter. This is how most of the games end. And you know what? It's a tradition at this point. I love it. I don't care. I don't care if it's like the same thing over and over again. It is dopamine it's for cool. my brain. It's cool. It's I love cool. it every single time. It's some half Bonus points if they ride away people. looking at the sunset with a monologue. Yep. And... Yep. Boom! <laughs> oh my god. The way that it explodes is, like, unnecessary. It's like every single inch of wall in that place was made out of TNT. I know. Yeah. Like, there's nothing. It got completely cleared off. No, my Minecraft house. No. And then they ride off into the sunset. Hooray. And just a reminder that Wesker got stabbed and was in that explosion, but he's also okay. Yeah. Somehow. It's fine. You can take it. So that's Resident Evil 1, everybody. Any questions? That's the first I game. Like, I feel like they're gonna have a lot of questions. <laughs> everybody got any specific questions that we should address before we, we move on related to the first game? No, everyone, everything's good. <sighs> How does Wesker survive that? That'll be for Chronicles, don't worry. Yeah, we're okay. gonna have to save that. Okay. I have a question, what the fuck? What happened to Rebecca? No, Rebecca's alive. She was also in the helicopter. It's just yeah. that there is no one single cutscene that shows every single Stars member alive in the helicopter. Well, they all survive. Yeah, the canon ending is something that you'd never see because the, the, the timelines in these games are Super mixed up, but don't worry. Yeah. Every Re Rebecca, Jill, Chris, Barry, and Brad survive the 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 Arclay Mountains Spencer Mansion incidents. They're all o a okay, and then we're that number later is gonna go down a lot. But so far, everyone survived except Joseph and Joseph and. Enrico and Richard. whatever Richard and whatever the fuck the other guy is 
Raito says, I have a question. Why is Chris so handsome? Because Capcom rearranges his fucking skeletal structure every single game. Literally. It's also just a rule with Capcom that uh, every single Resident Evil protagonist must be hot. Yes. Yeah. It's not and a rule I complain about, but it is a rule. <gasps> like, Capcom remodels the faces and designs of these characters for every single game. And it gets stupid because, like, the, he, Chris returns in Resident Evil 7. And mm -hmm. he looks nothing he, like the yeah. like the Chris from Resident Evil 5 to the point That's that with Chris. people in the fandom started theorizing that that was not actually Chris. That was uh, an Umbrella member, like, like, trying to pretend that he's Chris for some reason. And then in Resident Evil 8, the sequel to Resident Evil 7, he looked completely fucking different again. So like the the, the rest the rest yeah. Evil Seven Chris is just r different for no reason. <laughs> yeah, I, pr I personally think that thing was a bioweapon and it wasn't actually Chris. It was, it was just Chris and a yeah, like, like a mold. mecha Chris. Yeah, it was in mold. He was being controlled or some shit. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Woo! Uh, Susie Bell donates two dollars and says, "Can you repeat everything again? I wasn't listening." No, we have a lot okay, to get through. Okay, so it all starts with the Spencer mix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I'm bored, donates five dollars. What about the hidden enemy lady in the remake that you can't kill? Zach talked about that at the beginning yeah. of the first I was, uh, of the section. The I was gonna say, you know how much I talked about Lisa Trevor. Lisa Trevor is a really important character, but at the same time, like she was not included in the in the original release, though she was actually intended to. What I found, find, like, amazing is that the Resident Evil remake is actually more like a director's cut of the original. Uh, it was released, like, about three to four years after the original came out, and it came out so soon because it is actually the original design document for what the original game was supposed to be. Now that Capcom actually had the budget to create their ultimate vision, they remade the game as soon as possible to show this is what we wanted to do with the original. I included Lisa in and stuff like that. Right. Also, okay, I've seen this question pop up multiple times in chat, and mm -hmm. I want to answer it. No, Lisa Trevor is not a tyrant. No, she's no. not. She's Tyrants, like, they were specifically created by the T-Virus. Lisa Trevor was a byproduct of the progenitor virus. Yes. Very important distinction. She's basically like a pe like a living petri dish for like every single virus that Umbrella made. Yeah. Whew. Okay, so next one in the timeline is Resident Evil Zero, because we're okay. not actually done with the Arclay oh. Mountains incidents. <laughs> okay, what I'm interested in with Zero, right? Yes. Zero is actually one of the games I haven't played, but mm -hmm. I always wanted to because Rebecca's like my favorite Resident Evil protagonist. Interesting. <laughs> so I never got around to this one. So I'm actually going to be learning as we go through this, and I'm probably going to really like this because it's all about Rebecca. Same. No. Oh, no. No. What do you mean, no? A Resident Evil Zero is considered to be, like, the second worst game in the original survival horror gameplay-based side of the franchise before Resident Evil 4. Yeah. The one game where she's the main character is bad? Yes, no, it's not that it's bad, it's just that it's... mediocre, I would say. There's a bunch of, oh. like, gameplay decisions that people do not like about this game. For those that want some background on Resident Evil Zero, uh, did Lisa survive the Spencer Mansion exploding? No, she's dead. <laughs> but for, what, for those that want a background on this, Resident Evil Zero was originally developed for the PS1 alongside Resident Evil 3 or Resident Evil 2 around that time. And it was pushed back in development a lot because it was way too complex. It was supposed to come out for like the Nintendo 64 DD, I think at one point, until eventually they went back to develop this one when the Resident Evil 1 remake came out. That's why Resident Evil Zero looks so much like Resident Evil 1 remake. It is basically the second chance that the developers had at making a game that they wanted to for a very long time. This story is about 
Rebecca, literally a day before the events of Resident Evil 1. It, it was essentially the story of what happened to... Was it Bravo Team or was it... I think they were called Bra Bravo Team, right? Bravo Team were the people that went missing. Yes. So, Rebecca's part of Bravo Team and... This is essentially her story after she lands in the Arclay Mountains to check out what's been happening with the cannibal murders going on in those mountains. It, it is so funny because it was sold to be like prequel to the events like that would happen in the Arclay Mountains. But it turns out that once Rebecca landed in the Arclay Mountains, she just went off in a train and went to a completely different part of the part of the city, part part of the the, the territory that has nothing to do with the Arclay murders. It's, oh. it's very oh. fucking funny. Yep. Uh, huh. So, let me show this. I will show the intro as I talk. What the hell? That <laughs> I what hate is that. What is... Hold on, I need to kill this video so that it doesn't show here for some reason. Alright. Good. Oh yeah, yeah, Resident Evil Zero is also based on leeches for some reason. Interesting premise, okay. Uh, it is, it, on top of having... <laughs> Look at that anime villain. Uh, hello, oh. Sephiroth! <laughs> uh, okay. On top of having the uh, regular-ass zombies of the fran that the franchise is known for, Resident Evil Zero also includes a new enemy called the Leech, the T-Virus Leeches. Uh, which we, which is, which get, uh, explained in this game and then never brought up again in the entirety of the rest of the franchise. Even though they're really cool and were made by one of the founders of Umbrella. Uh, this also explains why there was a infestation of the T-Virus in the original Spencer Mansion. This actually explains why it happened. So that's nice. Right. Huh. Cool. Let's see the intro to the game. Because the intro is actually pretty cool. Far off. Zero. Let me hear that again. Resident Evil. Zero. Yeah! Nice. A Midwestern town in America. Raccoon City. A solitary island far off in the sea. Rockfort Island. That's Code Veronica. An island that would become the second <laughs> Raccoon City. Sheena Island. That's Survivor. There are still many unanswered <laughs> questions about these seemingly unrelated yet intensely traumatic events. Though it is believed that the international enterprise Umbrella was somehow involved, little is known as to the origin of this faceless corporation. When was it established? By whom? And how was the T-Virus created? Oh yeah, this explains the progenitor virus before Resident Evil 5. Oh, cool! Oh. To uncover the truth, we must delve deeper into the events which Narratively, this game seems really cool. in the beginning, before the mansion incident. July 23rd, 1998. Hmm. I believe this is called the Eclipse? So yeah. Eclipse train or something? Look at this anime shit! Oh my god. Oh god. Yeah! What the fuck? Slay! I know, I know nothing about this villain, but I love them so much already. <laughs> Sephiroth. <laughs> the camera. Yeah. What the fuck? Okay, I kind of love this. Sephiroth. That is Bravo team of the Stars unit. It began as a simple investigation of some bizarre murders in the suburbs of Raccoon City. Nothing in our training could ever have prepared us for the nightmare Rebecca! that ensued. We never stood a chance. 
What's going on? Engine failure. Emergency landing. Thumbs up. Check the current position and Hello, investigate the surrounding back. area. Captain, look. <gasps> oh my oh. god. Captain. Hmm? What happened? Court order for transportation. Prisoner Billy Cohen, ex-lieutenant, 26 years old. Court martialed and sentenced to death July 22nd. Prisoners to be transferred to the Regathon base for execution. Those poor soldiers. They were good men just doing their jobs, and that scum murdered them and escaped. All right, everyone. Let's separate and survey the area. Our friend is brutal and ruthless. Keep your guard up. So essentially, that is Lieutenant Billy Cohen. That is the second player of the game. Resident Evil Zero is essentially a co-op game. But if it? it is, but if you don't have someone with you to control Billy, you can also switch between you, like Rebecca and Billy at the same time. Right. Oh. And also in this game, there are no item boxes, which makes it like one of the worst in the fucking series because you have to leave your fucking items in the middle of the floor most of the time. Wait, 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 wait. So it functions like Resident Evil 1. Yes. But there's no item boxes. There's no item boxes. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, it really fucking that sucks. sucks. And, and you have like two playable characters, and if one of them dies... You have to go back and restart from the beginning. No, not from the from the from the last save point. So you have to keep both of them alive. But most of the time, you're gonna play single player. So you have to like juggle around two characters at the same time, and it's really fucking awkward and weird. Right. Oh, the story seems cool. cool, though. It is. It is cool. Hey, Re Re Rebecca. Rebecca. I want to play this game just for her. If I'm being real. Honestly, fucking do it. Like, Train. if you like survival horror and the way that Resident Evil One remake plays, just it'll be like that. It's just slightly more annoying. Just Resident Evil One, but scuffed. Yes. You find the Ecliptic Express. Yeah, the Ecliptic Express, which is an umbrella-owned like train system that they use to bring people from the city into their training facility slash college slash school that they have in the middle of the mountains for some reason. Hmm. They whole an own they, they own a whole train system. Dude, they basically own an entire city. Yeah, the train system is the most believable thing they own. <laughs> yeah. Pretty sure the marshalling yard is connected to this train system as well, which is a thing that happens in Resident Evil 3. Which is also a chemical plant, which is also Nest! Anyways, so that's uh, the intro to Resident Evil Zero. I'm gonna put the music back on. Eh, there we go. Yeah! Why aren't you working? There we go. So... What? Resident Evil Zero is the prequel to Resident Evil 1. Oh yeah, there's a giant fucking scorpion in the middle of the train, by the way. Um, oh, nice! Essentially, it's the story of Rebecca finding the Ecliptic Express. Every single other person in her team dies. She goes off on her own adventures. Like, everyone else gets killed in the Arclay Mountains or in the mansion, and she just goes, hops on a train, and the train magically comes back alive, and then 
like, scoots her out somewhere else. She is in the middle of a moving train, trying to find her way out. And obviously she needs to go into, like, the main cockpit control system to be able to stop the train. In her way out of the train, which, by the way, uh, train is a super cool setting for a survival horror game. Um, I was... Hmm? I was I was actually gonna say that um with the limited knowledge I had about Resident Evil Zero, one thing I was really fascinated by was all the imagery with like the train setting. Yes. I think that's really neat. It is super, super cool, which is a shame because only a third of the game actually takes place in the train. Mm-hmm. So what happens mm -hmm. is during this investigation and while he she gets trapped on the train. Rebecca meets Lieutenant Billy Cohen, which is an escaped convict that was in death row that was being taken to death row in the Raccoon City Mountains. He escapes because, you know, the car gets leached up. He, does, he doesn't actually kill anybody. The reason for why he was sent to death row as a prisoner is because Lieutenant Billy Cohen was in charge of killing a bunch of innocent civilians to cover up like a weird military, corrupt military uh, mission. Uh, obviously, Billy is a very good boy, that's why he's a Resident Evil protagonist. He is also very hot, so that means that he is, like, obviously a good guy that was set up by his military organization. And obviously, because he refused to actually kill any of the civilians, he was blamed for the whole thing, and the military and the government essentially wanted to kill him to cover up what happened in that whole incident that never gets brought up again, like, ever. So, um, so he is escaping the, the whole situation. He meets up with Rebecca on the train. Rebecca doesn't trust uh, him because, of course, she doesn't. So they kind of just have to survive together in this, like, co-op, weird adventure prequel thing. Now, the leeches! The reason the for why this game is so obsessed with leeches is because Resident Evil Zero is focused on the backstory of why the Spencer Mansion went down. It was the... The reason for why was those leeches. Those leeches were the creation of Dr. James Marcus, which is one of the founding members of Umbrella. Dr. James Marcus experimented with the progenitor virus on some leeches, and that was like his whole deal in like the the organization. He loved leeches. He had a fucking hard on for leeches. And 10 years ago, in like 1988 or something, uh, because Oswell, E. Spencer, and like Ashford were such fucking, like, corrupt pricks, they wanted to get everything for themselves in the organization. James Marcus was like feuding with them. Like, they didn't really like each other. They were just a bunch of rich prick pricks that uh, funded Umbrella. So they decided to kill him. Uh, James Marcus is a very old man and is very knowledgeable and about how the whole progenitor virus works, which means that he took the secrets that he had to the grave, but he had one contingency plan in case his fellow CEOs or like founders try to kill him. He implanted the leeches that he was working with, with a very special command, then upon his death, the leeches would absorb his body and resurrect him into a fucking what? anime villain that what? you see in the game right there that that's james marcus that is james marcus in the peak of his health he went from being an 80 year old man into being like a super hot long-haired 20 year old anime villain and then that copy wow. of james marcus would then go on to seek revenge against the entirety of the Umbrella Corporation by taking over their facilities, killing everyone, and injecting uh, and like infecting everyone with the T virus. So, the Spencer Mansion incident was caused because James Marcus resurrected himself with a bunch of leeches, and then he unleashed the T virus on the Spencer Mansion, and then he went to. His old training grounds, which is like a, a university slash school slash like research facility, way off outside of the Raccoon City forest that Rebecca then ends up going to because of the train. I think it's called like the... Hold on, Resident Evil 2... Resident Evil 0... Yeah, it's literally called just the training facility. The 
Umbrella Executive Training School. This is essentially a university that is in the middle of fucking nowhere that the train leads to, where uh, James Marcus was, re was researching the whole leeches bullshit, and there they find him in a fucking, like, in a weird city. Look at, look at that, look at that little weird guy. Like, that's mm -hmm. James Marcus, that's the old man. And then mm -hmm. when he died, he transformed himself into this. Oh my god. He's literally just Sephiroth. He's literally just white yeah. Sephiroth. Yeah. Is, is, that goth. The, is that the gorilla with praying mantis hands and AK-47s? Yes, that is the gorilla. <laughs> Uh, so apparently like a bunch of students inside of the training facility decided to inject the T-virus into a fucking monkey and then literally tortured it, tortured it really hard and then the monkey became so enraged that it broke out and killed everyone in the training facility. So, yes, the meme of Resident Evil notes being like we fucking infected a monkey and then gave it AK-47s for arms, and then we poked it with a stick for 42 hours. I really hope that it doesn't escape. Page 2, it escaped. That is literally a thing that happens in Resident Evil Zero. Enraged fucking monkeys. Already. I love this game already. It actually- it, it is actually fucking real. I love that the original creator of that meme did not actually play Zero and didn't know what was happening in Zero. No, and it is actually just- and literally it though. The, the training facility is made uh, for like a bunch of students that were going to end up as researchers for Umbrella. Essentially, test the T virus in a, an, onto a bunch of animals. You have gorillas, you have snakes, you have scorpions, which is like the giant scorpion inside of the train, and you have a bat. You have giant bats. And all of them are annoying as fuck to fight. One of the reasons for why Resident Evil Zero is horrible as a game is because every single enemy that's not a zombie like is super mobile and fast and they're super annoying to shoot and some of them like are like off screen flying around off screen shooting you with projectiles uh, oh wonderful they're horrible yeah, monsters I also think you static soul for the five dollars don't ask why I immediately god that's sorry pastra so okay, but I, yeah. <laughs> I, need, I, need, I need to ask, though, as somebody who is learning about this as an outsider. Yes. So James Marcus uses the leeches to be revived in his, like, prime. Yes. Why does he dress like Sephiroth? Yeah. He really, he really likes to be a cool anime villain. There's no explanation. Okay, go okay. off. He's I, just, I, he's, I, I get it, he Marcus. just really feels himself to be, like, a cool anime villain. Honestly, go off, Marcus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Slay, slay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do believe that there's a cutscene in this game that shows Wesker and Birkin killing James Marcus like 10 years ago or something. So, like, not only was Wesker doing all that shit in the Arclay Mountains and in, 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 in the Spencer Mansion, but he also killed one of the founders of Umbrella, as per Umbrella, uh, the other Umbrella CEO's orders, which caused him to then merge with the leeches and then seek revenge against Umbrella, causing the whole, like, Spencer Mansion incident. So that means that uh, Wesker is indirectly responsible for f destroying Umbrella and Raccoon City and literally everything else. And also, oh, wow. it, it is it is like, like, this could have been so preventable. These yeah. fucking assholes were so greedy and evil that they, like, backstabbed each other into causing, like, a worldwide, like a, like a, like a citywide outbreak. It is ridiculous. So, everything happened because of rich assholes fighting each other. Yes. Cool. Very no one could contemporary, get actually. Like, yeah, the, these rich assholes really loved murder and backstabbing each other and trying to, like, get their own bag and wanted to, like... Essentially, when James when James wanted to do his own stuff and, like, be left alone inside of the training facility to, like, play around with leeches, they said, You know what? We can just fucking get rid of this guy and, like, get his cut of the money. And then James... All he does is play with leeches. All he does is play with leeches like a weird asshole. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, this is the ending now of Resident Evil Zero. Let me just shut it right now.
I mean, it is spoilers if you don't want to look at it, Zach. I don't know, we just skip this. But I mean, what do you expect? Okay, for Zach, for a Resident Evil game, after okay. you heard what I said, what do you expect to happen at the end of this game? So, Rebecca and Billy fight Marcus, who turns into a gigantic leech monster. They kill him with a rocket launcher. A helicopter comes down and saves them, and they fly away into the sunset. Let's see. What? Ooh. It's the queen! That's Marcus! Okay. Of course. That's a giant big leech monster, Marcus. Big, big, giant leech monster. Also, there's a self-destruct system. There's okay. a self-destruct, okay. Oh, For the fucking university? Yeah, of course. Why not? So sh shout out to these outfits the person playing has the characters in, by the way. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. Rebecca says, who activated the self-destruct system? In this game, there's no explanation. It just does that. Oh, okay. It just happens. Self-aware. I'm pretty sure oh. that the, the the implication is that it was Wesker. But, like, oh. shut up. How? Yeah, so they try to escape. There's a cool chase scene and stuff like that. And then you fight the thing in the middle of an arena. Oh, this looks like the, the RE3 final boss. Yeah, I was the, gonna say, this looks a lot like Nemesis. Yep. A lot like it. And it's just a bunch of leeches. It's super weird. They ne The Gameplay. leeches never get brought up. Oh yeah, you have you have like uh, shared inventories that you can pass around with like the two different Ooh. characters. That is cool. cool. That is pretty cool. I guess that's why they didn't include the, the the chest. They thought the two characters would make storage too easy, so they were like, you know what? And then every single player just drops the the items into like a single room that they then have to like sort through anyway. So, like like the the players refuse to like do the inventory partner system bullshit, so they just plopped every single item into a single room, so... The, the, the item box bullshit is useless. The, the only thing that it, this does is, like, you won't have access to your items unless you go back to a very specific portion of the map. So everyone also, leaves like their that. i- so everyone just leaves their items in the middle of the entire map of the research facility. Mm. Yeah, so... I, I, you can't even blame the players. Why, why was that a mechanic in the first place? Useless. Oh yeah, the leeches are hurt by the sun. I forgot to mention that. Oh, oh so he's like a vampire too? Yeah, he, he, they're very oh, photosensitive. Oh why? Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, they're hurt by the sun for some reason. Like, this is like, pre that's a precursor to Resident Evil 4, by the way, before the Plowdesk came along. Hmm. I never understood why they were afraid of sunlight. Touch grass, Maybe. nerd! I'm, I'm assuming the whole deal is that they just, like, based them off of some kind of parasite that was light-sensitive. Which is why, by the way, these leeches are not really light- really like that uh they're they don't appear ever again because like they're considered failures by umbrella Why? because <laughs> like what the fuck kind of bioweapon would only work like during the night right yeah exactly his research yeah. is considered to be a failure <laughs> now they're gonna shoot it real soon like hold on shooting it really fucking I'm hard waiting for the big raw launcher to show up and it's not like most sorry games happen during the day Besides, like, RE4, RE5, RE7, RE8. Uh, RE right. Wow, that dude can take a lot of damage. Oh yeah, the, the other reason for why this game is considered bad is because every single special enemy takes, like, fucking 500 bullets to kill. Just because the, the developers like... thought that you would have more ammunition because you have two playable characters. Hmm. Cool. Oh no. Oh no! The Grab. sunlight! It killed him! Can you please just like get turned to stone? Rebecca finds a fucking magnum <laughs> in the middle of the room. How convenient. Billy! <gasps> <laughs> Take oh, 
like oh, this! So Use it! Hey, Queenie! Whoa, his clothing changed. That's crazy. Feast, yep. on, this. Feast on this. Wow. Oh my god. It's wow. the one bullet. Oh! Ooh. That's cool. Okay, now all we need is the helicopter. Oh, it's false. Okay. I didn't know there was false. Boom! Oh. I was gonna say, where'd the hole come from? Hurry. Yeah. Oh, it was like an elevator shaft it was standing in front of. I guess. Also, they just leave. <laughs> they just leave. Like, there's no helicopter. Same they just walk. Explosion. Yeah, the same so one. Completely, so that was a completely different mansion? No, that's the... That's the... Fucking Umbrella University School Research Facility. For, like, Umbrella trainees. Which, that's like... Okay, which that's like eight exploded. miles. That, that's like eight miles away. From the mm. Spencer Mansion. That also exploded a day before... Like, bra like, bra like, Alpha Team got in there. So okay. like, so like, nobody that? noticed? <laughs> nobody yeah. noticed that thing exploded like the same night the Spencer Mansion exploded too? No, the day before. The day before Wait, Resident Evil 1 happened. Nobody noticed that a giant university school, boarding school, in the middle of the forest fucking exploded. Nah, they were, they were searching some murders going on in the Arclay Mountains. <laughs> that was the most suspicious thing going on at the time. That was the most suspicious yeah. thing that happened. Right. What oh, the fuck? God. <laughs> oh god, be serious. Oh yeah, and then Rebecca and Billy walk out of there. They don't even get a helicopter or anything. They just walk out of there. Right. This is what I mean. Re Billy throws off his cuffs. He is a free man. Was he in... Handcuffs all this time? Jesus. Yeah, yeah, his main his main design theme is that he's an escaped convict, so Capcom to show that he is actually an escaped convict has like an entire fucking tattoo and his like right arm and his left arm is cuffed. Because he escaped in cuffs oh. from right. the from the police car that he was like he escaped from. Because oh, you know, okay. of course the prisoner needs to have the cuffs in him all the time to show that he is an yeah. evil guy. Yeah. Of course. I love these games. Oh yeah, that's the fucking Spencer Mansion right there. Wait, so that's it was just walking distance. They walked there. That's not even eight miles. What? They walked a long time. And what? Billy doesn't show up in one, so does he just go, okay, Rebecca, no. that's cool. I'm going to head out. Hold on. Okay. What? what? Rebecca takes Billy's dog tags. I guess it's time to say goodbye. Puts it on. Those are Billy's dog tags. Officially, Lieutenant Billy. Nice ass. Nice ass. Yeah, just a zombie now. Yay. Rebecca lets him go, cause he's a good guy. Let's go. I have that as a Discord gift. Thank you. Everyone in chat's thirsting for Billy. <laughs> yep. I mean, he's pretty hot. Yeah. And then He's Rebecca heads off into the Spencer Mansion. Oh, but there's a spider web. He, she's gonna go into the trap of the Spencer Mansion. Ooh. 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 Yeah. It's like a metaphor. It's like a metaphor because she's back into the spider web. Like, why did she do that anyway? It's like, oh my god, I almost died. Okay, let's back go into the another mansion. mansion. Yeah. Yes. She was very tired after all that, so of course she would be more vulnerable or something. I don't fucking know. I don't know. So, yeah. Uh, that's Resident Evil Zero. Essentially, it just shows that James Marcus caused the whole thing and wanted to get revenge on Umbrella for trying to kill him because they were gritty assholes. And also, leeches were there, I think. 
And Billy Cohen is really hot. And Rebecca! Rebecca! Oh, yeah, and Rebecca. also, like, the dog tags that you see Rebecca have in the original game, those are Billy Cohen's dog tags, so... Right. It, it is I, canon, you know? Like, eh. Yeah, it's canon. I genuinely really like that, actually. It's pretty cool, it's pretty cool. Like, they oh, go through really this cool. whole adventure. Also, Billy Cohen will never show up in any other game ever again. Yep. Just like most Resident Evil side characters that they are just, yeah, just, just in fucking in disappear. Yeah, no. disappear. Just like Sheva, yeah. just like Carlos. Yep, just like Carlos. Jake. Just like Jake. Uh, that one I'm was for the best. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. I mean, Rebecca as well, because like Rebecca hasn't actually appeared in a game in forever. That she's only appeared in the movies. Okay. I was gonna say that's true, but Rebecca is in like so much media outside of the main games. <laughs> Yeah, also, yeah. Resident Evil Zero performed so badly for Capcom that they this game was one of the reasons as to why Resident Evil 4 came out the way it did, because the critical reception to this game was so low, and everyone got so bored of the survival horror, like like uh gameplay loop of the gameplay structure, that they said we need something completely different from Resident Evil 4. So they got like Shinji Mikami. Was Shinji Mikami in? Oh, wh who was the one that was involved in Resident Evil 4? Resident Evil 4... I'm pretty sure it was Shinji Mikami. Yeah, Shinji Mikami to revitalize the series for Resident Evil 4. So you, I can thank my favorite game of all time, Resident Evil 4, coming out the way it did due to Resident Evil Zero's shittiness. Yay! And then you can also thank Resident Evil 4 for bringing about the downfall of the series for a bit. Ah, we'll talk about that yeah. later. But thank you, Resident Evil Zero. You, due to your shittiness, you irrevocably changed the direction of the entire franchise moving forward. Good. Yay. Uh, yay. I'll just remember this is the Rebecca game. The Rebecca game. The Rebecca game. Hey, Susie Bell, thank you for the $2. Can you, hey, can you start over? I wasn't listening. No, we're gonna move so on. So it all starts with the Spencer <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> So now, murders happen in the Arkley Mountains. <laughs> now we're gonna, before we move on to Resident Evil 2, we got one more thing. Hold on. Uh, I'll mm -hmm. be right back. I need to do something. I'll be back in like 10 minutes. Okay, no problem. So, be. Thank you. We got one more thing to cover before we move on to Resident Evil 2. There's more. Yeah, there's more weird names. So much more. There's so much fucking more. So. You may have noticed that Wesker... We said that Wesker survived the events of Resident Evil 1. How? You may ask? <laughs> so it turns out that... Wesker... Is not actually just a corrupt cop slash researcher working for Umbrella, who's actually double-crossing Umbrella for the rival company of Umbrella. Turns out... That... Albert Wesker is actually also a superhuman a that was from birth designed to be a super soldier created by Oswald Spencer and he is the reason for why he has the glasses is because his eyes are actually different. They are very, very, like, th th he has, like, weird red cat eyes. Hey, Speedy, thank you for the I three months. I you guys talk about things you love. And the way that he survives in Resident Evil 1 is because before the events of Resident Evil 1, he injected himself with an experimental strain of the T-Virus, which reacted weirdly to his new, to his, like, super soldier body. Causing him to actually resurrect himself after death. This was all very planned, want... by the way. This was all extremely planned. They definitely had this in mind. I died once. I will never forget the cold, dark fingers of death reaching out for me. This is so convoluted. However. Hold on. Ah, god fucking damn it. We need to remove this video. I don't know why that happens. That's a bug. This is so convoluted because not only is 
Wesker an actual super super soldier, secret super soldier, but also he only activates his super cat catty powers after he dies for some reason, even though the T virus doesn't fucking work like that. Even that death was a necessary component. It was so clear that Capcom just picture. wanted Resident Evil to have like a main villain who yes. always came back, and they were like, "Okay, it's gotta be West. He always we comes need back. It to be him. He always comes back. And also, he planned to kill himself with the tyrant. Actually, it was not actually an accident. He wasn't tricked into releasing the tyrant and the tyrant killing him. He actually wanted the tyrant to kill him so that he could resurrect himself. For some reason. Necessary component of the big picture. It was all part of the plan. It was all part of the plan, guys! A necessary component of the big picture. The virus that Birkin had created brought me back from the brink of annihilation. When I awoke, hatred became my master. <laughs> He's such an anime I voice. found the tyrant that killed me was dead, and the facility was just moments away from self-destruction. I did not have time to enjoy my newfound life. I had something I needed to do. Oh my god! He destroyed the shades! Time to grab the data and get out. The data. The combat data. Due to the emergency condition, all data has been backed up to the UNF-013. Sergei was busy. Don't worry about Sergey. <laughs> I'll explain <laughs> later. Wesker, Albert, I am afraid that as of 2400 hours, I have taken it upon my authority to revoke your access privileges. Who's Sergey? Don't worry about it. The mainframe system. Impossible. Who are you? I am Red Queen. My primary objective is the management Wait. and protection. Yeah, Wait, it was on. not of the oh. fucking movies. This what, was part Red of the game. Red Queen games. was in the games? Yeah, the Red Queen was in the fucking video games. You, are you kidding me? Not only that, but it is also extremely fucking clear that the reason for why the Resident Evil live action movies came out the way that they did is because... Like, the the director that played... The, 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 the director that fucking made those movies only played umbrella chronicles you're kidding that's why that movie looks so fucking schizophrenic to a regular resident evil like fan because the director of the resident evil live action movies only played chronicles i <laughs> for the longest time for like the last like seven years Truly believe no. that the Red Queen was made up for the movies. Nope. The White Queen and the Red Queen, like that, the White Queen doesn't get mentioned here because the Red Queen is the main villain of the Umbrella Chronicles game. Like the Umbrella Chronicles are actually like the cornerstone cipher key for like a bunch of the dumb bullshit in the Resident Evil universe. Even though it's like a light gun game for the Wii, it is actually one of the most important pieces of Resident Evil lore ever. So, yeah, the Red Queen is, like, the antagonist that tries to keep Wesker from leaking company secrets to the rival company by, like, moving the assets to somewhere else within fucking Raccoon City. Of umbrella Holy assets. shit, man! <laughs> Me too, Wesker! <laughs> that, I promise. Well, the, the, the Red <gasps> Queen... Yeah, 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 the, the, the evil cat eyes. The Red Queen is actually not like a little girl like the what the movies did. Like the movies actually properly planned out the, the Red Queen a little bit more. But yeah, the name Red Queen does exist in the actual mainland Resident Evil game universe. That is Time insane. to change the plan. I better secure my escape. Okay, so we're gonna jump through this. Essentially, this side story in the Chronicles games uh, records like Wesker escaping through the umbrella facility from Resident Evil 1 and eventually he moves out and encounters Lisa Trevor! Oh, hey Lisa Trevor, how you doing? And... Oh. Not even you, Lisa. Oh. Is that just canonically how she dies? No, or? don't worry, hold on a second. You think that fucking Lisa Trevor's gonna die by a gunshot? I was really scared they would do that. Nah, -uh, motherfucker. 
Oh, thank God. <laughs> Uh, blah 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 blah. You move on through the game. Blah 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 blah. Blah 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 blah. blah. Move through the mansion. Almost there. There we go. Oh yeah, this all is happening while the while the self destruct sequence is happening. By the way, the self destruct sequence that Wesker himself initiated to destroy the Umbrella facility. He gets to the center point of the mansion. He's so fucked up. He looks like he's wasted in red wine. He does, you're so right. She appears to be stalking me. Your desire for eternal slumber shall be granted. They just fucking anime fight him. So yeah, he fights like Lisa Trevor in here. The end has come. Oh, uh, there we go. Be a good girl and stay dead this time. And Wesker just walks out of the mansion. That never gets old. <laughs> never gets old. And so I was reborn like a phoenix emerging from the flame. I no longer God, needed an umbrella. Bitch. A new horizon stretched out before me. I had risen beyond the human race and cheated death itself, leaving nothing to oppose me. Yep, yeah, so that's how Wesker survives. The R. Clay Mountains incident. Also here, one second. I ordered some tacos for the stream. They just arrived. All right. So while I wait for Nick and Sack to come back, is everybody all right? Everybody good? Everybody nice? Everybody understand what's going on? Nobody fucking confused? I gotta say, like, the reason... Okay. I swear to God, it gets simpler from here on out. I'm confused, Lamau. I, sw I swear, I swear things will get simpler. The reason for why this entire story at the very beginning is so fucked up is because the Arclay Mountains incident got revisited over and over and over and over again, and a bunch of extraneous details got added into the story. Like, Nobody knew that Wesker was going to survive the events of Resident Evil 1. Nobody knew about the research facility that James Marcus was, like, hidden, hiding at in Resident Evil Zero. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> Fair enough. Though I do find this, like, really fucking cool. Because, like... If you manage to... Process what happened in the Arclay Mountains, most of the rest of the story is understandable. I mean, there's a bunch of shit that happened in Raccoon City, but like, that's just like for spinoffs. Those spinoffs didn't really matter. Hello? I'm back. I'm back. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just making sure the chat is like understanding what's going on. Hello. Oh, I see, I see. Hey, Nick is back as well. So Nick, uh, just to recap yes. you on what you uh, missed, uh, Wesker survives the incident because mm -hmm. he injected himself beforehand with an experimental strain of the T-virus uh, developed by Birkin, and then he became he cheated death and resurrected himself with like super cat eyes or some fucking shit like that. <laughs> like look at the red cat eyes. Yeah. And then he kills Lisa Trevor. Or like the chandelier kills Lisa Trevor, I guess. And then he, oh, oh. he he becomes a super mega ultra super demigod super soldier or whatever. Even though he was already a super soldier because he was created as part of like the seven Wesker children, like held by like as a project made by Oswald E. Spencer. But don't worry about that. <laughs> Wait, but didn't Lisa more like, out of five? Didn't Lisa like jump to her death after seeing? Her no, she survived. Story? And she died to a, a, a chandelier. Yes. No, well, she didn't lie to a chandelier. The chandelier hold, held her down oh. until she ex got exploded. 
Right. right. Okay, but technically, Wesker did kill her. More sense. Sherry Birkin, you know who else makes bio weapons to record combat data? My mom. My mom! Yeah, the combat data shit is stupid. Anyway, we're finally out of the Arclay Mountains... Like, arc, I guess I would call in. And now... I managed to skip, like, all of that game. Okay, cool. Well, no, 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 no. I, this is just one part of Chronicles. We're gonna oh, get to Chronicles oh, later. Oh, 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 no. So... <sighs> We're gonna move on to the Raccoon City arc. Oh boy. Welcome, after two hours and 30 minutes into the stream, we are finally <laughs> in... The sequel. Resident Evil 2. Ah, stop it! <laughs> I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna oh, have God. to like, keep, I'm just gonna have to keep it like that. Anyways. Resident Evil 2, which happens not in the outskirts of Raccoon City, but in the actual main city, the Raccoon City. I like the name Raccoon City. It's very, 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 very memorable. Mm -hmm. Uh, Absolutely. okay. Uh, Zach? Yeah? I've been talking for a while and my, my throat hurts. Could you explain Resident Evil 2? We're finally at a game that I can explain. So Yay! yeah, so I'll, 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 take, I'll take it from here. Don't you worry, I got you, buddy. I'm dying. I'm gonna get some, I'm gonna get some Coke. I'll be right back. Please explain. Thank Sounds you. Sounds good. Okay, so Resident Evil 2. So chat. Yes. After the events of Resident Evil 1 in the Arkley Mountains, the STARS unit manages to escape after the explosion that brought down the Spencer Mansion. Uh, all the STARS units, save for the couple that we see die in Resident Evil 1, survive the incident and make their way back to Raccoon City in an attempt to report what happened. Only mm -hmm. one issue, though, is that after the events of Resident Evil 1, the very small contained incident happening in the mountains where yeah. people were getting infected uh, actually spread to the entire fucking city. Um, the entire the entire deal of Resident Evil 2 is that we now follow a massive T-virus outbreak that has spread throughout the entirety of Raccoon City and led to everyone becoming zombies. Um, everyone. Everyone. And instead of following the STARS unit we've become used to, our, our Chris Redfield, our Jill Valentine, we are instead greeted to two new protagonists who are going to become stable characters in the franchise. One rookie cop, Leon S. Kennedy. Leon! And one Claire Redfield, the sister of Chris. So wow. Resident Evil 2 opens with Leon showing up in Raccoon City for his very first day on the job as being one of the Raccoon City Police Department's very own cops. He chose a very bad day to show up. <laughs> uh, very, 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 very rough day on first day on the job, huh, Leon? Because when Leon shows up for his first day on the police force, he's greeted to a city that is literally ripped to shreds by zombies. Um, Claire, Claire, on the other hand, is showing up to Raccoon City looking for her brother, Chris, who after the events of Resident Evil 1 has mysteriously gone missing. Yeah. So... These two characters kind of fulfill the same role that Chris and Jill did, where you get the two different campaigns. One where you're playing as Claire, trying to find out what happened to Chris, and one where you're playing as Leon, basically just trying to save the city to the best of his abilities. He fails so Because he's a freaking Boy Scout. Hard. He also meets Ada, which is mm -hmm. yep. which is going to be like a running, running thread through his story, following him for the entirety of the rest of the franchise. He meets... He meets... One Asian lady that doesn't want to fuck him, and he becomes obsessed with her for the entire you know, the rest of the matches. <laughs> Leon loves women that don't like him. Yeah. Yep. Like, like Leon, Leon, Leon can't. Leon have has women that literally are throwing themselves at him. They literally go, hey, fun. hey, Leon, you want you want to play some overtime? Hey, Leon, you want to go swimming later or whatever the fuck? And then Leon says, nah, I want the women that don't want to fuck me. I want that. I don't want to continue the, the the Redfield bloodline. I want that Asian pussy. 
<laughs> Asian pussy. <laughs> and she's very hot. She has wears a red dress and she's a super spy. Anyway, we need to watch the intro cutscene of Resident Evil 2 because I'm a fanboy of this game and it's actually super funny. So mm -hmm. we're gonna watch that shit now. And while we're watching Let's that, go. I'm gonna get a bottle opener for my soda. Now, yeah, this is a remade 4K version of the cutscene. This is Claire. She's coming into town to search for the mist. Like, 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 like Sax said. Just, just listen mm -hmm. to what Sax said. Are we watching the remake intro as well? No. No. It's good, like uh, like I said at the beginning of the stream, we're just gonna like mix and match original games with the remakes because they're mostly the same, just like visual details are different. And I'll, I, we're just gonna watch the best parts of each game, you know? We're gonna construct yeah, a timeline. Yeah, like the intro cutscene for the original. Yes. Um, okay, back. We're gonna con we're gonna construct like a timeline based on like remake content and re and original game content because if we cover the remakes, it's gonna be like way too unnecessarily long. And also, there's some details of the originals that are really funny that I want to talk about. And the some of the story of the remakes are really good. Not Resident Evil Three though. We're exclusively only going to talk about Resident Evil Three Nemesis, the original, not the remake. Fuck the remake. <laughs> Which yeah, I'm so okay. happy about. That was my favorite Resident Evil game for so long. Very good. I'm gonna let you go off on that one. Please. I'm finally here. Also, I'm pretty sure that nobody here has seen the cutscene of the original Resident Evil 2. Pretty sure they've only seen the remake cutscene, so here you go. That guy's a maniac. Why'd he bite me? That guy's a maniac! Why'd he bite me? <laughs> what a maniac! The remake is so much better, but I love something about the original RE2 Hello. so much. Random biker woman walks into a bar. Hello? Uh, hello? Oh my god! <gasps> Look, I'm sorry I bothered you, okay? Just don't come any closer. Are you listening? Oh my god! Wait! Don't shoot! Get down! Yeah! <gasps> Get down! We can't stay out here. Head to the police station. It'll be a lot safer. He is so fucking wrong. Yeah! Yo. <laughs> That's the wor- that's the most wrongest you've ever been in your life. That is literally running into the belly of the beast. What's going on? I arrived in town, and the whole place went Rate. insane! The radio's out. You're a cop, right? <laughs> yeah, first day on the job. Great, huh? Name's Leon Kennedy. Nice to meet you. Mine's Claire. Claire Redfield. I came to find my brother, Chris. My brother? Hey, could you open the glove box? Sure. There's a gun inside. Better take it with you. <laughs> what? Wow. Bro, wait, it's so long. <laughs> By the way, uh, I just want to say mm -hmm. that this is Leon's police car, I believe. So, like, there's just a <laughs> random zombie that appeared in Leon's police car. And not only that, thing. but that is the exact same model. Yeah. That yeah, Leon has. Wonder. It has the same hair model. That is the exact same Leon model. Oh, just wait. zombified. 
Oh, Where did he come from? The whole model. It is whole the whole ass model. Even the the polygons are similar. They just like textured the shirt. The the texture of the vest to be like a shirt. That's funny. My twin brother! I kept in the backseat of my police car. <laughs> there he goes. You okay? Still in one piece. <gasps> hey, that maniac's gonna one piece. That maniac! to the station. I'll meet you there. Okay. Where is it? Yay. So, that is Resident Evil 2. At least the start of it. Oh, wow. <laughs> how are we going to tackle this? Because this is like... You know how we said that Resident Evil 1 was complicated with the two different scenarios? Yeah, this is even mm -hmm. worse, isn't This is even worse, because not only is it... St fuck it, stop! Sorry. <laughs> not only is it worse, because you can play as two different characters, but you can play two different ways. You can start with Leon and end with Claire, or you can start with Claire and end up with Leon, but every single one of- every single four of those campaigns happen in the RPD and you go through the exact same puzzles. So there's- you play through the game essentially four times. And yep. there's different cutscenes for depending on which order you play the game on with which character. And... In the original. Sometimes they die, sometimes they are alive. The- the timeline for this is... fucked. So we're gonna try yeah. our best to pick apart each of the cutscenes and try to like... You know, organize it between each character and what what which character has like the most involvement with each person. You know? Yeah, because mm -hmm. like some characters in this game, <clears throat> their story arc is completely different depending on who you're playing as. And the thing is, that doesn't really change between A and B scenario campaigns. Mm -hmm. So you'll play one campaign. Say you do like Leon Leon's A campaign scenario. You'll you'll encounter a character who will go through a whole arc and then die. Mm -hmm. And then you'll play the B scenario, and that character will go through a completely different arc and die a completely different way, even yep. though it's supposed to canonically be happening at the same time. And those characters yep. that die also, like, save the lives of the main characters. So it means that they actually had to have survived up until that point to make sure that the, char the, the main characters survive, but then they die before that I point. So it's... Annette I, Birkin is like either a fucking there's either like two of them running around or she's a magician. I don't fucking know what's going on with her. Yeah, and Annette, Annette mm -hmm. Birkin is the main one that is gonna be like so annoying to talk about because her whole character arc is so all over the place based entirely on who you're playing as. Mm-hmm. Like, so we are gonna separate this between Leon's plot points and Claire's plot points. Mm-hmm. Sack. Which one do you so, want to take? Which um, one? Which one? Claire or Leon? Because, like, I'm going to do one of them. See, okay. Me, personally, I found myself more fascinated by Claire's campaign. So I can take over for Claire and you can do Leon if you'd like. Okay. That's perfect. I can do that. Also, great, because, like, I had a crush on Leon when I was a kid for Resident Evil 4. So, like, this my boy. This oh, Lily. Okay. This my boy. <laughs> My boy Leon. Good for you. I, I figured you'd want Leon more anyway, and that yeah. works out for me because I like Claire's campaign. So, like like Sack said, Leon S. Kennedy is a rookie cop coming into Raccoon City as the, his first day on the job. In the original game, he was a he was like late to it because he got drunk at a party, and yep. over what? He, he, he got drunk at a party, and because he, he was like a party animal during his like younger years or some shit like that. So oh, really? he he had to like run away and let, in, run like to the Raccoon City like on his car, like going very late on the job. In the remake, 
Leon is changed to be like much more of a good-hearted person. So instead of being like late, he actually got a letter from the uh, police department saying to stay away from the city because some bad shit is happening there. Because, but yep. because Leon is so kind-hearted and nice and awesome and really hot, he just goes in any way to, like, check out what's going on and try to help out wherever he can. He finds out the entire city is infested with zombies, meets Claire, and then gets into the Raccoon City Police Department, which is a fucking death trap. That place is crawling around with zombies, uh, barely any survivors in there. The only one that he meets alive that didn't get cut in half the moment that he fucking found them, is Lieutenant Marvin, a really, 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 really cool boy that gives Leon his knife. Hey, well, Carter, thank you for the five dollars. The M Marvin is essentially the main, the main character that you gotta keep an eye out during the first part of the game. Uh, he tells you to look around for survivors around the on the RPD until you find Claire, and then you go down down below into the sewers where you fight a weird, creepy, super mutant character that Sack is going to talk about later. That's he's called William Birkin, but Leon doesn't get involved in that very much. Essentially, after doing that whole thing and exploring the RPD, Leon finds Ada, which is a government agent, according to her. She's an FBI agent that is trying to get intel in the, corru the corrupted business of Umbrella and whatever the fuck. She, she had an informant called Ben locked up in the RPD, and she was going to get info off of him, but Ben died, got killed by the Mr. X, which you can see on the bottom right of the screen, like uh, Clyde's horns kind of like Obscure him a little bit. Hold on, let me grab him. So, that's Mr. X. That is a actually <laughs> properly finished, weaponized version of the Tyrant from Resident Evil 1. That bitch is sent out by Umbrella into the infected city to get rid of any uh, survivors and any people that may be connected to or may be able to whistleblow Umbrella's involvement in the Arclay Mountains incident and the current destruction of Raccoon City. So, Leon and Ada find Ben, he's fucking dead, and then the they have to go into a secret underground research lab made by Umbrella called The Nest that is underneath Raccoon City and the Raccoon City Police Department to get a sample of the G-Virus, which is a virus created by William Birkin, a scientist of Umbrella who turned rogue because he didn't want to give up his uh, prized possession. So he fought with Umbrella and to like, keep away the G from the higher-ups and accidentally infected himself, no, no, didn't accidentally, I injected himself with the G-Virus and killed everyone that tried to kill him accidentally releasing the T-Virus into the sewer system, which the rats got, which, and then the rats passed it off to everyone in Raccoon City. Leon, after finding the sample, tries to give it to Ada, but it is then stopped by Annette Birkin, which is uh, Birkin's uh, wife, who reveals that Ada is not actually a government agent, she is actually a spy who was sent in by a rival fucking company, I think? Was it a rival company? I think it was the rival company. They never really reveal who Ada's working for in mm -hmm. RE2. They Just that did. she was planning on selling it to the highest bidder. Yes, yeah, so Ada is actually not a government agent. She's a super spy that was contracted to steal the sample and kill Annette Birkin and get the fuck out of there before the whole city blew up, blows up. Leon is shocked at this revelation, and he is, is apparently smitten that a woman managed to fucking lie to him or some shit like that. So, Leon actually wants to help out Ada and say, like, You will, you would never kill me, would you? And th they have, like, an anime confrontation on top of, like, a floating, like, bridge, like, overseeing, like, a giant death, endless, bottomless pit. Ada, because she's actually, actually kind of has some feelings for Leon, doesn't actually shoot Leon, but accidentally falls off the bridge. Leon tries to save Ada. She falls in anyways. 
but manages to survive. <laughs> How? And can I? Shut up. Can I just add? <laughs> can I just add oh. something? Yeah? To mm -hmm. that moment that I always found really cool in the original that I wish was brought over into the remake. Mm -hmm. Um, so a detail in the original that they left out of the remake mm -hmm. is that after that scene with Ada, you can actually get the gun that she was carrying whenever she was pointing it at Leon in that ending sequence. Mm -hmm. And when you pick up that gun, you find out it wasn't even loaded. Oh, um, okay. That's pretty good. She didn't put any bullets in it. Like, I wish that detail carried over because that's really cool. So yeah, Ada and Leon do canonically have feelings for each other. But because Leon is a goody two shoes government agent, like goody two shoes, like super, super helpful super boy, and she is like, like Shadow the Hedgehog, like anti hero. <laughs> <laughs> Shadow the Hedgehog, anti hero. She's like an evil super spy. They are usually like going against each other in the games. So they have like a kind of like a rival, like relationship going on like oh i like you but also you're my enemy but i like you though so i won't shoot you and it will help you sometimes but also i gotta like i gotta save i gotta save you but i also gotta save the sample that i'm working that i need to get for my employers or some shit like that they have like this very like cat and mouse like weird super spy versus government agent relationship going on and it's very cute it is actually extremely cute it's one of the too dynamic that gets carried on for the future of the games that I actually really love. Even mm -hmm. though it's like the same shit yeah. every time, it's actually really funny every time. Um, also, I just realized, yeah, no, Leon Kennedy is basically the Sonic the Hedgehog to Ada's, like, Shadow the Hedgehog. Like, they're just, like, the really goody two-shoes blue guy and, like, the the red evil guy, edgy blue, red guy that is working for the evil company, but then secretly has, like, a golden heart even though she's actually kind of responsible for, like, the deaths of billions by the end of the series, because so mm -hmm. many fucking people died because of the samples that she retrieved for the bad guys. <laughs> anyway, yep. so that's the story of Leon. I need to think about that. He essentially gets super traumatized by this, by the way, because, like, Leon came in to, like, help people in the city and, like, watched every single person in front of him, die. Oh, so, um, you, you you left out a you left out a a, a really sad part I will, of the story. I will get to that. Yeah. I will get to that. So uh, before we move on, I also want to show one of the cutscenes of the original Resident Evil Two with Leon that I find extremely fucking funny. And just for a tiny little detail, like like I just wanted to show this because there was no other no other way I was going to be able to show this on stream. This is the first time that Leon meets a liquor. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy! <laughs> and that's it! I just wanted to show that the first time that Leon ever oh meets a liquor, his reaction is not like, oh my god, or like, I can't believe it, or, oh, oh, man. oh, oh, oh man, it's like, oh boy! <laughs> Oh, He's boy. excited. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, really. Um, by the way, the liquors are like a... Um... Shit. Okay, so I have to explain. Uh, the liquors are something that the that appears on Resident Evil 2. They're actually the end, the evolutionary endpoint of what happens once a corpse is infected. I mean, not a corpse. A person is infected for long enough with the T-virus. Essentially, after a person turns into a zombie, they will eventually turn into a Crimson Head after they are downed in the Resident Evil 1 Remake. A Crimson Head is like a redder, angrier, with sharper claws and teeth version of a zombie. After, yep. after the Crimson Head exists for a long enough time, they will turn into a Liquor, which is like a fucking skinless, eyeless, long-tongued freak of nature thing that has like a brain exposed for some reason like like this is not a umbrella experiment like this is the natural the only thing they have exposed this is like the natural endpoint of a t-virus infected human this is just for some reason what the t-virus likes to make after like a crimson head lives on for long enough they're mm -hmm. also one of the most popular enemies in the series which is why yeah. you would see them a lot going on moving forward in the franchise even though 
They don't they don't really make sense for them to appear in some other games, but whatever. They're like iconic monsters. They're, they're like the second most iconic monster aside from Nemesis and the Tyrant and I, I guess the Ganados from Resident Evil 4. But yeah, they're they're mm -hmm. they're super iconic. Anyway, I want to also give the remix some props because it made one of my favorite cutscenes in the entirety of the series that actually carries forward into Resident Evil 4 Remake because it shows the actual trauma and emotional, like, the, 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 emo the emotional turmoil that Leon is going through <sighs> after not being able to save a single person in Raccoon City. So this cutscene takes place, like, in the middle of the game after they're able to escape the police department. Mm -hmm. And they... Like, Leon and Ada are going through the Kendo gun shop to be able to get through their to their destination. Going yep. through that gun shop looks like the only way. And it's weird, because they only address this in the remakes, because, you know, like, the, the original, like, Leon in RE4 doesn't really care much about the... Yes. This. It's weird. And the, original, cool that they added and the original series, Leon is just a badass for being a badass sake. Yep. Uh, but in the remakes, they actually give Leon some proper trauma to work through and give him reasons to why he acts the way he does post the Raccoon City incidents. This is one of the reasons. I'm not gonna hurt you. I said don't move. I'm just passing through. I'm gonna ask you to lower that weapon. I kill you off. You gotta turn around and go right back out the way you came in. This is just a survivor. In Raccoon City. Tell me how to deal with my daughter. Drop it. No! Wait! Step aside. We need to terminate her before she turns. Terminate. It's my fucking daughter. Mm hmm. Just let them be. Emma? Sweetheart, I told you to stay put. Daddy. Daddy's here. Okay. Okay. Those fucking things outside. Look what they did to us. You're a cop. You're supposed to know something. How did this happen? Huh? She was our sweet little angel. Mommy. I was sleeping, honey. Okay. And I'm gonna put you to bed too, okay? Emma. Privacy. You know, it's one thing to keep the truth from me, but why him? <sighs> I want to find out what's happening here and stop whoever's behind it. Helping people like them? That's why I joined the force. My mission is to take down Umbrella's entire operation. We may not make it out. Whatever it takes to save this city, count me in. Only one shot. Yeah, you only ever hear one shot. Subscribe. <laughs> Fucking no. All right, so. <laughs> that is a very important moment in Resident Evil 2 Remake, which moves forward Leon's character development into a cold-hearted badass for the rest of the series. 
in Resident Evil 4, in which Leon is the protagonist, he actually mentions that specific incident in, like, it shows on the intro as one of the reasons for why he became, a, like, a government agent that essentially was tasked to take down bioweapons all across the world. Like, that that moment right there is what gave Leon the determination and the guilt to become a, basically, one of the main protagonists of the series. It's a amazing moment that I will... That is... That is, I will never get tired of praising. That is one of the best. Can I? Hmm? Oh that, no, keep going. That is one of the best moments in the remake, and it's so impressive because in the original Resident, Resident Evil Two, the gun shop kendo moment was literally just a a shop that you went through, and then you found the guy that held you at gunpoint, and then he got killed by zombies, and that was it. Like compared to the original, the remake did such a good job with kendo. Absolutely, and like. <laughs> Can I just say, too, mm -hmm. that moment in Resident Evil 2 was the first time it really hit me just how horrifying the T-Virus is as a concept. Yep. Because, like, it's not just like, oh, yeah, a bunch of dead bodies started walking again. No, this is a virus that when you are infected by it, slowly but surely erases every bit of your personality and memories until you're nothing but a husk, and then you just start eating the people you care about. It's not even that it reanimates corpses. Again, I'm gonna say it again. It doesn't reanimate corpses. It literally just turns living beings into mindless cannibals that kill everyone in sight. It's super fucked up. Like, <sighs> just, just, like, because that's the, that's one of the only times we see a situation where, like, somebody who's been infected with the T-virus is in the middle of their infection, but they aren't fully turned. So she's, mm -hmm. like, She's still herself, but she barely has any memories anymore, aside from associating the man in front of her as being her dad. And, like, that's just so scary, because, like, I don't, I don't know, it, it just, it, it disturbs me in the same way, like, the idea of dementia is scary. Also, uh, yeah. once again, at the end of that cutscene, there's only one shot, which means that Kendo either took care of put his daughter to sleep and then he had to look at that and live with that for however long it took him to do the second shot or he survived after that it is it is kind of implied by like a sub story dlc thing that he ends up surviving the raccoon city incident it is more than likely not true Kendo yeah, probably that's an alternate alternate like, timeline thing. Yep. Kendo more than likely died within Raccoon City after shooting his daughter in the face with a shotgun. Or you can have the other fucked up scenario of Kendo not being able to bring himself to kill his daughter, and therefore he turns the gun on himself. And then the daughter doesn't say anything, which means that she's already past the point where she can understand that her daddy killed himself in front of her. And then once she turns into a zombie, she would probably begin to eat his corpse. It is both ways. It is just a, such a fucked up scenario to think about. And we don't know yeah. which one it was. Yeah, he didn't live. That's for sure. Yep. So yeah, that's one of the best parts about the Resident Evil 2 remake, and it's also one of the reasons for why it's, like, my second favorite Resident Evil game ever, aside from, like, the, the mechanics and the gameplay being, like, awesome. Mm -hmm. Anyway! Now we finally end Leon's story, and I'm just gonna show the cutscene where, where he confronts Ada at the end, because this is a very important point in Leon's story. Mm -hmm. This is Annette Birkin. Uh, blah, 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 blah. She's a mercenary. So oh, the 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 the, the, the evil lady is evil. G virus is gonna go to the highest bidder. Annette dies there. I hope you're right. And then Leon confronts Ada in the middle of the laboratory that is currently in self-destruct mode because of course it is. Of course, yeah. You just gotta assume just that at this point. Mm -hmm. That makes two of us. I'm 
Everyone's getting worried. No, we make a good team. I gotta ask you something. Way's clear. Please, tell me you got it. Oh, I got it. Can we verify the G sample when we get the hell out of here? Verify. I ran into Annette. She claims you're not FBI. Why couldn't you just hand over the sample? As I realized, as much as I wanted to trust you, oh. I didn't. I really hoped it wouldn't end up like this. So that's all this was? I was just some pawn to you? Look, I'm just doing my job. And I'm doing mine, so drop that damn gun! I'm taking you in. Hand over the sample. What a good boy scout. I don't want to hurt you. I always love that line, because take her where, Leon? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What do you mean I'm taking you in? Where, Leon? He didn't even want to kill her. She was like, he was like, oh, I'm going to take you to justice. You're going to be in a prison cell in... away from here. Bad girl. Lock her up in the RPD? Like... Oh, uh, she's a, such a bad bitch, though. Like, Leon has to fix her. <laughs> but I don't think you can. So instead of not having a bullet on the chamber, she just straight up just doesn't shoot him. Mm hmm But then... Oh! Annette, you piece of shit! That's some really nice aim, by the way. Really nice that he, like, she didn't shoot Leon. That's the G-Virus sample. Sack is gonna talk more about the G-Virus later. Mm hmm And Annette finally fucking dies. Hold on. I think I can... Forget it. Shut up, I've got you. No. It's not worth it. Don't do this. Take care of yourself, Leon. No! no! She survives this. Yeah. You know she just whipped out that grappling hook yep. from thin air. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Canonically, Ada survives that. And they don't even, like, show it for the next game. Like, she literally shows up at the end of her, like, Leon's story and gives him a fucking rocket launcher. Without him knowing. Without him even knowing. Which is super fucked up. You would figure, like, Leon would fucking hate Ada. Because, like, yep. not only did she betray him, but after that, he had to watch her die, and Ada never even wrote back. Like, hey, I'm alive, yeah. hey! Doesn't he find out by RE4? Yeah, like, he, like, some, in like, he got intel. He got intel from yeah. someone that she was alive doing some bullshit some other place. Which is like, imagine, imagine, not even, imagine your ex after you both separate and she dies in a, in a fucking bridge fall. You see, you actually get a phone call from someone and say, and th that says like, actually, no, she didn't actually die, even though you grieved for her for like years. She was actually just living it up in the Caribbean, like fucking get it, getting some other a spy bullshit with other agencies. You'll be so fucking pissed. So yeah, their relationship is like one of the best parts of Resident Evil 2 Remake, in my opinion, and Resident Evil 2 in general. And Resident Evil in general, Leon and Ada are just such couple goals. They <laughs> they fucking hate each other. They, they want to kill each other. Leon wants to take her in. She wants to redeem. He wants to redeem her. Ada just wants to be left alone. She's an independent woman. She wants the money, but she has a heart of gold. And that's actually, that, even though she caused the deaths of billions of people by, by working with shitty organizations, she actually has a heart of gold, and that's all, that's all that really matters. 
I guess. She can get away with it because she's yeah. hot. She's hot. Yeah. That's she's it. Hot. She's hot. That's it. That's it. He can fix Asian her. Pussy. Asian pussy. She can fix. He can fix her. Canonically, also they also had. I'll, I'll explain later when we get to the movies. We 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 watched <laughs> that with Nick. Anyways. Yep. I'm gonna pass the baton off to Sack for the second half of Resident Evil 2. You go. Okay, I'm just gonna say right off the bat, Claire's campaign is probably some of the like darkest this series will ever get. Hell yeah. Like this this campaign was so fucked. Um. Okay, so Claire's campaign. So her and Leon at the start of the game, as you see from the opening cutscene, the two of them go on their little branching paths and both of them end up at the RPD. However, while Leon was going down his storyline with Ada, Claire was going on her own little adventure trying to find her brother. Um, she goes through the RPD as usual, just like Leon did. But where her story ends up going different is when she has her encounter with William Birkin. Because, you know, Leon fought Birkin over the course of his campaign. But he point. wasn't really involved in Birkin's story. Claire gets very involved because when Claire first encounters Birkin, she also encounters this little girl you can see in the top right corner named Sherry. And Sherry, when we first meet her, seems to be hiding from Birkin for whatever reason. And yeah. it, it can be inferred from when we first meet Sherry that the reason why Birkin was even down in the area where you first meet him was because he was following her there. Um, and... Some other things to note that is really fucking creepy in that first Birkin boss fight is that Birkin, at the point that we see him, the humanoid one in the top left, he's able to say a very limited like amount of words in the state he's in. The only words he's able to say are help me and Sherry. Hmm. So, yeah. yeah, Birkin was following this Sherry girl and he really wanted to catch her for whatever reason. So Claire ends up saving her and her and Sherry end up, uh, her and Sherry end up becoming like a little duo for the campaign. Um, and it's as the two of them are trying to escape the RPD that we're introduced to easily my least favorite Resident Evil character. Oh. This fucker. Big motherfucking chief goddamn irons. Irons. Listen, if there is ever, ever a character that you would describe as being like the son of a bitch you want dead more than anything, it's chief fucking irons. This guy is the worst. And I don't mean like, I don't mean like poorly written. No, he's amazingly written. He's just the worst, most miserable piece of shit that you'll ever see in any of these games. Um, because okay, Chief Irons was the police chief who was uh, who was working for the Raccoon City Police Department, mm -hmm. and he was basically the one who was in complete control of this police station as a result of him being, you guessed it, secretly working for Umbrella. Yeah! Yep. <laughs> because everyone's secretly working for Umbrella if they're a bad guy. Um, uh -huh. So Chief Irons was the police chief being paid off by Umbrella who essentially allowed them to do all their operations without the police getting involved. Um, and all the money he was given for being paid off, he used to buy out an art museum, which was where the RPD was built, because this guy had an obsession with artwork. Which, by the way, that's your convoluted reason why RE2 is filled to the brim with puzzles in the RPD was because it used to be an old museum. That um, was filled with like, like, traps and like secret contraptions and puzzles and like statues that you can take apart and put together and like they open up like little paths that give you a gemstone and stuff like that it is still fucking stupid yep. oh it's so dumb uh but yeah so chief irons was the police chief being paid off by the umbrella corporation to essentially have the entire police force turn a blind eye to anything related to umbrella um like he was also the hmm? like the moment that the alpha team survives the, the Arclay Mountains incident. They come back to Chief Irons, reporting what happened at the at the Spencer estate, and and Chief Irons said like, "Y'all crazy? What are you talking about? Oh, what, what the fuck? Uh, zombies? Y'all are crazy!" Like he he was the one that put the the put his foot down and completely covered up what happened in Resident Evil One. 
Um, and that's actually yeah. going to come back up in Resident Evil 3, too. So rem remember the detail that they went to Chief Irons and told him about the Arkley Mountains, because that's really relevant to RE3 when we yep. get to that game. Yep. Um, also, Chief Irons was a straight up serial killer who had an obsession with taxidermy. Um, mm -hmm. you, you find out more details about it in the original RE2 as opposed to the remake. But um, there was a point in time during Raccoon City where um, where ch a bunch of blonde women, blonde, like mid to late 20s women uh... started going missing. Um, yeah, and it turns out it was Chief Irons that was responsible because, yeah, Chief Irons had an obsession with the mayor's daughter, and he would kidnap and murder w women that looked just like her. And when the Raccoon City incident happened and the whole city went into friggin' chaos, he immediately took that as an opportunity to finally kidnap her and murder her. Yeah. Um, what, there's a point in the game where you see that he's taxidermying her corpse. Inside so, yeah. of an orphanage. Inside of an orphanage. Oh, we'll get to that <laughs> fucking orphanage. I'm not even at the orphanage yet. The orphanage is somehow even worse than this guy. Um, but yeah, so uh, Chief Irons is the worst, most miserable piece of shit you'll ever see in the series. And as Claire and Sherry meet up and are trying to escape the RPD, who shows up but good old Chief Irons who kidnaps Sherry and friggin' ties up Claire and effectively leaves her to die. Because... As it turns out, during the whole outbreak, Chief Irons became incredibly paranoid that he was infected by the T-Virus. So paranoid that he went after Sherry and kidnapped her because, boo, big plot twist, Sherry is William Birkin and Annette Birkin's daughter. And Ooh. he believed that by holding their child hostage, that the, uh, the, the, the higher-ups at Umbrella would give him a cure to the T-Virus so that he would be saved from the infection. Um, and where he ends up taking her is the orphanage. The Raccoon City Orphanage. Could... Sponsored by Umbrella. Yeah, so get this. <laughs> get try, try and see the red flags here, chat. Um, Raccoon City had an orphanage that was funded almost exclusively by the Umbrella Corporation and was endorsed by good old police chief Irons, who was also a supervisor there that would go in for, you know, frequent checkups on how all the kids were doing. So mm -hmm. yeah, turns out the orphanage was a front for Umbrella to get more test subjects, because what would happen is that Umbrella would send up staff members who would pretend to be parents adopting children. The children would be taken away and then be turned into experiments for the T-virus. There was a point in one of the notes that you can find inside of the orphanage where a little kid whose name escapes me, I would just say Billy, got adopted by a new family, quote unquote, and then eventually he managed to escape the Umbrella Research Team and then came back to the orphanage and everyone found him and he was filled with like rotten flesh and like skid marks and like 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 gashes and he was barely holding on to dear life that that kid clawed his way back to the orphanage to go back home to his friends at the orphanage and the moment that he collapsed and like either he passed out or died the men from umbrella took him away in front of all the children oh by the way there's a fucking graveyard in front of the orphanage Wait, really? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't notice. What? If any if any kid dies in the orphanage, they got they get fucking put in the ground in the orphanage itself because it's made by Umbrella. So like every 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 of the child every one of the children in that orphanage is property of Umbrella. So they don't get a proper burial. They just get fucking sent into the grave in front of the fucking orphanage. Yeah, which. That's like one of the most morbid like notes Fuck. you'll read is hearing that some kid got taken by Umbrella to be experimented on. He managed to just barely escape after he was like uh, had undergone what was effectively torture, but he ended up running back to the people that tortured him because the only safe place he knew was the orphanage he grew up in. Fuck. So he had no idea it was their fault that he ended up that way. So they ended up just taking him back after he got away. It is so messed up. Chief Irons. Yeah. On the daily, uses the orf the Raccoon City Orphanage 
the and the back of the orphanage uses that place to taxidermy women. Yeah, that's the other thing. Chief Irons has an office at the back of the orphanage where he does his taxidermy work. And we as Sherry walk in and see him taxidermying the mayor's daughter. Um, Fuck. Yeah. Uh, continuing the story though, beyond how fucked that is, Claire eventually arrives in the orphanage to save Sherry. Um, and it turns out that um, in the time that Claire took to get there, Sherry had actually already gotten away from Chief Irons because something happened in the orphanage. Um, Sherry tried getting away, and when it seemed like Chief Irons was about to kill her because she threw acid in his face, suddenly William Birkin showed up and saved his daughter. Yay! Which, it seems at first like maybe there's a part of him that's still conscious inside of that <sighs> weird infected body he's trapped in that oh, he would shit. go out of his way to save her. Yeah, we're getting to that. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, we're uh, getting to that. I'm glad I don't get to explain this. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're lucky. I bit the bullet explaining this <laughs> campaign. I bit the fucking bullet having to break this storyline to chat. Go on. So, William Birkin shows up and saves Sherry from Chief Irons, and that's how he dies. As well as that, um, in Claire's campaign, the Mr. X tyrant that pursues us throughout the game also tries to kill Sherry, and William Birkin saves them from that too. Huh. Seems like a part of Birkin is still conscious inside that monster. Let's talk about how the G virus works, chat. Ah! Oh! Oh! <laughs> no. So the G virus Cause... is very special. Mm-hmm. It it, it so... does not work like the T virus works. No. So the G virus is very very special. See. The T-Virus was created by Umbrella with the express purpose of being able to create a super soldier. You know, it would it would slowly deteriorate the mind of those who were infected by it, but in return, they would gain crazy regeneration powers. The whole idea of creating a, you know, loyal, a loyal soldier that could take anything that was thrown at them. The G-Virus is essentially that concept on steroids. It is an infinitely adapting uh, like virus that went inside of its host w causes constant mutations and rapid regeneration to the point that their body can't even keep up with it anymore. Which is why when we see William Birkin, he's literally growing a new flesh off of his body mm -hmm. that looks like some kind of tumor. The G virus is infinitely evolving and changing into something different. You see and the whole thing with the eyes of like most Resident Evil monsters. Most of the Resident Evil monsters have those eyes because they're offshoots of the G virus, which constantly creates new material off of its host. And like, if you kill something that is infected by the T virus, and if you leave a single cell alive, much like in fucking Dragon Ball, it will eventually grow <laughs> back completely. So Chris, I mean, not Chris, or uh, Claire or Leon can kill Birkin once, and then that motherfucker will come back again and again and again and again. And you see, that's the thing too, is that because like that explains too, because Birkin has like five different forms. We see him in throughout the game. That's mm -hmm. the reason why he's constantly looking different because every single time uh, a host of the G virus takes considerable amounts of damage, their body effectively overcompensates to heal the damage that's done because of the virus. And it causes rapid mutations until eventually they're not recognizable anymore. And that's not the only trait of the G virus. Oh, oh no. That's not the only thing about oh, it. Because yeah, you see the G virus being an infinitely growing and infinitely evolving virus, yep. it wants to spread. It wants to reproduce. And, and the thing is with the that? G virus is that in order for a G virus host to properly reproduce, it needs to find another host with similar DNA to that of the original host. Ugh. Most suitably, children or siblings. Yep. So, so <laughs> throughout the entirety of the campaign, William Birkin, the creator of the G-Virus that infected himself with the sample of the G-Virus, is going around 
the Raccoon City Police Department and the sewers looking around for his daughter. Because we we believe, we believe throughout the entire campaign that the reason he's like pursuing her is because he's trying to help her. No, William Birkin is not conscious at all yeah. inside of that like friggin virus infected body. His body is essentially being puppeted by the G-Virus and the virus is obsessed with spreading and reproducing and Sherry is the most suitable host for it. You can see all throughout Resident Evil 2 in the sewers, victims of William in which he with his giant G arm takes out a giant like insect thingy of the G-Virus and plants it into the mouth oh, of everyone that he encounters. So Chief Irons dies via getting infected with the G-Virus because like Birkin just grabbed them and f fucking shoved a G-Virus insect down his throat. And that, but because Chief Irons is not really related to uh, William Birkin in any way, the parasite just kind of like fucking exploded out of his chest and that's how like Chief Irons died. Mm -hmm. So every victim of William Birkin, you can find them in the sewers and you can find G parasite monsters in the sewers that are like barely working humanoids. Just like flesh pit monster thingies like walking around in the sewers trying to infect everyone they see, but they barely fucking work because they're not related to Birkin. Birkin needs to find Sherry and infect her with the G-Virus so that it can properly continue to spread. Yeah, that, and that, that exact thing is why Umbrella was so fucking scared of the G-Virus and why they, they didn't want it. Because the thing is with the T-Virus, yeah, it created zombies, it created liquors, it was very volatile. But the mm -hmm. thing was with this T-Virus was that it had results that actually worked. They made their tyrants. They were able to create usable bioweapons. The G-Virus does not create anything even remotely usable. Yep. It is so volatile and so potent that anyone who's infected by it just becomes a friggin' mass of meat that is just obsessed with reproducing with whatever the hell it can get its hands on. It they is not a usable virus. They don't create bio-soldiers or anything. It literally just creates Cronenberg masses of flesh that writhe around and try to, like, infect other things. It's just disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting and one of the most morbid viruses of the entire franchise. A lot of viruses in the future of the franchise use the G-Virus as a base, but they don't feature the wild fucking growth and invulnerability of the G-Virus. William Birkin, as the creator of the virus, is like both a genius and also the stupidest motherfucker ever, because the moment that he created that, he became so obsessed with the research of the G-Virus that he refused to give Umbrella the G-Virus and then eventually injected himself with it and like killed everyone in the room and kick-started the whole Raccoon City incident because he was so obsessed with it. Th that thing is like one of the best creations of the entire franchise aside from like the Plagas. Yeah, like yeah. the G-Virus, the G-Virus is like one of the most fascinating infections to me that the series has, but it's also one of like, it, it's, the, it's the one that disturbs me the most. I find the G-Virus so just disgusting to even learn about whenever you play RE2 because it's just like it is it's it's one of the only viruses you learn about in the series that like nobody wanted anything to do with and the guy who made it just friggin was obsessed with it because he viewed his weird virus like he would a child let's actually show we talked about it a lot let's actually show the moment where everything goes to shit for the raccoon for raccoon city the moment where william dies that these are the, uh, like, an Umbrella paramilitary unit. They are being sent into the nest because it's on lockdown, because William Birkin is currently held up inside of the nest, refusing to give the G to uh, Umbrella higher-ups. This way. It's sheer perfection. My precious G-Virus. No one will ever take you away from me. There he is. 
So you finally come. Doctor, we're here to collect the G-Virus sample. Sorry, but I won't just hand over my life's work. <laughs> Doctor, you might hit the sample. That's it, all right. Okay, let's move out. William. Oh, my. Hold on, darling. I'm taking care of that bullet wound first. No, oh, the hand. <laughs> <laughs> Alpha team, have you retrieved the sample yet? Affirmative. We'll be at the rendezvous point in one minute. Roger. <gasps> you dumb motherfucker! Are you I also love the detail that the place where Birkin injected himself in is the place where the main eyeball appears in for the G-Virus. <laughs> Yeah, I always found that so cool. It's more visible in the remake cutscene, but it's really cool that he injects himself like in the arm, and that's where like the the eyeball grows from. Telling me that he injected the G virus into his own body. The G virus has the ability to revitalize cellular functions. What, what, what was that? Something's wrong. Yeah, yeah. Let's check it out. Over there. Shoot. Okay. Eat this, you freak! I'm, I'm stopping it! What is this thing? <laughs> Hurry! That's the T-Virus! What, what is this thing? <laughs> Fire! Hey! And as you can see over there, that is how Raccoon City goes to shit. Just that little tiny vial of the T-Virus gets into the rats, walking around the sewers of the Raccoon City underground, and those rats go along and start biting people, and that's how slowly but surely, over the course of a weekend, Raccoon City gets infected and goes to complete shit. Because of rats! Rats. 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 And all because friggin' Birkin was a little pissy baby. Yep. Yep. Which, yeah, that's one thing I see. A lot of people are like, oh, poor Burke, and whenever it comes to him being like the G-Monster. He's a prick. He literally injected it into himself. He's a prick. He's such a prick. He, he wanted to turn into that thing. Right. Burke is a not a good person. What? Will he have survived if he just gave the, the G away? Uh, or, yes. It's or will the umbrella just? Oh, it's okay. implied that Umbrella would have disposed of him anyway because they were investigating him for colluding with alongside rival companies. Oh. So it, it's not really assured if it's like if he actually wanted to betray them or not. But it's implied that they would just find a reason to kill him anyway. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you 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 were correct. Whenever you're talking about rival companies, because you can see emails in RE2 remake where it gets brought up that um, when Umbrella was discontinuing his research for the G virus, the reason he was able to continue was because he started getting funded by a third party that took interest in it. Yeah. Right. And that was when Umbrella was like, okay, yeah, we're sending in the special ops. He, he he's he's gone too far. Uh, Shy Mike donates to also says the umbrella so mercs carry MP5s gone, and no S10 what. gas masks. Yep, he was dead no matter what. It, again, once again, the reason for why all this happens is because of corporate greed and espionage and a bunch of rich people doing rich people bullshit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, how to end Wait. it? How to end this? Oh well. Um... Oh, yeah, I, I was I, I was gonna say I gotta finish Claire's campaign. Yes. Because yeah, after we find out all of that shit about the G virus, it turns out that in the time that Claire was away, um, Birkin actually did succeed in infecting Sherry with the G virus, um, and the entire end part of her campaign is essentially trying to find a way 
to cure Sherry so that she doesn't become another G monster. Mm -hmm. um, she ends up meeting with Annette, who at first is crazy apathetic, despite being the girl's mother, um, and is intent on just leaving her to die. However, Claire is able to bring her down into Nest, and it gets found out that there is a medallion, a little pendant that Sherry was wearing throughout the campaign. And it turns out that pendant was the key to a uh, capsule that carried cures for the G-Virus. And Sherry was given that same, uh, that's it, that pendant as a gift for her birthday. For some uh, reason. Or because I guess that was Annette and William's way of showing their love. Hey, if you ever get infected by this horrible virus that your dad's making, you can cure yourself. Ah! Uh that's By the way, fucked. in the original Resident Evil 2, uh, Annette, I mean, not, not Annette, uh, Sherry still had a pendant, but in the original Resident Evil 2, that pendant did not contain a QR code to be able to open up a safe inside of Umbrella's Nest. It actually just contained a sample of the fucking G-Virus. Like, straight up, yeah. it just had the G-Virus in it. Because Annette and Birkin's way of showing love to their daughter is saying, hey, so we want to gift you, secretly want to gift you with, like, a sample of one of the most dangerous viruses known to man. And you just, like, carry it around. Like, that, that's the sample, like, that's one of the samples of the G-Virus that, like, eventually, like, they had to retrieve. It's so fucking stupid. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's so dumb. Wow. It was so, so dumb. But in, uh, but, yeah. but in the remake, uh, it, it ended up being like a key to open up a safe with like the whole set of vials and stuff instead of the nest, which is slightly which less is dumb. Better. Slightly, less, slightly dumb. less dumb. It's slightly less dumb, but also, yeah, the key to the cure of the most dangerous virus you've ever created is being carried around by a child. Uh, awesome. The fuck? Um, yeah, Claire ends up using the pendant. She gets a cure to the G virus. Um... Uh, she ends up meeting up with Annette again, and the same thing ends up happening to Annette where she's gravely injured by Birkin. And this is where we get to the thing I was talking about at the start of RE2, mm -hmm. where certain characters have completely different arcs. Because y'all saw at the end of Leon's campaign how Annette dies after shooting Ada. Mm -hmm. Well, in Claire's campaign, they straight up say, nah, -uh, that didn't actually happen. Because now Annette ends up dying, giving the cure to Sherry and dying next to her in her hospital bed. Yep, because Annette and needed to exist so that they could make a G-Virus cure for Sherry. Yeah, so in one campaign, Annette dies shooting Ada so that the G-Virus doesn't get out. In another campaign, Annette ends up dying with Sherry um, so that she can get cured of the G-Virus. So... How Annette died in canon, I don't really know. <laughs> because the thing is, she's integral to both. <laughs> Fuck yeah. you, fucking no. <laughs> she's integral to both campaigns. Without her shooting Ada, Leon never would have gone down the arc of thinking she was dead. But without her curing Sherry, Sherry would be dead, so... It would actually be a good fucking theory to say that Annette somehow cloned herself or Shadow cloned herself. Because, like, you, you can't have it so that she comes back alive after getting shot by Ada. Because Annette... Because, the, 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 the like... The nest was already blowing the fuck up while she was dying. Like, the entire elevator and stuff and the bridges were, like, collapsing. So there was no way that she would have gotten the time to get back up and then go back to Sherry and then develop the cure for Sherry and then died next to Sherry. It's, like, extremely stupid. There were I, two Annettes like walking around, I guess. I don't know. My my personal headcanon is that right after the cutscene where she shoots Ada and Leon leaves, she gets up, sprints, jumps over the giant hole, and then sprints to Sherry and then dies. <laughs> that's what that's what I think happened. I think yeah, she was hiding some crazy sense. acrobatic skills we didn't get to see. Yeah. Fucking Annette. Well, just like I said for the first game, it's it just it's canon. If it gets mentioned in the next games, that's uh -huh. the rule here. It If something cool happens and then it gets referenced in the future games, that's the canon story. Does it make any sense? No. Shut the fuck up. It's still cool, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Some people are saying the other way around. I really like the idea that she dies next to Sherry. Sherry and Claire leave and they're like, okay, okay, they wait, think wait, I'm wait, dead. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go get over Ada. <laughs> Either way, it doesn't line up, but I don't really care because it's funny. Um, but yeah, so Claire's campaign ends with uh, Sherry gets cured. The two of them get on the train. Um, her and Leon meet back up. Um, and do we have a slide dedicated to G5? We have the entire fucking cutscene. Okay, I was, I was, I, was, I figured you had a cutscene for G5. <laughs> do we? Okay. Do we just show it, or do you want to talk about it? Okay, I'll, I'll talk about it first, and then we can show it. Okay. So, after you complete the B-scenario campaign of either Leon or Claire, you get to see the actual ending to the overall story, where the two stories come together. Um, Where it turns out that uh, William Birkin... Uh, okay, for context, Birkin in-game, all of his forms are called, like, G1, G2, G3. Mm -hmm. His final form is G5, because after all the abuse he goes through throughout the entire campaign for both Leon and Claire, he ends up morphing into what is essentially just this giant blob with no coherent shape or humanoid appearance anymore that just slowly walks forward. So, at the end of the game, Leon finishes his campaign, Claire finishes hers, they both end up on the same train, and G5, the friggin' wall of flesh, that thing, ends up breaking into the train and the final boss... Oh my god, Sherry was ugly. So, sorry, that took me out of it. Oh my god, I never saw her pre-rendered model, Jesus. Um, <laughs> um, man, the final boss is basically just shooting at this wall of flesh before it consumes the entire fucking train. It's such a lame boss fight, but it's like so iconic that it gets brought up again and again in the future of the franchise. The... Final boss for Resident Evil 2 is literally you shoot a wall of flesh coming at you really slowly and you just got to shoot it fast enough until it dies. Yeah, can I be so real about what I think is like a hot take on my part? Because mm -hmm. G5 is one of my least favorite final bosses oh, in the entire series. Oh, really? I, I, it's so anticlimactic to me. I never oh! liked it. Cool. The flesh wall, though, it's so, it's so, it gives you tension and it makes you scared because it's like, it's just coming after you, though. It's super cinematic, but like, I don't know, it's a cutscene, it's not a boss. Yeah, but like, you already, you already finished up multiple bosses before that point. It's like the climatic end, like, you, you know, you're, you're supposed yeah, to be like, like... You, it's like the final last stand stands before like after like everything is you're escaping and all that it's super climatic and cool though yeah, yeah like it's super cool that. it's oh. super cool for like the moment it's super cinematic but like i don't know it's not really a boss fight and also it friggin started the trend of every final boss in every fucking resident evil game for so long just yeah. being g5 again but because it's cool though yeah <laughs> I didn't I think expect. I'd have... I didn't expect we would be on this. Like each of us would be on this side of the discussion. Honestly. Honestly, I, I, I think I think I'd have less of a sour taste in my mouth over this boss fight if not for the fact that every fucking Resident Evil game after for the longest time just did this boss fight again. So now I just have like, I just have this like sour taste in my mouth towards Resident Evil bosses that are just cutscene where you can shoot. Uh, everyone in chat is saying like. Terraria moment like this is just a Terraria boss fight. I'm pretty sure that Terraria took literal actual direct inspiration from G5 because I've never seen a boss fight of this kind beforehand. I think it is like a direct reference to G5 in my opinion. I don't know. I just like the idea of like there's this wall of flesh like slowly crawling towards you out of like sheer desperation like slowly reaching out toward you and just like unload every single bullet that you ever had saved up in the game in this last final moment i just, yeah, I just like it i think <laughs> I, mean, I think i think cinematically it's really really cool but like i don't know i, I compare it to the final boss of the original resident evil and the yeah. final boss of the original re3 and I think the final boss with Nemesis did the concept of, oh, the monster is now just this writhing mass that's slowly crawling at you. I think Resident Evil 3 did that concept, but better, because it actually felt like a boss fight. <laughs> this is true. This is true. The Re Resident Evil 3 Nemesis is a better boss fight, I do agree. And it also has, like, the iconic, like, you want stars? 
I'll give you stars. It's so fucking... And then the remake and the Resident Evil 3 remake ended up fucking wasting that, but... No, yeah. We're not talking about the remake. We're not talking about the remake. No, 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 no. The fucking remake. All right, all right. Now we're gonna actually show the ending as it is, because there's one line at the very end that I goddamn love. You, like Zack said, G5 appears on the train as you're about to leave the nest. By the way, the nest is exploding. For some reason, I, th I think Ada was the one that initiated the self-destruct sequence this time. Eventually, the heroes manage to stop. Finally, the exit. Are you all right? I'm okay. Where's Claire? <laughs> God, Claire? Sherry looks gross. Claire. Right here. She looks like a smaller, like adult. I don't like- I don't like her! Ew! Just won't quit! Come on, we have to get out of here! Run! Hey! Okay, that shot's so iconic, though, of, like, the yep. close-up of his eye. So... It's finally over. Isn't it like literally the menu screen? Yep. Terrible. Well, technically, that's the eye when Birkin was killing the mercenaries that were coming to assassinate him. But I mean, it is the same eye. Yes. Where's the new Claire? Come on, time to leave. Now? Oh, oh, I love this. What's wrong? Is something following us? We have to go. We don't have any time to waste. Go? Where? <laughs> hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. <laughs> wow, I'm sure that's gonna go somewhere, right? Yeah. Don't absolutely. worry about it. There's also like a variation of that cutscene where like Claire gets to say the cool line. At the end but of the it, game, but it's so much less cooler because it was literally just like, I have to find my brother. And then it's just. Umbrella. That's it. She never gets to find the brother. I know, it's so funny. So, I. One, one detail that Zack forgot to mention in Claire's story Cl Claire never actually gets to find Chris in fucking Raccoon City. Right. Yeah, no, she never gets to find him, and we, we actually get more into that when we get to RE3. But um, one thing I do really like that was included is that at one point you find a note in the star's office from oh, Chris. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at first, it's like, if, you, if you're like somebody who like knows the Resident Evil characters and you read the note, it's like really oddly out of character for Chris to write. Um, and when you find it as Leon, that's just that. You find a note that's really oddly out of character. But if Claire finds the note, she comments on it saying, this doesn't sound like Chris at all, because the note is a coded message to the other members of Stars, basically saying, Umbrella's operating outside of Raccoon City. I've left the city to go and find out what they're doing. And the European French branch of Umbrella. I yeah, believe so that the letter was something like, Hey guys, I am currently in a vacation in France. I am picking up some hot chicks in France. So don't come and find me. Barry, be very careful with that Chief Irons guy. I heard he is some, uh, he is a pain to deal with for you guys. Ha 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 ha. Anyway, I will be here with my hot date under this very large umbrella. Wink, 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 wink. Anyway, s smell you later. <laughs> it's so funny because like you pick it up as Claire and she's like, this doesn't sound like Chris at all. <laughs> so yeah, uh, uh, Chris actually left Raccoon City weeks ago before Raccoon City blew up and Claire just didn't get the memo and just went into the city to find her brother and he was just gone. <laughs> Because I guess these siblings don't fucking communicate with each other at all. I don't fucking know. I mean, to be fair, how are you supposed to communicate that? 
I mean, they, I, I, it, it was back in like the 1990s, so I guess they didn't have fucking cell phones. Yeah, like I feel like I feel like Chris. I mean, like we know from RE3, we get into RE3. I'm so excited for RE3. Here but, we like, go. You, you, you learn whenever we get into RE3 that like they were being monitored like crazy. Oh, Chief Irons was like up in their asses 24/7. Absolutely. And it, it was clear that Claire was like far away from Raccoon City at the time, so it would have been impossible for him to tell her what he was doing before he just up and left. I guess it is kind of cool thematically that Claire gets to deal with the fucking asshole that essentially locked down Chris and Jill's like entire operation back in RE1. Like the brother of the, the, the sister of Chris, the, the guy that Chief Irons has been hounding for the entirety of the police department, like his, his stay in the police department got taken down by Claire. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, Claire um Claire basically got to have the opportunity to take down the guy who screwed over her brother's entire like military force because like Chief Irons is responsible for so much of the bad shit that happens to stars after RE1. Yep. Basically the entire plot of RE3 is his fault. I mean the thing with the thing with Chief Irons as well is that now you know that not only Wesker was involved with Umbrella, but also Chief Irons. So like, the the Stars members were just sent to die in the Arclay Mountains. Like they weren't investigating shit. Like they already mm -hmm. knew what was happening back in like the Spencer Mansion. So the only thing they wanted to do was send over the Stars members, to, like get rid of them and gather the combat data for like the hunters and like all the experiments that were going on in that mansion. Also, thank you, Susie mm -hmm. Bell, for the two dollars. Hey, can you redo the whole stream? I wasn't listening for the third time. So it all started at <laughs> Spencer <laughs> Shut the fuck up. There was a string of disappearances no. happening in the Stop. Arclay no, Mansion. No, no, no. <laughs> all right, motherfuckers. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, motherfuckers. Right. I think I'm going to be 90% of this. Except for like me, like bridging over for the next PowerPoint presentations. Ninety percent of this, I am going to be fucking silent because this is Sax territory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody, welcome to Resident Evil Three Nemesis. This okay? This game right here was what got me into classic Resident Evil. Like, Resident Evil 7 was my introduction game. This was the game that got me invested in, like, the classic games. This, until Village, was my favorite Resident Evil game of all time. I fucking love RE3. And so much of that is because of the story and Nemesis as a monster. I fucking love everything about this game. Um, okay, 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 okay. No, no, where, where, where do I start? Okay, so, 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 so. You listen, chat, you listen? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Resident <laughs> Evil 3 takes place at the exact same time that Resident Evil 2 did. It is, it is happening over the span of, I believe, three different days, and it is happening during the exact same Raccoon City incident that Resident Evil 2 was about, but in a completely different part of the city, and this time following Jill Valentine and the other members of Stars once again. Uh, because, during, you remember earlier when we were talking about RE2, how when the stars units came, when the stars unit came back from the Arkley Mountains, uh, they told Chief Irons about everything that was happening, and he essentially shut them up. Well, what ended up happening was that Chief Irons fucking panicked like crazy when the stars members actually came back, and um, he ended up telling Umbrella, "Um, hey guys, we've got an issue. They didn't <laughs> die," <laughs> and Umbrella's like. Fuck! Stars is alive. These guys are going to expose our entire operation. What do we do? So, what ends up happening is that at first there's band aid solutions. Chief Irons was heavily monitoring the Stars unit and everything they did, which was why Chris ended up needing to even send a coded message. And Jill, who was very, very aggressive about the way that she was investigating Umbrella and Chief Irons, ended up being put under house arrest by him and was essentially just trapped in her own house, unable to leave. So, for a while, Stars was essentially operating against the police force, knowing that they were now working for the Umbrella Corporation, and Jill stayed in Raccoon City to learn more about what Umbrella's operations were in the city, while Chris ended up leaving to uh, deal with the uh, European like branch of Umbrella. Um, and that's what ends up leading 
to the plot of RE3 because when the outbreak happens, Umbrella decides that in amidst the chaos, they were going to go for a test run of a new experimental version of the tyrant they created called the Nemesis. Um, now, okay. Hmm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if I should go into Nemesis's origin right now, since he's like the plot of the game, or just kind of like wait until we get to the end of the story. I think the end, because a lot the of happen a lot happens with Jill and the mercenaries in RE3 main. You're right. You're right. Um, basically, all you need to know about the Nemesis right now is that first of all, he's the greatest monster in all of fiction. Uh, that is not bias speaking. That is just pure fact. Um, second of all. <laughs> Um, Nemesis is the most competent and dangerous tyrant that we have seen in the entire series leading up to this point. If the tyrant in the in original game. Resident Evil was just like their first test run of one, and Mr. X was like, you know, their first like actual good tyrant like they created. Like mass produced. Yeah, if, if, if Mr. X was the first mass produced, Nemesis is the first perfect tyrant. Because the main difference Nemesis had compared to any other tyrant, Mr. X, despite being a really good, like, bioweapon, his main issue was that he lacked intelligence. You tell Mr. X to go and kill something, he'll kill it. But you tell Mr. X to carry a weapon, it doesn't, like, that monster doesn't have the brain capacity to be able to wield a firearm. <laughs> Nemesis was the first tyrant they ever created who was intelligent enough to know how to wield weapons like rocket launchers and flamethrowers, uh, which should be shown here. I, I think, yeah, there should be a cutscene that shows it really well. Um, hold on. Yeah, so Nemesis was the first tyrant that was ever created that had the ability to um, wield weapons. And as well as this, which will be explained later, Nemesis has this weird sort of tentacle that is like writhing around throughout his entire body that essentially acts as like an extra arm that he can use to catch people and he uses it to execute his targets. And see, the thing is, because of the fact that Stars was becoming such a problem, Umbrella saw the Raccoon City incident as an opportunity to essentially kill two birds with one stone. They sent Mr. X to, to kill off witnesses of the incident and specifically to get rid of all the Stars members that were causing issues for them. They gave Nemesis the directive to hunt down and kill every single member of Stars that was in Raccoon City. Shout out to Brad. You will be missed. Bye bye, bye buddy. <laughs> that was the guy that gave you the rocket launcher at the end of Resident Evil 1. Yeah. So Resident Evil 3 opens up and Jill is immediately caught amidst all the frigging chaos of the Raccoon City incident. She's running through the streets, fighting down, uh, mowing down zombies, trying to survive. Eventually, she finds refuge in a cafe and runs into Brad. And, you know, Brad was super helpful in the original game. He saved the day against the original Tyrant. But when she finds Brad, he is actually just in this, like, state of panic. He's not speaking coherently. He's just freaking out about how someone is after them. Um, eventually, Jill makes her way to the RPD in order to try and get uh, her weapons back. And whenever she makes her way there, um, she ends up running into Brad again, who, who, you know, ends up being murdered by the nemesis as we see right here. And it's here where Jill finds out about what Umbrella's done. The fact that nemesis was sent into the city specifically to wipe out their entire squad. And now that he just murdered Brad in front of her, she's the only stars member left in the city. So fucking so, cool. The entire plot of Resident Evil 3 is that Jill is trying her hardest to get out of uh, Raccoon City while a bioweapon that is specifically engineered to kill her is hunting her down constantly. Um, along the way, while she's, uh, while she's making her way through the city, eventually she runs into Carlos, uh, my second favorite protagonist from the series. I love Carlos so much. Fuck yeah, Carlos. Um, Carlos is the best. Carlos is a part of a group of mercenaries that was actually hired by Umbrella specifically to uh, find and rescue any and all civilians who survived the outbreak. And when Jill first meets Carlos, understandably when she hears he's a, an Umbrella mercenary, she immediately assumes, oh yeah, this guy's a piece of shit. He's not here to save people. He's here to friggin' 
you know, kill them or bring them to Umbrella to get experimented on or whatever. So Jill meets a group of survivors who are with him. And basically the entire group that Jill is allied with throughout this entire game is a group of people who work for Umbrella. So she does not trust a single person she works with. Um, which ends up being uh, kind of in the right on her part because it turns out one of the members of this mercenary squad, surprise, surprise, is working for Umbrella slash yeah. negative. <laughs> <laughs> and so the other guys, they're working for Umbrella slash positive. This guy is Nikolai bitch slash negative. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. And you'll never guess, you'll never guess why Nikolai, Nikolai's a bad guy. Yeah. Cause, what is that? Cause why? it turns out that Nikolai was sent alongside this group of mercenaries to observe the nemesis fighting Jill to collect combat data. Combat data. <laughs> combat data. On what how the, the fuck nemesis. What that means? On how the, yeah. So he's there to collect combat data about the nemesis. So, Basically, the entire plot of this game revolves around the whole thing of Jill is trying to survive against this monster, and the one group of people she can rely on is slowly but surely being eliminated as a result of the nemesis, and Nikolai being this piece of shit that's just killing anybody who gets in the way of uh, his operation. Um, eventually, over the course of the game, um, Jill ends up getting infected by the nemesis because he's able to infect people by piercing them with that weird tentacle that comes out of his arm. And after she gets infected with the T-Virus by the Nemesis, Carlos basically goes on his own little campaign where um, he goes through this hospital to try and get a vaccine for the T-Virus. And it's also during this, uh, it's also during this portion of the story where Carlos tries to cure Jill by getting a vaccine that it also turns out that the government plans on nuking Raccoon City. Um... Yeah, so I guess the zombie outbreak was a big enough deal that uh, they just decided to wipe Raccoon City off the map. So yeah, Jill and Carlos are now trapped in a city with a monster that is trying to hunt down and kill both of them. Jill is infected by the T-Virus and now the entire city is going to get nuked in like a couple hours. Um, Holy also, shit. He, also, Carlos blew up the hospital. Um... <laughs> That also, happened too. Also, there's yeah. a giant um, worm in the in in, in, a, in a graveyard. I was I was gonna get to the grave digger. I was I, ooh, okay. Ooh, 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 I love the grave digger. I love the fucking grave digger. So, um, yeah. Over the course of this campaign, you encounter Jill encounters a lot of really unique monsters. Um, you wouldn't know that if you played the remake, but in the original, <laughs> you get to see a yeah. lot of cool monsters. I have um, no idea about this. <gasps> So one of the monsters that Jill encounters after getting cured by the vaccine is this thing you're seeing in this cutscene called the Grave Digger. Do you remember earlier how we talked about how when an animal gets infected oh, God, by the T-Virus like stays in a dog? Yeah, it, it, it don't look right. <laughs> it don't look right at all. Um, but you, you know how we talked about how when an animal gets infected by the T-Virus, it just becomes really big? The Grave Digger is a special example of that that I adore, which by the way, it's not in the remake. Uh, Capcom, go fuck yourselves. Um, the, the Grave Digger starts out, started out as this regular earthworm that got infected by the T-Virus because the outbreak had gotten so bad that it literally began seeping into the earth and infecting like underground animals. And these T-Virus infected worms would start eating bigger animals than them they'd get bigger as a result of eating them, and then they'd move on to bigger prey. So slowly but surely, these worms just got bigger and bigger and bigger as they moved up the food chain, until eventually, they were big enough to start eating people. Well, and corpses in the graveyard. Exactly. The reason it's called a grave digger is because these giant mutated worms would burrow their way to the graveyards in Raccoon City and start eating the corpses that were buried underground. Um... So Jill has a couple run-ins with those things as well. Uh, they were removed in the remake and replaced with chickens. <laughs> Sewer chickens. Actually, they're called the the Hunter Gammas, created by created chickens. by an umbrella scientist that was for some reason demoted to work inside of the sewers of Raccoon City away from the nest for some reason. 
and because he really loved his hunter gammas and eventually he was like oh boy i really love my hunter gammas that i'm developing inside of the sewers i really hope that they <laughs> that they don't escape they seem to really like the taste of human flesh i mean they wouldn't hurt me because you know like i'm their father so like they they wouldn't kill me my hunter gammas are like my babies i love them turn to page two they escaped <laughs> They escaped! They're eating people! May God save our souls! <laughs> what gets me about that note, too, is that he specifically says, So what if you're weak on the inside of your mouth to fire? Haven't you heard of character flaws? <laughs> and it's like, that is the most on-the-nose way of describing an enemy weakness. But yeah, um, to give you guys an idea, chat, of what, what Phil's talk about, the Hunter Gammas actually are monsters in the original Resident Evil 3 as well. However, they are what they are described as. They are the hunter monsters from Resident Evil 1, but they're a unique variation of them where instead of being lizard-like, they're more frog-like. In the Resident Evil 3 remake, because Capcom is lazy, they decided instead of making the Gravedigger a unique monster and the Hunter Gamma a unique monster, they combined the two into a single monster. So you have these giant chicken Hunter Gammas that open their mouths and they have a Gravedigger mouth. And they and I, are in one sewer system that takes 20 minutes to get through, and then you never see them again. Because that game sucks. It um, sucks so much that it even ruins Brad's death here. Mm -hmm. Because of yeah, the original, you go. And yeah, the, the entire point, the entire point of Brad's death is to instill an intense fear into the player of what the nemesis is. Because the entire point of Brad's death is that Brad was the only other member of stars in the city. And Brad specifically tells you before he dies, there is something hunting stars members. This cutscene not only introduces us to the nemesis and shows us how it kills, it is literally the game telling the player, you're the only one left he wants to kill. So good. So, in that moment, you're not only introduced to this monster that you've never seen before, but you were directly told that it is now after you and you exclusively. In the remake, Brad dies off screen to a bunch of zombies. It's so pathetic. That's that's it. That's 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 how Brad dies. He he closes it. He, he barricades a door with a bunch of zombies, and then you leave, and you never see him die. He it, gets it, infected it by a zombie, and then eventually he shows up as a zombie, and that's it. It's okay. so fucking the, lame! The only cool thing about Brad's death in the remake is that he ends up becoming the zombie that infects Marvin. Yep. But, but like, that they could, could have, done have that. been done. <laughs> that could have been done by having this cutscene because it is established in Resident Evil 3 that Nemesis's tentacle is capable of spreading the T virus whenever it pierces skin. It functions yep. like a zombie bite. So you could have easily said that him killing Brad with the tentacle could have made him a zombie, but n no, no. It, Good writing is hard to come by these days, I guess. Fucking Even whatever. It's literally right there, but uh, whatever, whatever. I don't care that much. It's, it's, I don't care that much. I wouldn't make a movie length video about how much it sucks. <laughs> um, Go watch that also, video, by the way. It's fucking godly. Doesn't Brad <laughs> show up in the original Resident Evil 2? I'm not sure. About Brad that. Like does not secret. show up in the. Oh my god, yeah, you're totally right. Fuck. You're so yeah. fucking right. Uh, in Isn't the original like Resident Easter egg? In the original Resident Evil 2, if you went into the if you went through the intro section of the game, which is essentially you running through the city trying to get to the police station, if you get if you manage to get to the police station in under a minute without shooting any zombies, you'll be able to find a special infected wearing a yellow vest underneath the bridge leading towards the police station. Like, mm -hmm. it is a very iconic yellow vest that Brad Vickers was wearing. Then in the Resident Evil 2 remake, they continue that Easter egg by having the B section with either Leon or Claire having like a poster of Brad underneath that same bridge with like Brad giving you a thumbs up and going like join the join the Raccoon City Police Department. We help people. Yay. <laughs> we yeah. help people. So that's like great. Uh, alternative donates 7 Canadian dollars and says Qu question. If rats are the cause of the T-virus out outbreak, would they have become giant rats as well? I want my giant rats Capcom. There's not a single giant rat in any of the games. Yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, because the rats are super resilient to the T-virus. I fucking guess. 
Anyways. Like so yeah, um, uh, where was I? There's also I, the I fact that the original Resident Evil 3 Nemesis had like, didn't have a, didn't have like a two scenarios, like there was only one playable character. Technically 1.5 because of Carlos, you play as Carlos as also in the game. But there's also like different choices that you can make, which are really cool. That was, that was a big factor of Resident Evil 3 and part of the reason I liked it so much. You can see at the top there, there's the option of fight with the monster or enter the police station. Um, anytime Nemesis would appear in Resident Evil 3, those scenarios would basically pop up where you were on, like, he's quickly given the option of choosing one of two options on how to get out of a situation. And usually, the way the two options worked was that one was riskier, but gave you great rewards. The other was safer, but you got nothing. So like, for example, fight with the monster or enter the police station. Fighting with Nemesis, every single time you beat Nemesis in the original RE3, he would drop an item, usually some kind of major upgrade. However, fighting Nemesis is really, 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 really hard. Yep. <laughs> Cause tank controls with a friggin' tyrant that sprints you don't is a nightmare. You don't understand, Chad. Like, we, we cannot show you, like, I did not prepare gameplay for this section. This motherfucker runs at you in a tank-controlled base survival horror game. He was so fucking scary. <laughs> he was terrifying. So you were given the option of either, yeah, I don't want to fuck with that, run to the police station, or yeah, I'm going to fight it to potentially get rewards that'll help me later. And that was something that was really cool about that game. I really liked it. It's not in the remake. Um, so yeah, continuing though. Um, I'm going to so go yeah. to the bathroom. Uh, you tell about the end of the game. I'll be right back. Sure. Sounds good. So um, basically, yeah, it turns out that the U.S. government was intent on nuking Raccoon City after the outbreak happened. And now after Carlos is able to get a vaccine to cure Jill of the T-virus, the two of them are essentially fighting against the clock to escape the entire city before it, it, it entirely explodes. And also they're trying to friggin' stop Nikolai who is still running around killing people while collecting combat data on her and the nemesis. And what ends up happening is this leads her into the ending location of RE3 which is this which is this place called the Dead Factory. Basically, RE2 had Nest, which was the main lab that Umbrella operated within. The Dead Factory was another lab that they ended up abandoning where Umbrella did their own did their own research in secret. It was essentially just a secondary lab for stuff that didn't involve Nest. And it's in the Dead Factory where we actually get to learn the origin of Nemesis and why he's so special compared to other tyrants. Because, like I said before, Nemesis is like a really special tyrant. Unlike the other tyrants who didn't have the brain capacity to be able to wield weapons and even like speak in the limited way that Nemesis does. Um, you know, they, they, like the other tyrants couldn't wield weapons, but Nemesis was intelligent enough to hunt down specified targets, wield rocket launchers and flamethrowers, and even when you fight him, he's incredibly intelligent with the way he fights the player. The way that Umbrella was able to create the Nemesis was that they took one of the Mr. X tyrants that they already had, and they slowly but surely bioengineered a unique parasite called the Nemesis Alpha. Now this parasite on its own was this pathetic little creature that didn't really have anything it could do to defend itself. However, the Nemesis Alpha Parasite was incredibly intelligent. So what they did was they would take these Mr. X Tyrants and they would surgically remove their brains and replace them with this Nemesis Alpha Parasite and it would essentially live inside their skull and act as the brain. Um, usually this operation would kill the Tyrants However, one ended up succeeding, and that one successful tyrant was the nemesis. So, and to put this into perspective too, on what it would have taken to create the one nemesis, for one tyrant to have been made, it was estimated, I believe in one of the games, that thousands of people, thousands of T-virus exposed subjects had to die first. So of like, uh, let's say of a thousand subjects that died, you'd get one tyrant. 
And now imagine working through friggin' like a hundred tyrants who would die from this parasite to get the one nemesis back. back. Yo, what's up? I'm talking about how friggin' crazy the statistics are for Nemesis even being made. He's like a like, shiny Pokemon. Yeah, because like I was talking about how like <laughs> of for people. a single tyrant, for a single tyrant, you have to like kill like a thousand subjects to get the one successful tyrant. And then for the one successful tyrant to then be made into a Nemesis, because the parasite usually ended up killing its hosts, you'd need to friggin' like kill a hundred tyrants. Higher. So Nemesis was like, Literally, they're one in a hundred. Higher bite says shiny tyrant. Yeah, basically, he's even yellow. Man, Nemesis yeah, so is Nem so goddamn cool. Nemesis was the greatest thing that Umbrella ever created. Um, and that was why they sent it after the stars units. Because after they created this thing that was actually built for warfare, the one thing they needed to be able to actually sell these things to the military was their ability to wield weapons. They had to test run it. And that's why it was sent after the stars unit because Umbrella needed to prove that their friggin' perfect tyrant actually fucking worked. And it didn't. Um, <laughs> it did not. <laughs> but he was still very cool though. He's really cool though. Um, and that's the other thing. The tentacle that bursts out of Nemesis's body, that is the parasite, which is desperately trying to defend its host at all costs because you know, without, without the body to protect it, Nemesis is just this pathetic, like, it's just this pathetic little parasite that rides around on the ground. Um, but what ends up happening is that Nemesis follows Jill into the dead factory. He ends up following her into this fucked up room where Umbrella would dump all the corpses of subjects that died in their experiments to be fucking, like, burnt away by acid. Um, and Jill ends up using the friggin' valves to spray acid all over Nemesis, which corrodes his body and melts him. Um, so she ends up trying to leave the facility because there was a rescue helicopter that was on the way to the dead factory. But what ends up happening is that Nemesis, um, his friggin' melted, corroded body ends up being sent down this garbage chute into this area that Jill was running through to survive. And the parasite, desperate to survive, freaking breaks open a vat that contained a bunch of dead Mr. X tyrants, and it starts cannibalizing a bunch of other tyrants in a last-ditch effort to save itself, which leads to Nemesis mutating into this gigantic, like, blob-like form that we see in the final boss fight. Which, by the way, that's a detail that was also left out in the remake, is that in order to mutate, Nemesis literally cannibalizes other tyrants. Uh, yeah, which was he doesn't... one of my favorite things about him. The, the reason for why he's so fucked up in this last section here is that he ate every single one of his fucking... Uh, the, the, the lower copies of himself. So he turned into yeah, that. Exactly. So yeah, you see, like, what's left of him is freaking eating what's left of a Mr. X tyrant. And you can see after doing so, he, his body just starts to mutate rapidly. In the in Resident Evil 3 remake, he just does that for some reason. Yeah, he just does yeah. it. In Resident Evil 3 Remake, he mutates just because he can. Like, there, there's no reason for it. There's nothing. I so, love this yeah. design, even though it's, like, technically smaller than G5. It's still, like, super fucked up. Look, look at those, all those eyes, that exposed brain, the rib cage turning into spikes coming out the back, the tentacles. It's, like, a mess. See, that's the thing I love about this final boss, is that, like... By this point in the story, Nemesis was like the most Nemesis was the most competent monster we ever face, but throughout Resident Evil 3, as we fight him, unlike unlike William Birkin, who every single form is stronger, Nemesis progressively gets weaker as the game goes. Like Look at that we, we our, our, spit. Yeah, exactly. The first encounter we have with Nemesis in Resident Evil 3 remake is when he's at his strongest, and with each encounter he has with Jill, he is weakened and weakened until this final boss where he is just this pathetic shambling mound that is desperately trying to complete the one mission it was given by Umbrella, but it physically can't anymore. And I just find that so incredibly fascinating. But yeah, there's this friggin' giant ass anime laser beam. <laughs> this Death Star laser that Umbrella just happened to create that is able to like blow up the fucking moon or whatever. And Jill is able to finally kill Nemesis by literally having him shamble in front of it because at this point he's just mindless. 
And then we get the freaking best line she ever says in the series. Here we go. I, I... <gasps> that bitch. What I love the most about this is that you can choose to do this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exterminate the monster or ignore it. Yeah! Can I just say too, I once, uh, when I was doing research for my video I did about Nemesis, I did a playthrough of this game where anytime I was given the option to fight Nemesis, I fought him so that I could, you know, showcase the choice system in action. He put me through so much <laughs> hell that when I got the opportunity to do that, it felt so good. Instantly locked in. <laughs> Like, literally, there was no, there was no question. I was shooting the shit out of that motherfucker. I don't know who the <laughs> like, fuck would, like, the, like, he still dies because, you know, the city fucking blows up at the end. But, like, you get the choice to kill him with your own bare fucking hands. That's the most satisfying shit ever. Which, uh, by the way, chat, that, that, that badass line Jill says, you want stars, I'll give you stars. You want to guess where it shows up in the remake? <sighs> You want to guess where it gets used? Because I guarantee you, it's not cool. <laughs> hey, you want me to show them? Show them. Show them where it gets used in the remake. Mm. Let's see if, there, if there's even like a fucking... If there's even a... Nope, nope. The moment's just in a random playthrough because the moment doesn't actually matter. Okay, so mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's just I'm, a I'm random just, line. Yeah, I'm just get I'm just getting Oh no, there we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. Oh, it even has a comparison. Oh my god, this is so fucking embarrassing. Okay. Here's a comparison shot for the remake and the old game. So this is where Jill says the line. You want stars? I'll give you stars. And in the remake, it's Jill running down a fucking hallway away from Nemesis. Come on, you creepy ass stalker. You want stars? I'll give you stars. And she's running. This chase sequence <laughs> lasts for the chase sequence that she says that line in lasts Come for a whole you... 30 seconds, and it doesn't end with her, you know, killing Nemesis or even damaging him enough to transform. No, she runs away through a grate and ends up in the sewers. And not only that, it's usually it happens a lot in playthroughs that people often get hit before she even gets to say the line. Yep. Yeah. She'll go, you want stars? I'll give you- Ow! <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, I think we've, uh, even though we were intending to just talk about the Resident Evil original three nemesis, I think it shows the fucking contempt we have for the remake very clearly. Uh, there's a so, some people questioned a uh, why the Resident Evil 3 remake came out the way it did. Just for the people here that are interested, the reason for why the Resident Evil 3 remake came out to be such a fucking piece of shit is because it was being developed at the same time as Resident Evil 2 by Capcom's B team mm -hmm. without the supervision of their creative directors. So they just basically got told, yeah, you just take the assets from Resident Evil 2 and just make a new game out of it and, like, you know, follow the story of the original if you want to. And they came up with a bunch of ideas, they had a tight deadline, and not much budget, so that's what they came up with. Just... Mm -hmm. I just... Which is, uh... which is so unfortunate because there are ideas they came up with for the remake that I genuinely like. Like, 
I think the remake's version of Carlos, I, I think, is a more likable character than the original. They also introduced the idea that Nemesis could use his parasite to implant T-Virus zombies with their own unique parasite that made them stronger. I like that. So he, when he was in an area, he could go around and buff zombies. That's cool as shit. The, sucks that everything else was so trash. It's so clear that you can see in the game that all the effort and time got put into the first few hours of the remake. And then after you leave the first city area, they just got told by Capcom management that they just had to wrap it up. So yeah, because like... They had to cut entire areas of the remake off to make time to be able to release it on time. Well, yeah, because like... That's the thing. When you first play the Resident Evil 3 remake, you convince yourself it's a good game. <laughs> because like, whenever whenever you first get chased by Nemesis and you see him run for the first time, it's fucking terrifying. He's actually like, roaming around in like an open area of the city. It's actually kind of fucking scary and... Nope. And the thing is too, the thing is too, like I, I feel like I've brought this up so many times, but I'm bringing it up again because it's the Resident Evil stream. I, at one point, was curious and actually wanted to test how his AI works when he is given the opportunity to roam in the city. And his AI is without a doubt the best roaming AI I have seen for any Resident Evil like stalker enemy. Because like the roaming AI for Nemesis in the remake, he is smart enough not only to chase you in the style Mr. X does, but he also knows the different points in the map that you would try to escape from. And he's able to grapple to them using his tentacle to cut you off. It's legitimately really good, but that's the only time that it shows up. And if you know where to go in that section, he literally shows up for only five minutes, maybe yeah. even less. The only way I was able to learn about all the things Nemesis could do was when I sat down and forced myself to stay in the area where he is designed to roam around and essentially just wait for him to do the cool shit. Yep. Every other time I played through the game, I could just leave and he didn't chase me. It was, it was awful. That game's terrible. But, um, yeah. Anyway, continuing. Um, after, after all that shit with a nemesis, um, you were also given the option of fighting and killing Nikolai or letting him go. Um, and Nikolai escapes on his own helicopter and you're given the option of either trying to shoot down the helicopter as Jill with the chance of him still getting away or just letting him go. Um, I'm pretty sure the canon they are going with is that Nikolai does die in Resident Evil 3. Um, however, I'm still unsure because he never gets brought up after Resident Evil 3, so there's no way of knowing if he actually died or not. I mean, either way, um, either way, he's functionally dead for the series. Yeah, and not much is lost because Nikolai was just essentially a more boring version of Wesker. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, for the ending of the game as well, oh, you can see Ra Raccoon City getting blown the hell up. If mm -hmm. you do the game a second time and you choose very specific choices in the game, guess who rescues you at the end? <laughs> Thanks, you saved us. I couldn't let you die. Is, is it you? Yeah! Are you ready to finish this? Barry! 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 It's coming! Yeah, <laughs> you you know that it's Barry because he says yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, I love Barry. Yeah. Raccoon is gone. Yeah, that the, the 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 biggest most important part of Resident Evil Three. Yeah, Raccoon City at this point is canonically wiped off the map. <laughs> Very big explosion. Together to go fight Umbrella, and Umbrellas. Carlos is never seen in the series again. Umbrella's going down. Okay, whatever. But <laughs> it's so fucking funny too because uh, just think about this for a second. The whole idea with Resident Evil endings is that at the like at the end of the game. Every single location that you explored gets blown up at the end. Like, mm -hmm. in Resident Evil 1, you explore the Spencer Mansion and the laboratory underneath it. Guess what? Wesker sets off the 
fucking self-destruct sequence of the laboratory, destroying everything in the Spencer Mansion. That's pretty cool, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Resident Evil 2 happens. Leon and Claire find out the secret umbrella laboratory underneath, like, a Raccoon City, and they go like, hmm. This is pretty, this is pretty fucking, this is a huge laboratory area that's like literally miles long. How the hell is this game gonna end? Oh, Ada sets off the self-destruct sequence of like the Nest Lab as Leon and Claire get away, which means that the entirety of that part of Raccoon City gets completely blown off, blown away. So that's fucking cool. And then Resident Evil 3 shows up and goes, so we want to set our game in a city. Like not, not the Raccoon City Police Department, not the sewers, not the nest. Our game is going to take place throughout the entirety of Raccoon City that you can explore around. There's going to be the hospital, there's going to be the marshalling yard, the dead factory, the streets, the parks, everywhere, the clock tower, everywhere in that, you're going to be able to go everywhere in that city. And as per tradition, they said, what do we do to end the game? <laughs> <laughs> Let's blow up an entire city! You know, my respect to Capcom for doubling down on the rules of this game series, even when it means nuking an entire fucking city. We set our game inside of an entire city, and obviously the entire city doesn't have a fucking self-destruct sequence. So we're just gonna blow- we're gonna nuke Raccoon City off the map. Holy shit! What a way to end the trilogy. Yep. God, that's fucking hilarious, though. And obviously, Which, um, both both the second game and the third game end with one of the main characters going, "I can't believe that Umbrella has done this. We have to take them down." And then nothing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that they followed through with that. <sighs> I'm really so, happy that storyline really, really came to fruition. Okay, well, I think we'll generally have to end it off like at Resident Evil Four, because <laughs> like. Yeah, I, I I think you're right. I guess like, right. we have to do Maybe. we have to do Survivor, which it'll take like ten minutes. We have to do Resident Evil Code Veronica X, and then we will have to do Resident Evil Four, cause like, and dude, dude, <laughs> so and dude, 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 I'm being real with you. Yeah, we are gonna be at four for so long. Oh, this four is so uh, fucking good. <laughs> yeah, there is so much to talk about with four. I I I don't think we'll be able to make it past four. Yep. So, no, absolutely not. So we have to end it off at four. So we don't worry. We're still at like ha halfway through the fucking stream. We are going to go through Resident Evil Survivor, Resident Evil Code Veronica, and Resident Evil 4 next. Fine by me. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me just clear off Survivor like right away. So. After the events of Resident Evil 3, 2, and 1, the entirety of Raccoon City is wiped off the face of the Earth. Uh, Raccoon City in the original game was like a fucking small Midwestern town that had like a few thousand people in it. Uh, eventually, as the sequels continued, the size and scale of the Raccoon City incident became larger and larger and larger to the point that when the remakes come out, Raccoon City is now like a metropolis, like what's like a metropolis, like a super mega metropolitan area. Like with a hundreds of thousands of people, maybe even like a million people. And the US government just decides, fuck this city, it's dead, we're gonna kill everyone and just fucking launch us a nuke into the city. Like, you don't understand, like this shit is like a million 9-11s in the like Resident Evil universe. This was a crazy incident that changed the face of the entire world. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Umbrella didn't want to face the consequences of what they did in Raccoon City and were working with the US government, which means that they tried as hard as possible to get away from the incident and just blame the government for a weird viral infection that uh, killed everyone in the city and they had to quarantine it and destroy it because it was so fucking evil that they had to wipe it off the face of the earth. They, they didn't want to face responsibility at all. In come 
Resident Evil Survivor, which is Hold an. On. I'll be right back. Okay. Keep which going. is a sp experimental spin-off uh, series to the main Resident Evil uh, games, starring some motherfucker whose name I forget. I think it was called like Mike or like Ike or like some. It was some that guy in the green trench coat. That's the that's the protagonist. Uh, this game is supposed to be like a light gun shooter, kind of like first person shooter type of thing, mm -hmm. and it takes place in Sheena Island, a month after the Raccoon City incident. Uh, this protagonist is. John Re Yeah, I'm gonna call him John Resident. Good good job, Noise. John Resident. John Resident is a friend of Leon. He is a detective that like like a like a like a PI, like a personal investigator, that gets contacted by Leon after the events of Resident Evil 2. And he essentially asks him, pretty please go investigate Sheena Island, which is the actual place where they mass produce the tyrants that rest that umbrella used in Resident Evil 2. You can see the vat oh. over here on the top right. Uh, Sheena cool. Island is like um, an isolated community that is essentially controlled by umbrella and its major general, this motherfucker here that I also forgot the name of. Uh, it is it, it, there's a bunch of like a story here where like the the the, the main guy gets amnesia for some reason, and he thinks that he's the bad guy, but turns out he's just, like, a friend of Leon that infiltrated the island and shit, shit like that. But the main story of this is essentially you, after the Raccoon City incident, infiltrate an island controlled by Umbrella, find out where the tyrants are being made, and of course you blow that fucker up. Obviously. You just absolutely destroy this island, which means that after the events of Resident Evil 2 and and Survivor, Umbrella can't use Tyrants anymore. They are being like, they, they are slowly being taken down by the... Hey, Wildcard. It's Nagasaki in this. Thank you, Wildcard, for the $5. Uh, essentially, it, the, the 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 survivors are kind of moving against, starting to move against Umbrella, going to their facilities and blowing them up or like destroying them, or essentially just taking justice for what happened in Raccoon City. In come, hold on, Resident Evil Code Veronica. There we go. In come Resident Evil Code Veronica X. Zach, I gotta ask <laughs> you, how familiar are you with this game? Okay. Do you want to know my exposure to Code Veronica? Sure. I watched every Wesker cutscene, that's it. Ah, oh, cool. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the main story and then Zach can tell you about what the fuck Wesker was up to with that, with that game. I think that'll be fair enough. Yeah, that sounds that sounds good to me. So, after the events of Resident Evil 2, not only Leon contacts one of the private investigators to go explore an island, but also Claire, still in the search for her missing brother, goes off to the place that the letter described by Chris uh, mentioned that he was going to, Claire essentially infiltrated a umbrella facility in Europe. That facility, she was... I don't know what she was trying to do, honestly, there. She was kind of running around in buildings or something. She got caught by the umbrella military force and got captured and was sent to the Rockford Prison Island to be essentially tortured and experimented on by a branch of umbrella leaded by the Ashford twins which are a bunch of creepy little children that are the grand sons of Edward... Hello, hello. hello. Uh, of Edward Ashford, which is one of the founders of Umbrella. Inside of that prison, while Claire is there, Umbrella is being attacked by the rival company! <laughs> by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by, an, by an umbre... by the rivals of Umbrella and the fucking... B.O.W. Uh, market. 
therefore the T-Virus ends up being spreaded all across Rockford Island while Claire is there. So eventually one of the captors that was keeping Claire inside of the prison cell uh, frees her because like, oh, what the fuck? Everyone's gonna die in the island anyway. So like, who gives a shit? And she ends up going through this like military prison island that also has like a fucking castle for the Ashford twins to like screw around in, literally. And then she finds Steve Burnside, one of the most anime-ass fucking protagonists in the series, and that's saying a lot. He's literally just like a Canadian, like, like super edgy boy emo guy. With like... With like two fucking golden pistols? That he loves to like present and like go like, Oh look, Claire, these are so fucking cool. Uh, Jill and Steve join forces to be able to escape the island. Uh, they eventually find the Ashford twins in the castle. Uh, one of them is... I forgot the fucking names of these guys. But, like, the, the guy one confronts them as, like, a military guy with a rifle. And the other one is a lady in a dress called Alexia. Yeah, Alexia Ashford. And they go and do their Resident Evil adventures inside of that mansion. And eventually find a way to escape that by hijacking a plane that was going out of the island. These are all the cutscenes of the fucking video game. I will just show you the- how the- I will just show you how the fucking Code Veronica game starts. Alfred and Alexia, there we go, thank you. The American Midwestern town, Raccoon City, has been completely decimated due to the T-Virus outbreak that was instigated by the international corporation Umbrella. Umbrella? Claire Redfield, who arrived in Raccoon City to search for her lost brother Chris and a rookie police officer, Leon S. Kennedy, managed to escape from the city. But their ordeal was only a prelude of things to come. Three, Three months, months later. This is actually one of the coolest goddamn cutscenes in the entirety of Resident Evil history. Yep. Your identification number is WKD4496. <sighs> Welcome to your new home. Her name is Claire Redfield. We caught her trespassing in our Paris Lab facility ten days ago. She apparently infiltrated the complex looking for her lost brother, Chris Redfield, one of the surviving members of RPD's famous STARS teams. So goddamn cool. I love this actually. Cool. It's so unnecessarily cool. Oh my God. Don't move. Evil Marvin. <laughs> Umbrella Marvin. Marvel. <laughs>
<laughs> Melvin. I don't even know what this guy- I don't even know if this guy has a name. Prison's been taken over. Troops have been wiped out. What are you saying? You're free to leave the complex. But you may as well know you have no chance of getting off this island. And what about you? What are you going to do? Don't worry about me. So, yeah, just like Marvin, he dies. Mm hmm. So oh, that's, you weren't kidding. Yep, that's the start of Resident Evil Code Veronica. In my personal opinion, this game is both... One of the most unique and coolest games in the franchise, but also one of the shittiest. It's like... Capcom really tried to make, like, one of the biggest survival horror games out there, right? Mm -hmm. But because... They wanted to make the biggest one. Oh yeah, those are like corpses coming out of the graveyard, even though like the T-Virus doesn't actually do that. Don't worry about that. This game is fucking stupid. Uh, this game establishes both the Ashford side of the Umbrella Corporation and also a new different strain of the virus. This one is called the T-Veronica virus. That's why the game is called Code <laughs> Veronica. The X yep. is because a fucking new version of the game came out for the PS2 that expanded the story and also added some Wesker cutscenes that uh, Zachary likes. Mm -hmm. The main story mm -hmm. of the game, though, is uh, Claire going around this prison, trying to escape, finding Steve Burnside, that motherfucker over there. He goes around this prison, finds the fucking, how you call it, the Ashford Mansion. I need to find a very specific cutscene that I want to talk about. But... There we go. These Ashford twins are essentially the main villains of the game. They are heading this branch of Umbrella and they are psychopaths. Like, from the beginning. You know those creepy children from, like, Japanese horror movies? Mm-hmm. And they're also like, they love each other Ooh. like a lot. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are not good people and they're psychopaths and they love each other a lot. Implied incest. incest. Yeah, exactly. Anyways, through yeah. the game you find Alfred. And eventually you manage to escape with Steve after going through a bunch of trials and tribulations, and you manage to end up in fucking Ar Antarctica for some reason. Like, Steve and Claire escape uh, Rockford Island through a plane that had, like a, like, a specific, like, autopilot coordinate system that lands them in the middle of Antarctica in, an in another umbrella base. Which is very fucking cool. Uh, in the middle of that, there's also something very stupid that I, I really hope I can find this. I don't think this in- I don't think it's in this video. Okay, it might be in there. Okay, so, uh, Zach. Mm -hmm. You know how, uh, like, Claire's entire motive in Resident Evil 2 and in this game is about trying to find her brother? Chris? Yeah. You know how yeah, yeah, she yeah, yeah, went yeah. all around the world trying to find Chris because she couldn't get his location? Yeah. Yep. So once she finds herself in Rockford Island, and once she desperately needs help from the outside world, this is what fucking Claire says. What are you doing here? Chris Redfield. Is he a relative of yours or something? You mean my brother? Ah. Your siblings. 
Well, it seems your brother is under surveillance by Umbrella. What? I've got to contact Leon and tell him to let my brother know he's being monitored. Mm -hmm. Did you not fucking get that? Huh? It's a good thing huh? I have access to an outside connection from here. Well, that file shows the latitude what? and longitude of this place. <laughs> Why don't you send your Wait, brother what? the coordinates and ask him to come help? Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> hey. Wait! <laughs> Wait, I, I don't get it. So Veronica remake was a missed opportunity. Instead, we got Residents of Evil the what? third remake. He could get here, even if he is your brother. Kidding. There's no way he could get here, even if he is your brother. Yes, he can. I'm sure of it. No way. He won't come. You'll just end up disappointed if you rely on others. All right, Steve. Me. Okay. Oh my God, Steve, shut up. Bye bye. Yeah. I've only known Steve for a couple minutes. I hate him. So, uh, Claire, Claire goes all around the world trying to find her missing brother, and the moment that she gets captured by Umbrella and gets taken prisoner into Rockford Island, where she is going to be experimented on, and blah 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 blah, she manages. To find a fucking comms to the outside world, and Steve tells her, Oh, uh, your brother, Chris Redfield, is being monitored by Umbrella. <laughs> and yep. the first thing that Claire does upon finding this information is, Hmm, I didn't know that. I'm gonna call Leon and tell him to tell Chris that oh. he's being monitored. <laughs> oh, if oh Leon my knew. <laughs> And why didn't he tell her? <laughs> and then not only that, but also, hey, so I have the coordinates of this island. I will just call Chris because he's not busy at the moment and tell him to come pick me up. Okay. <laughs> so your yeah, entire okay. fucking search that got you captured in the first place into this island. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just... What's your sketch? <laughs> I, I love that someone in chat just said, Leon, you didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> you could do that all this time? I really love the idea that the entire plot of RE2 in this game happened, and Leon was just like, it was just like, you know where my brother was? You didn't ask where your brother was. Apparently, Leon and Chris just know each other. Yeah. They're just homies. They're just homies. They're just keeping contact a lot. Even though they've never interacted once Fuck you, outside what? of freaking Resident <laughs> Evil 6. And not only that, but the way that the two brothers, Chris and Claire Redfield, finally get reunited in the Resident Evil series is not by Claire finally finding her brother after searching for him all this time. It's by Claire telling Leon to go call Chris and then Chris comes pick her up at Rockford Island. Oh. So it goes from Claire trying to find Chris to Chris finding Claire. Yeah, because, like, Chris wasn't really doing anything at that time, so he just went to Rockford Island to come pick her up. He could have done that at any time. Thank you. <laughs> That's so he fucking... Died Rodrigo, and he actually died way later in the game in the fight. Nothing you're wondering, Rock. My I didn't know God. that. Thank you. So, yeah, I was playing this when I was a child back in the PS2 days, so, like, I... The de some of the details of this game are kind of fuzzy. There's also this, like, little weird fucking guy that is, like... I think it's called a Bandersnatch. That is, like, a experiment in Rockford Island. That's, like, a weird yellow guy that has, like, oh, an extendo weird. arm. He's very cool and very Ooh, annoying to whoa. fight against. He's very what? annoying to fight against. I like that thing, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, it's really cool. Uh, those are the things that the prisoners are being turned into in Rockford Island. It's very cool. Oh. Yeah, that obviously Pretty because cool. Umbrella, it's owned by Umbrella, so like the prison facility obviously also has to be another research research facility where like a crazy guy makes monsters. Because of course, of course, they would yeah. never waste space in just making a yellow? prison. I don't know. That was a cool cutscene. Cool, very cool <laughs> cutscene. Thank you, Steve, <laughs> for jumping out the window. Leon would later copy that for Resident Evil Four. He doesn't even look at him. So yeah, uh, Steve and it's Claire. So cool. Decide to fucking leave this place. 
after like uh, after going through the castle and shed. Also, Wesker appears here. Hold on. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show off this cutscene because like Wesker appears and Wesker is very cool. You might need it later on. Now go. Thank you, Rodrigo. Don't worry about me. Ugh. <laughs> Greetings. You must be the lovely Claire Redfield. Who are you? Let's just say that I'm a ghost, coming back to haunt your dear brother. Wesker? Oh! It seems there's not much explaining to do, is there? I was the one who attacked this island. Who'd have thought you'd be hanging about? <laughs> All the better for me. Now that it's <laughs> fucking love that. <laughs> <That's so scary. laughs> Cat dragged in this. I'm nice scared of a man who could laugh while frowning. So caring brother can definitely show up. I must thank you for being such good bait. I love that in this current game, Wesker is currently working for the rival company that he was betraying Umbrella for, which will become very funny later. I don't know what went mm -hmm. on between you two, but you have them all wrong. My brother is not the kind of person you think he is. I despise Chris. Uh, what are you gonna do to him? Uh. Oh. <laughs> he I'm made me slap. <laughs> he made fun of my tyrants. I despise him. The fact that he bitch slaps her so hard, she flies horizontally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that whenever Wesker is doing something, he's not there for like any like he's not he doesn't want to kill Claire because like he hates her or anything. It's very specifically to think, oh this will fuck Chris up. I fucking hate Chris. Oh fucking I don't give a shit. Oh Chris, 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 Chris. And, and later on in the story, we were not we are not gonna get here by this stream, but later on he kidnaps Jill spit and then brainwashes her and then dyes her hair blonde specifically to fuck with Chris because he thought he thought that kidnapping Jill and brainwashing her would make Chris mad <laughs> every action that Wesker does after the after the uh Spencer mansion incident is just to fuck with Chris <laughs> he made fun of all the tires to make his life a living hell stay there I'm coming <laughs> oh my god <laughs> It appears you may be of some further use to me. I'm going to let you live a little longer. Ah! <laughs> how is it that he manages to? Be, how is it that he manages to be both the cheesiest and coolest character ever? Because he's like, I think that after the Resident Evil, after Resident Evil One, like the developers. At Capcom, just watched the Matrix and thought, "Yes, we're gonna yes. We're, we're gonna dress him up in all black, and he's gonna have glowing red eyes, and he's gonna be super cool." It's like he he turned into like the biggest villain ever, even though like in the Resident Evil one, he's just like a corrupt cop. And I just I love that so much. Yep. All right, so we're gonna move on from there. Blah 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 blah. blah. Eventually. Claire and uh, fucking Steve find a, a pilot aircraft thing and they ride it off away from Rockford Island. And you would think that this is the point where the game would end. But no, actually, this game is like thrice as long as any other Resident Evil game in existence. And this is actually only the first third of the game. The rest of the game takes place in Antarctica for some fucking reason. Uh, Alfred Ashford releases a new experimental tyrant that was made on the island. This fucking guy. You kill him, you fucking push him... You push him off the goddamn, like, plane. Hold on. What the, what the fuck is Steve saying? Hold on. Claire. <laughs> I hear Hawaii is nice this time of year. Shut the fuck you up. You got it. <laughs> oh my god, his voice. 
All right. So they go fly off not to Hawaii, but Antarctica, where coincidentally, coincidentally, hold on, I'm trying to find the Antarctica moment. There we go. Coincidentally, uh, Alfred's sister what is being held. Turns out, plot twist, Alfred is a crazy motherfucker and has been actually cross-dressing as Alexia Ashford throughout the entirety of the first half of the game. Oh. Alfred really loves his sister. And 10 years ago, before the events of the game, Alexia was injected with an experimental T. Veronica virus that lays dormant within her system, and then she's get she gets taken to Antarctica, and then gets frozen in a test tube to, like, lie dormant for 10 years. Also, their father, I don't know why, honestly, gets turned into this thing. He's very cool, he's, like, the mid-boss of the game. I think he's called the Nosferatu? That is oh. Alexia and Alfred's dad. I think he got, like, tortured because he was, like, suspected of treason by the Umbrella com Company or something like that. I'm not really sure. He's a really cool boss, except he's also extremely fucking annoying because he has, like, a ranged attack that takes out, like, almost a fourth of your health bar, and you need to, like, fight him in, like, a weird arena that, like, is filled with, like, Missed. It's very cool, but at the same time, very annoying. Much like the rest <laughs> of the game. Steve. Yeah, bye bye, Steve. <laughs> Steve is just like the highlight of this game. He's very annoying, but you end up like liking him by the end anyway. Anyway, so you defeat this fucking thing, and then Alfred, in a last ditch attempt to uh, get revenge uh, from you I'll being alive. Shut up, Steve. From being alive. Alfred just decides, you know what? I am going to resurrect my sister. Eh. My sis. What a weirdo. Woman! Yeah, so, like, Alexia is, like, super extremely powerful. The T. Veronica virus is a very special strain of the T. virus that needs time to incubate within a host, specifically 10 years, to be able to gain control. You know how the T. virus is usually, like, just turns you into a mindly, mindless monster? Yeah. So, the T. Veronica virus is, like, a more refined version of the T. virus that needs about a 10-year incubation period within a host, and once that time period is over, they will be able to essentially keep the entirety of their faculties while also gaining extremely anime superpowers, such as being able to control random tentacles coming out of the Earth, and being able to float, and turning into like a giant plant lady that also controls fire for some reason. It's just, I don't know why this virus is like, Super anime. So you basically get to just become crazy OP with none of the drawbacks. You become like God, yes. For, and for only ten years. You you need to like waiting. freeze yourself for ten years, yes. Also, uh, Alexia is obsessed with the opera. <laughs> she she was obsessed with clothes. She should put some clothes on. Yeah. No, she just makes yeah. clothes out of her fucking virus. 
She makes virus clothes. Just, that's sick. Okay. Oh, anyway, okay. anyways, in the meantime, in back in Rockford Island, Chris Redfield comes to Claire's rescue. Following up on a lead given. Leon to called. Him, yes. <laughs> He literally climbs out from the side of the mountain. Where were you, Chris? He was on his way there. Like, what was he doing before that? Fucking around, I guess. <sighs> He's still wearing his stars music. uniform. Yeah, why? Because he's very sentimental. Oh, I just, I love the triumphant music as Chris finally decides to fucking do something and go see his sister again. And he arrives in Rockford Island after Claire Lee left with Steve. It's so fucking funny because Chris just arrives on Rockford to find Claire. Hold on. Who are you? I came here looking for a certain girl. <laughs> a girl? Have you seen anyone named Claire Redfield? Did you just say Claire? Red I know who she is. Funny story. Don't, Don't worry about her. I helped her escape. <laughs> Some flames took off from this island not long ago. While I can't say for certain, she was probably on one of them. Fashionably late, Chris. I see. I guess my sister owes you. Thanks for helping. Everyone's gone. I may be the only other person left. Go on. Follow your sister and get off this island. So now he has to escape the island that he just got on. Even though he has a oh. boat. Also, yeah. wait. That was... That was... <laughs> How is Melvin still alive? Also, that's a graboid. Gravedigger. Get oh, eaten. Not oh, anymore. Well, I guess... Not alive. <laughs> nah, nah, don't worry. He dies here, and then we're gonna see him in another cutscene, slumped over dying again. So, uh, now Chris has to escape Rockford Island, that he- the island that he just got on to look for Claire. But Claire, like, left, like, an hour ago. To go to fucking oh. Antarctica. See, he's alive again! He's alive again! <laughs> Hold on. My my boy, and now oh, he's dying, dying okay. again. Oh, okay. She the emotion, the emotional roller coaster. As a token of thanks for saving her, I won't need it anymore. Take that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh! Great cutscene. Uh, who is that? She loves the opera. Alexia? No. She's already fully awake. Chris, oh little fishy, come see my hook. <laughs> so like oh, I, so love, I love in the middle of what? this like both both Wesker and Chris are away from Antarctica looking at Alexia being born in Antarctica for some reason she is like spreading the footage of her cradling her brother's corpse into like the modern systems of Rockford Island and not only that but Wesker is like freaking the fuck out because he realized oh my god Alexia finally woke up this is horrible this is like uh the, like she's gonna be such a problem a pain in the ass but then the moment that he realizes that Chris also is looking Alexia? at Alexia he goes like no she's already fully awake Chris, oh little fishy, come see my hook. <laughs> it's like, oh Chris, yeah, your my, uh, my master plan is finally being carried out, Chris. Oh my god, like, oh you're gonna I, you're gonna get caught in my my trap, Chris. It's like, Wesker, you're 
You just ended freaking the fuck out about Alexia being born again. I know, I love it so much how Wesker's in the middle of a panic attack, <laughs> sees his freaking ex-boyfriend on the monitor, and immediately, immediately changes up like, I wasn't panicking. Oh. <laughs> a little fishy, come see my hook. Oh, Chris, <laughs> I can't believe that you're here too. Oh my god. Hello. And, uh... Hello, Chris. Oh, what a coincidence, Chris, that we're both here. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I'm sending some company to keep you entertained. Like, the moment that Chris shows up, he completely forgets about Alexia. Bro does not give a shit. Consider this a small welcome gift from me. <laughs> Enjoy. Oh yeah, he controls hunters. <laughs> what the fuck's that laugh? Yeah, so the, the entirety of the rest of the game, the second half of the game, is Chris going through the same exact rooms that uh, uh, Claire did again, but this time instead of fighting zombies, he fights hunters because, you know, Resident Evil 1. That's what happens in Resident Evil 1. Like, the, the hunters replace the zombies, and now uh, fucking Chris has to fight the hunters in place of the zombies. That makes sense, right? This was the hook in question. <laughs> Hold on, what the fuck else is, is going on here? I fucking love all the Wesker. rainbow flags oh! in chat. <laughs> Wesker! Hold on, let's do it again. <laughs> Long time no see, Chris. Wesker? Ah! <laughs> Jump scare! Dude, you have, you have to just let the anime fight scene they have play out because it's actually relevant to RE5. Let's fucking go. Yeah, you, you will explain that afterwards. Yes. Still alive? <laughs> he just found this out. Uh, 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 uh. Literally, your ex-boyfriend from like fucking five years ago shows up in a random island. And he goes, "Hello, Chris. I have now cat superpowers." Meow. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? I came for Alexia. Who? An organization hired oh. to capture her. He Wait, doesn't respond. You attack the island. And my sister! Ow! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I love him so much! <laughs> you have no idea how much I hate you. Okay. You destroyed my plans. Gay. So now I've sold my soul to a new organization. You destroyed my plans. However, it was totally my plan to get killed by the tyrant. By the way, Chris, you destroyed my plans. <laughs> all according to my plan. <laughs> <laughs> you son of a bitch! I could kiss you for that. Now, die. Here's a Gosh, little secret. That's kind of hot. I figured out that your sister is now in the Antarctic with Alexia. It's too bad you won't be seeing her again. <laughs> Bitch, why are you laughing? <laughs> she was just looking at that. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> it sounded for a second there like Chris is gonna start crying. Yeah, so, uh, like, bitch. fucking Wesker just abandons Chris in the middle of that because he saw Alexia in a monitor laughing at them, even though Wesker already knew that Alexia was, like, freed, so it's like, why the fuck did you not finish the job and kill Chris right then and there? He loses focus. Also, he got, right he after got that, Chris sheep. just finds a fucking airplane, a jet, and just flies oh. it off towards fucking Antarctica. Just the vague direction of Antarctica. Because, you know, Antarctica is so small, you can just, like, find the umbrella facility there, no problem. 
Yeah. Dude, someone in chat said Wesker has trauma related to people laughing at him. <laughs> <laughs> he flies, he gets fucking triggered by Alexia, like calling him cringe, so he just leaves the room crying. <laughs> the title was cool, Chris! Amazing! Like he, like, he just, he just figures out that Alexia was watching him, like, doing, like, his fucking makeout se session with his, like, ex-boyfriend that he just found after so many years. He was like, I can't believe you ruined the moment! <laughs> I'm gonna kill you! <laughs> I had my pookie bear right there! <laughs> How dare you embarrass me in front of my pookie bear! <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I will consider this as canon from now on. Yes. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yes. I agree. Indeed. Anyways, so oh, Chris finds the place where Alexia got reborn at, and then eventually... ...finally reunites... ...with his sister. Oh yeah, by the way, um... Uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, did you know that also, in the Antarctic base, uh, Umbrella actually has a secret clone mansion of the Spencer Mansion in Antarctica? Why? What? And, uh, uh, Why? Like, this, this, after the Spencer Mansion was built, Umbrella really liked the work of, uh, Trevor, so they decided to in the in the Antarctica mansion, they in the Antarctica base, they decided to have a secret underground exact replica copy of the original Spencer mansion for them to use as combat grounds to be able to test future bioweapons. This was before the Spencer mansion was blown up, by the way. They just really liked the work of Trevor. And decided to remake it into a testing ground that is an exact cop duplicate copy of Spence like Oswald Spencer's mansion. And that's the place I where Alexia takes like Claire after like kidnapping her and like she just takes her into the Spencer mansion and puts her on the wall. I <laughs> Okay. I okay. Um. Um, it's just never explained what? why. They just say like, yeah, we just have an exact replica copy of the place from Resident Evil 1 in here. Um, and I just want to say, this is not the only time in the what? series that you will find what? a replica of the Spencer Mansion somewhere in the world. In Shout fact, out to George Trevor getting oh, wait. Work. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you mean the, the RE5 DLC? Yeah, in the RE5 DLC, there's also an exact copy of the Spencer oh Mansion my. somewhere. And in Resident Evil Revelations 2, there's also an underground what? Spencer Mansion copy! Okay. <laughs> I haven't played that! <laughs> they just really like that mansion. They just really uh -huh. like that mansion. Why? I mean, it was THE Spencer Mansion. THE Spencer Mansion. And they don't I mean, use it as an actual mansion, they always use it as like a, like a training ground, or like a special bioweapon research facility, or as well as like Oswald Spencer's second mansion that he just goes to hide in after like the government wants his head. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's the exact same one oh. every time. It's all for the combat data! Exactly, Aussie. Yeah. Fuck. Oh. oh yeah. By the way, Jeremy says that there's also another copy of the mansion in Umbrella Core. I will not talk about Umbrella Core because I don't consider that game canon. But if you want to count that, there are exactly five different copies of the Spencer Mansion built by Umbrella after the construction of the Spencer Mansion. I, they just really liked it. I guess they just really liked the layout. I think that they played RE1, and they found it <laughs> iconic. George Trevor should sue from the grave for copyright infringement. That shit's bullshit. I just, I really like the idea <laughs> that, like, these guys who are running the Umbrella Corporation, they're like, we need to recreate the Spencer Mansion as our base. Why? It's Spencer Mansion from Resident Evil 1! It's super Everyone cool! knows it! It's super cool! It's super cool! <laughs> I played that game, it scared the shit out of me, man! It's not even that- It's not even that the Spencer Mansion got blown up and then got reconstructed somewhere else. No! All of these bases were created BEFORE it got blown up! So what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> nah, nah, they just played RE1, man. 
I All like right. to think that Spencer was only able to exist in an exact recreation of his mansion. So they had a bunch of them around the globe so that he would just fly there and then go back into his mansion. He's like, ah, just like I'm home. Just like home. <laughs> it's, like, it's like an Airbnb you can take everywhere. Anyway, so he finally fucking rescues his sister. Eh. Claire. Chris! I missed you so much. I know. But we have to get out of here. Not yet. We have to find Steve. Who's Who? Steve. Who? <laughs> <laughs> Space! That island with me. Why don't you but just go ask Leon? Us and we got separated. So that means Steve is still somewhere in this base? I'm sure of it. Claire? What's wrong? I think... I think I've been poisoned. Just hold on. I'll be right back. And she, Chris has to go find the antidote for Claire. You know, just like in the fucking, yeah, 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 in the rest evil one, where like he has to go find the cure for like the, the snake poison for that other st like stars member, mm -hmm. you know? There's like, like parallels or some shit. For Sherry or an RE3 where you have to find the cure for Jill. Yeah. Yeah. It's like really cool, right? Oh, also the, the, the father of the Ashford twins is for some reason stuck in the middle of the ice and he's like being held up by a crane or something. I think Alexia put him there for some reason. Because like she's just watching over there. What did bro do? I don't know. I, I forgot what he did. I think that they like I think he just tried to sell Umbrella Secrets to the rival company so they just turn oh, him into like the most fucked up monster ever that is constantly in pain and screaming in agony 24/7. Is that a head crab? Uh, it's a giant spider. Oh. Okay, here we go. And finally, Alexia confronts the Redfield brothers. Thanks to you. Just Rival company trademark TM. Yeah, it's never explained who they are. Just like a big brother. Let's just roll with the fact that their actual name is Rival at... Company. Yeah. <laughs> that would be yeah, great. Be little sister. No, Umbrella's Rival Company. They just took the trademark <laughs> from them. <laughs> Could you imagine? Could you fucking imagine if like Sega branded themselves as Nintendo's Rival Company? Could you imagine that shit in real life? Okay, now I understand oh why Umbrella fucking hates those guys so much. <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> that dumb, that fucking it's mad Alexia. bitch. Alexia. There really is an Alexia? <laughs> Bitch! It is this, almost time she get to capture the Imperius. Uh, like, like, she didn't see her. Like, like, there's just a giant tentacle that fucking destroyed the, the, the car that she was using to escape the Antarctic. And then, like, she, mm -hmm. she vaulted over and just fucking took her. Siblings. Right. <laughs> After her! She might know where Steve is. Let's go! Yeah, we have to rescue Steve. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> he ate shit. It's never explained where these tentacles come from, because like it's not like they're coming out of Alexia. They literally just show up the moment that she wakes up from the tube. Down poor TM. Oh. Like I don't oh. I don't understand where the fuck they come from. Oh. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Plot device tentacles. That's it. Oh. Chris! Uh. No! Jesus fucking Christ, Steve. Oh, fuck <laughs> I'll be fine. But Chris! You've got to save Steve. What? Whoever that is. Whoever that is! Sounds like he needs it right now, like, Jesus Christ. Wasn't she poisoned? Okay, uh, yes, no, but, yeah, but in the meantime, between those two cutscenes, like, uh, like... Oh, she got cured. He got, she got cured, yes. Uh, also, 
This is actually pretty sad. Not as sad as, like, the Resident Evil 2 remake Kendo cutscene, but this is still pretty sad. Especially because, like, Steve is, like, one of your actual partners that accompanied you through the entirety of the game up to this point, and, yeah, you see what happens here. Alexia's fucked up. Steve? Oh. Claire. Who did this to you? That crazy woman told me she was going to perform the same experiment on me that she did on her own father. She's completely insane. Uh, 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 What's wrong? Claire! Get... Breathe. Claire, help me, Claire. And then he picks up the fucking axe that he was holding. He was being held from. No, wait. It's actually really cool. Ah, uh, yes, he was infected by the T. Veronica virus. Oh. And he was not incubated. So he could become a monster. <laughs> right. Uh, that probably sucks if you actually play the game. That is pretty sad. Yep. He hulked out. What would be cool if he still used his, like, controller missiles? But In then... But then... My God! Oh, Steve. Steve is still in there. Oh wow. He Naked boy. Actually, somewhat returned. Yeah, see, Veronica virus is kind of crazy. I think it reacts to your heartbeat or some shit like that, and the more heartbeat you have, the more mutated you get. Except if you get frozen, that's why Alexia got frozen or some shit like that. Oh. I don't fucking know. Anime boy, no. You're warm. Steve, you've got to hang in there, okay? Uh, my brother's come to save us. We're getting out of here. Your brother kept his promise. I'm so what fucking promise? Sorry, I cannot. What? What are you saying? I'm glad that I met you. I... I love you. Uh... Claire. Oh. Oh. Steve? 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 <laughs> <laughs> Better love story than Twilight. <laughs> Thank you, David. Anyway, so uh, after that, uh, 
Chris is still like hanging out in the copy Spencer mansion with thing. a broken leg. With a broken leg, yes. <laughs> Chris has been hiding behind a podium the whole time. <laughs> and here we go! Wesker! Wesker versus Whoa! Alexia! I found you, Alexia. Come with me. <laughs> You're responsible for the creation of the T Veronica virus. And now the only existing sample is in your body. Give me your I body. But not for sexual reasons. I'm only into Chris. Give me your body for the <laughs> virus. Now don't get don't take this the wrong way. I am Chris sexual. <laughs> this is purely a non-sexual transaction, Alexia. Give me your body. You are not worthy of its power. <laughs> Quite a crazy bitch. Someone in chat just asked if he's holding out his hand for it. Yes! <laughs> he's like, give, give me. me your body. Literally. Give, give me. me one give body. Me, give me. <laughs> no, no. No, don't do that. Yes, yes. Become evil. Oh. What? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whiskers like. Qu Whiskers like. like. Hold on a second. Uh, these two super, <laughs> su super villains fighting. I can give a shit about your firepower as I do parkour. <laughs> Chris is watching Chris. the background. Chris, my boy. Okay, he sounded concerned for him there. <laughs> yeah. Chris, watch out. Yeah. He saw the fire almost burned. He was like, Chris. <laughs> oh no, my pookie bear. Listen, listen to him here. Listen to him. Chris. <laughs> like, that is not hatred. That is concern. Chris, since you're one of my best men, I'll let you have this. Oh! Fucking coward. Yeah, so Chris has to fight Alexia here. Blah 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 blah. You you shoot her until she dies, but not really. And then you find Claire and self-destruct sequence again for some reason. Hold on, is there a way that I can find out why the self-destruct sequence happens? Hold on. Chris, there should be a self-destruct system somewhere. What? <laughs> If you activate it, all the electronic locks might be deactivated. Sure! No, really sure. Why would... Oh, I, I guess that kind of makes sense. No! No! Because, like, because if they activate the self-destruction so people can get out before the place blows up. Yeah, no, but Claire oh, just knows but... that. Yeah, no, Claire should not know that at all. Claire goes, yeah, so Chris, I've been through my own Resident Evil. There's probably yeah. a fucking self-destruct sequence somewhere around here. This is how it worked at Nest, and this is an umbrella place, so like... Just and she sure. was right. So yeah, now Chris and Claire have to fight the, the Veronica. I mean, the, the Alexia. Yeah, so fucking virus. gross. He's a big... Ooh. 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 Gross. What are we gonna do? Shoot it until it dies. Does every RE game have a self destruction sequence? Yes. Yes. Every single one. And it's awesome every single time. <laughs> okay. Turn the key clockwise simultaneously on three. Got it. Oh, that's weird. 
Yeah, it's just weird. One, two, three. I'll keep her busy. Just go for the emergency elevator. Chris, but... I can take care of this. Just go. You have to make it. Don't die on me. <laughs> so yeah, boss fight with Alexia. You shoot her a bunch of times, she mutates much the same way. This is the point in the Resident Evil canon where, like, they don't really fucking care about the biology of this shit. Like, they just made a new strain of the T-Virus and it just can't do this shit. It's gonna turn you into a giant bug woman for some reason. I mean, it's cool, though. Yeah. Like, she's a bad bitch, though, but, like, what the fuck is even going on here? So, Chris does the self-destruct sequence. Manages to kill Alexia's different forms. I think she has like three different forms. One where she like flies around something. And eventually... Yep, that's a flying form. And eventually, after a, lo a long and tedious boss battle that I fucking hated because I had to redo it like 50 times when I was a kid, you unlock... The Big Cannon! Oh, the old I get it. Oh yeah, the opera boss. Look at how thing. annoying cool. that fucking. F Ugh. Oh, and she did she dodge it? You got she can dodge it, yes. Ugh. Fucking cool. <laughs> oh. Here we go. Oh my god. <laughs> this go. is this is the moment where Wesker gets set up to be like the fu the, the the main villain of the entire series. Move. Uh, Claire. Bitch, no. get out of here. Bitch out my way. Here we go. Chris! Well done, Chris. It turns out that Alexia's work wasn't much of anything. So now, the only thing left is revenge. Let her go, Wesker. You don't want her. You want me. Why? <laughs> Claire! Today's a good day. I came for Alexia. Killing you is even better. Sorry to disappoint you, but Alexia is gone. That's no longer a concern to me. I have Steve to work with. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh. In between all this, uh, Wesker took Steve's body and extracted the T Veronica virus from his corpse. Oh. So that's how that's Wesker gets forever. a sample of the T Veronica virus. <laughs> From this game. He always does that. He always fucking does that. He gets some Steve. random corpse with the virus. He did I that as so. well from RE4. Yeah. He didn't. You freak. Don't you touch him. I'm sorry, dear heart. But my men have already taken get out of here. For what about? As a surviving member of Scars, I have to thank you. Remember your promise. <laughs> Time for a fucking JoJo battle. Hey, Wesker. I'll end this once and for all. Say hello to my comrades who you've killed. I don't know where oh. you get your confidence, Chris. <laughs>
Yeah, so he got beat very fucking badly. Like, instantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The self-destruct system has been activated. All personnel evacuate immediately. The self-destruct system has been activated. All personnel evacuate immediately. Anime moment. <laughs> it's like unfair. We're giving him the smack down. Oh my god. I told you, he gets very, he gets beaten very badly. Human anymore. No wonder he got so buffed and fine. He has oh. not landed a single punch. Yeah, no wonder he fucking works out. And fine. Magnificent, don't you think? Jojo pointing at him. Ah! Uh You think he's dead from that? Nah. I play R5. Some guy in the chat said rip. What the fuck universe are you on? Huh? Oh, <laughs> <Canada> plan. <laughs> Such an awkward smirk. I can't, not I can't beat be the shit smile. out of you without getting closer. Nice try, Wesker. No! Today's your lucky day. Next time we meet, don't count on another. Next time. Next time. Until we meet again. <laughs> I'm just going to stand here. <laughs> he can take a fucking explosion to the face. He doesn't give a shit. Uh, Luca Sanguin super chats and says, My head cannon for White Chris is strong enough to punch that fucking boulder in RE5 is because after the first kick to the nuts, he wanted to do the same to Wesker. So, y yeah, funny thing about that. <laughs> go on. <laughs> that's not a head cannon. That's, that's cannon. That's that literally the actual, the actual reason. reason. The actual reason why Chris is so, f like, buff in every single game after Code Veronica is that he's got his ass whooped so badly by Wesker in this game that he started working out like crazy so he could be ripped enough to kick Wesker's ass next time they fought. And keep in yep. mind, I don't think that, that Chris understood what Wesker did. Like, I think that, I think that Chris just saw Wesker doing those fucking anime karate moves and thought, oh, he got really ripped. I have to surpass him in power. And like fucking <laughs> Goku, like trained, like went into a fucking training arc and got his biceps as big as his fucking head, just like so he could beat Wesker. Bro went into the hyperbolic time chamber just cause he got his ass yeah. whipped once. It's so <laughs> fucking stupid, but awesome. Anyway, so the play, oh. Antarctica explodes. I wish that I could just say Antarctica, but like obviously like the, the umbrella base in Antarctica explodes. But in my mind, because Antarctica is never brought up again ever in the history of the Resident Evil universe, I wish to think that Antarctica itself exploded. And they escaped. Chris, promise me. Please promise that you won't leave me alone again. I'm sorry, Claire, but it's not over yet. There's still something we've got to do. You mean 
Yeah, it's payback time. We've got to destroy Umbrella. Now, <laughs> let's finish this once and for all. <laughs> That's Fuck. three games that ended with it's time we end Umbrella once and for all. Surely the fourth installment of the Resident Evil series will be the one where they do that. Okay, so as you can see, Resident Evil 2, we ended with it's up to us to take down Umbrella. Then we have in Resident Evil 3, Jill going, I can't believe that we they've gone too far we have to take down umbrella and now resident evil code veronica x ends with chris like going off into the fucking sunset with like his sister and going in a fight it's not over yet we have to take down umbrella <laughs> so years pass and then resident evil 4 comes along and umbrella's dead that's it! <laughs> In the intro to Resident Evil 4, our blood's dead. Fuck it. <laughs> yeah, they're gone. Yeah. They're like sued their asses or something. Yeah, what the fuck died. happened? So, if you want to know what actually happened to Umbrella after the events of Code Veronica, some. Ari loreheads are gonna be like, mm, actually, but like, shut the fuck up. The explanation happened like after Resident Evil 4 release, so like, we're gonna go by the order of the game's release. What happened after Code Veronica is that the American government said like, okay, you know what? Umbrella is kind of way too shady. We're gonna like, pr like ban them from doing business in America. And so like the stock prices of Umbrella collapsed and like they went bankrupt. And you wanna know what's funny, chat? <laughs> You wanna know what's funny? They built up since Resident Evil 2, this climactic entry where every character would come together like Endgame and fight against Umbrella, only to deliver that underwhelming of an of an explanation as to what happened to Umbrella. <laughs> and then they made the best Resident Evil game of all time. Like Shinji Mikami. Like what really happened here is that Shinji Mikami, the director of Resident Evil 4, like wanted to make a cool ass action game and said I don't give a shit about umbrella I I just want to I just want to take Leon and pluck him into Spain to have him fight like a bunch of Spaniards with like alien parasites like stuck into their bodies so you know what fuck it I'm gonna create an entire intro sequence at the beginning of the game that explains that um after like after what happened umbrella's dead I don't care <laughs> If you think, and if you think that other Masked Horror series have complex storylines that aren't well thought out correctly, in comes fucking Capcom and Shinji Mikami, completely throwing the three cliffhangers that they set up all over the course of ten years, going, you know what? Fuck it, let's go to Spain. Sure. And it somehow ended up being the best game in the series. It's the best game in the series, and like the thing that rev revitalized the, the the franchise, and like every single third person action game after the release of Resident Evil Four became a Resident Evil Four clone. Uh, uh, Resident Evil Four is genuinely my favorite game of all time. It is the best. It is peak. It is it is like the culmination of years of work into a, a, a franchise with a bunch of ideas. Directed by a fucking madman genius creator. But it just doesn't give a shit about the rest of the Resident Evil storyline. Yeah. It doesn't have to is the thing. It doesn't have to yeah. because it's so goddamn cool. It's uh, like, what a good fucking game. It's brilliant because you think that like it, it was so painful for me because I was a Resident Evil fan before Resident Evil 4 came along, and I was like, oh my god, this game is amazing, where's Umbrella gonna come in? Where's Umbrella gonna come in? They're gonna- f we're gonna find a lab where, like, it's revealed that Umbrella was secretly behind what's happening in Resident Evil 4 all along. No! No. Not this time! It's just completely unrelated! It was aliens, it was fucking aliens that you found underneath a fucking Spanish castle. 
Yeah, that was the other thing. This game was like, okay, viruses. Meh. No one cares anymore. Yeah, no one, no one cares about viruses. These, these ones are aliens. They're alien parasites. And they're all in a cult. And it's, they're castles. It's, it's ridiculous. Anyway. Uh, so I would like to. I'm not fucking joking. Like I need to show. I need to show Chad the intro to Resident Evil 4 so they can actually properly understand how fucking sudden this is. Imagine, imagine being a Resident Evil fan back in like the early 2000s and thinking, "Oh my god, I can't wait! I just finished Code Veronica. It was kind of mid. I can't wait for them to take down Umbrella." And then you buy Resident Evil 4 for the GameCube, and this is the shit that Capcom hits you with. 1998. I'll never forget it. It was the year when those grisly murders occurred in the Arklay Mountains. Soon after, the news was out to the whole world, revealing that it was the fault of a secret viral experiment conducted by the international pharmaceutical enterprise, Umbrella. The virus broke out in a nearby mountain community, Raccoon City, and hit the peaceful little town with a devastating blow crippling its very foundation. Not taking any chances, the President of the United States ordered a contingency plan to sterilize records. It's a really good recap. With the yeah. affair gone public, the United States government issued an indefinite suspension of business decree to Umbrella. Soon its stock prices crashed, and for all intents and purposes, Umbrella was finished. And the collapse of the umbrella logo leading right into the title card. Sick. Oh, yeah, but it's just imagine. Imagine. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. With the, okay, with the context, this is so much funnier. Yeah, like while I was streaming Resident Evil 4 for the channel like years ago, I could not. I could not explain to you guys the depths of stupidity that this fucking intro was. So thank God that I'm finally I'm I'm finally able to do it here. It's like people went nuts over this in like forums. It was well half half was like oh my god this game is like the best this is like the game the best game of all time I fucking love it but also what the fuck did they do to Umbrella? And honestly I think Capcom also realized how fucking horrible of a mistake this was. Because after Resident Evil 4 and the events of Resident Evil 4, which have nothing to do with Umbrella, later on, they have to claw back and try to find every single little bit of a reason or an excuse to get Umbrella involved again in the series. Like they have, they have inspired Umbrella companies. They have secret members of Umbrella that went on to like go, go work on the government. They have like new companies that are actually secretly made up of like old em Umbrella employees. They have paramilitary groups that were created by Umbrella that wanted to turn out a new leaf, so they became Blue Umbrella. You have terrorist groups branding the name, naming themselves Neo Umbrella. It's like, Resident Evil could not escape the shadow of Umbrella after they yeah. unceremoniously killed it off at the end, at the start of the Resident Evil 4. It's just the biggest bag fumble in the world. Yeah, Which, I almost wish they kept going, like, getting away from Umbrella. Yeah. Because I, I think they nailed it with 4. This is like the problem um, that like the Legend of Zelda series has with Ganon. Like Ganon is Ganon. Ganon is like the biggest evil motherfucker in the universe. So like every single game has to go back to Ganon at some point. Yep. Every single Resident Evil game has to have Umbrella somewhere in there. Because Resident Evil yeah. 4 happened and that's the one thing that the fans got mad about. Yeah, a Which... lot of franchises suffer the same problem that they can they keep living in the past. That like, they Mortal always Kombat, come back. And all that. Yeah. Over and yeah. over and over yeah. again. And I find that so funny too. Because like it's not like, oh, Umbrella keeps coming back because all the times they try new villains, they suck. No, usually the new villains in Resident yeah, Evil games are really <laughs> fucking cool. Yeah, they like, heal it. 
Yeah, because like Los Illuminados was an amazing villain. Evelyn in mm -hmm. RE7, great villain. Fucking uh, the entirety of like Mother Miranda in the Village of Shadows, the amazing villains. Mm -hmm. But they always got to come back to Umbrella somehow. <laughs> fucking Neo Umbrella, Jesus fucking Christ. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> we don't have to talk about that yet. So, Zach. Mm hmm. I've been talking for a very long time because you haven't played Code Veronica. Mm hmm You've played Resident Evil 4, right? Just many times, yes. Okay. Talk and everything you don't say, I will say. <laughs> Cause this <laughs> game is my shit. And I want you I want to give you the floor at some fucking points. I understand. I understand completely. Hey. Okay. So, uh Resident Evil 4. Yeah, so this game kind of it picks up leon's storyline but as we've been talking about it is in no way really connected to any of the continuing storylines we saw involving raccoon city or umbrella at all in this game there is a new there is a new criminal organization that was founded in uh in, it's in spain right yes spain mm -hmm. okay. no and, and and they say europe <laughs> right, because I remember. Oh, I remember they always say Europe, but I'm like, where? <laughs> Europe. It's like yeah. you're you're um, buying you're you're using pesetas. The 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 enemies are speaking in Spanish. It's fucking Spain. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Europe. Um. So this new criminal organization called Los Illuminados, which was founded in Europe, um, opens this game by kidnapping the president's daughter. And Leon, who has now been moved up the ranks into what's it? What's he now? Like FBI? He's a special agent working directly for the president of the United States. The highest rank any individual could ever fucking have. Right. Ever? The biggest yeah, promotion. Leon, Leon, after surviving the Raccoon City incident, went from rookie cop to a special agent working for the president of the United States and was sent on a personal miss mission to go to Europe and save the president's daughter from this new organization. So he rolls in with a couple of cops who were working at the time, um, and immediately shit goes south because those two cops are, are pretty much immediately kidnapped and go missing the second he goes to talk to the locals of the area. Because the locals in this area, yeah, these, these, these fellas, these guys are not zombies like we've seen in pretty much every Resident Evil game beforehand. They can These talk. guys still, yeah, exactly. They still function as civilians would. They go about their day to day. They can speak. They like showcase like clear higher intelligence. Um, however, whenever they encounter anyone like Leon or really anyone who comes from outside of their little village, it's, it's like a switch flips and suddenly they turn into these like insane mobs that try to kill and attack him. Um, and, you know, yeah, we get this whole friggin' sequence, this iconic sequence, where, um, you know, he, he goes and he tries to, uh, work his way through this village, and he has to fight waves and waves of these guys, seeming like it, there's gonna be no end to them when suddenly this bell rings, and all of them completely stop in place like some kind of hive mind. And it really and... sets up the mystery of what the fuck these guys are in the first place, because the game said specifically, these are not zombies. Yeah, like that was the that's the immediate thing that kind of like grabs your attention with RE4 is that like you're so used to zombies and suddenly you have this whole cultist village that all operates in this weird sort of hive mind structure. And it's like, what what the fuck's wrong with these guys this time? What what the hell is going on here? Well, you know, Umbrella didn't make anything. So what's Los Illuminados' deal? Lord Sutler. Here we go. 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 Say the line, Bard! Where's everyone going? Bingo? Yeah! <laughs> I, I like chat telling me to shut up so long before the line was said. I'm not gonna talk over the line, guys. I'm not stupid. Don't worry, I'm controlling this shit. He's, he, he I, I will control this so that the line is said. Anyways, proceed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's just you skipped, you skipped to the best thing. <laughs> yeah, this game is stupid. Oh my god. 
So, so, yeah, Leon, Leon is essentially trying to make his way through this village as all of these, like, now revealed to be cultists are attempting to kill him, uh, trying to find Ashley. And, oh, I, crazy, you actually skipped here. I was about to bring him up. Um, as Leon works his way through the village, eventually he encounters uh, this fella here named Luis. Luis! Who is, who is being held captive uh, by the big cheese <laughs> of, of, the, of the village. Um, Luis, okay, are we, are we going by remake explanations for Luis or like the original game on screen? I like Luis's Luis backstory in, in remake, actually. Yeah. I was going to say like, Luis is such a, a good character that, in remake. I was going to say, yeah, because like, there's a lot of stuff I like between both games. Like there's some things I like about the original more, some things I like the remake more. I think the remake did Luis better in every way. Yep. Agreed. Yep. Um, so yeah, we'll go, we'll go with remake Luis. So Yeah. Um, Leon ends up trying to save Luis, but gets caught off guard by the friggin' big cheese, the the, the first major villain. Who of looks the game. like a tyrant. Look at that yes, big ass who, gray coat. And he superpowers. looks like a tyrant. He functions like a tyrant. Big, resilient, like buff friggin' monster. Um, and the two of them end up getting knocked out. And when they wake up, now Leon's been captured, and most notably, it's amazing how as the cutscene's going, it's like I am desperately, desperately trying to become a live, like, analysis video editor right now. I know, it's crazy. You're keeping up very well. Um, so yeah, as as Leon is knocked out by the big cheese after meeting Luis, um, here's where the main freaking conflict of this game comes from, other than Ashley being kidnapped. Leon gets infected. Uh, like, correct me if I'm wrong, this is one of the... This is one of, if not the first RE game where we are actively playing through the game while trying to fight off the infection everyone else has. There is Resident Evil 3 where Jill gets infected at the clock tower, but she is rescued like, by Carlos. For so a short time, yeah. yeah she couldn't really do like, anything. Uh, you can also get infected in uh, Resident Evil Outbreak, but that's like a game mechanic and doesn't really get explored much. This was the first game in the franchise where like that was a major plot point and also it was one of the first concepts that was actually part of Resident Evil 4 like from the very beginning like even even when this game was completely different like in Resident Evil 3.5 like you can see some of the like concept videos from that like this game was in development for like five years like it was a very long time in development uh even back then, Leon was supposed to be infected with this weird misty virus that made him hallucinate ghosts, like, around, like, an abandoned mansion. So, yeah, it, like, Shinji Mikami really wanted to play around with the idea of the protagonist being properly infected and controlled by the main villain of the game. Yeah, and, like, that was something that immediately made this game stand out so much, because you're playing through the entire thing now with the friggin' looming threat over your head of, yeah, I'm infected too. Um, so, yeah. Um, anyway, continuing. So, after Luis and Leon get captured, um, Luis turns out he knows a lot more than he originally let on, and that he has some kind of connection to the people that are involved with this cult. Because immediately, Luis knows that Leon is an agent that's here looking for Ashley, and he clearly has some kind of ties to them, because, I mean, like, he was simply captured and just put away. Um, it's implied that he was infected. Um, I want to point out something very, very fucking funny about the, this cutscene, by the way. Mm -hmm. When they're bond- when Luis and Leon are having their little bonding time here in the cell when they're being captured, they're talking about their previous experiences with each other, and Luis's reaction to what something that Leo sen says is like the funniest fucking thing ever. Like, hold on, look at this. Daughter in the church. And who might you be? Me llamo Luis Serra. I used to be a cop in Madrid. But now I'm just a good-for-nothing guy who happens to be quite the ladies' man. <laughs> Why'd you quit? Phew, <laughs> policia. You put your life on the line. Nobody really appreciates you enough for it. Being a hero isn't what it's cracked up to be anymore. I used to be a cop myself. Only for a day, though. I thought I was bad. Somehow I managed to get myself involved with the incident in Raccoon City on my first day in the force. That is the incident with the viral outbreak, right? Yeah, right. The, 
Yeah, that, you know, the far away incident that, like, barely anyone remembers, right? This was like a trillion 9-11s in the world of Resident Evil. Everyone fucking yeah. knows what the Raccoon City incident is. But Luis Earl goes like, oh yeah, that thing? Oh yeah, I heard that, that it was pretty that bad. Little thing, right? <laughs> I heard it sucked quite a lot. Also, he says this, which is like the strangest line that never gets brought up again in the entirety of the series. That is the incident with the viral outbreak, right? I think I might have seen a sample of the virus in a lab at the department. What? What? In, yeah. In the Spanish department, police department of Spain? You, you got a, a sample, sample of, of the T virus? virus? Anyway, like, so, that's so weird. Anyway, so that never gets brought up again. Continue. <laughs> and I, I just want I just want to bring up too the difference between like Luis here and like the version we get in the remake, because again, Luis is very different. Um yep. Luis in this game. He simply brings up knowing about Ashley and whatnot because he heard the he heard like uh, a bunch of like the civilians talking about it while he was being brought in, and they talk about their past. And Luis brings up, yeah, I used to be a cop. That exchange is so different in the remake because in the remake when they're talking about it, Luis doesn't really give any background about who he is, and he he also brings up knowing about Ashley and whatnot. But he's he's a lot more mysterious. He's a lot more secretive about his past. Which then um, leads to Leon asking Hunnigan about getting info on Luis Serra, and then they end up finding out that in the remake, he used to be an ex-Umbrella researcher. Umbrella. Yeah, exactly. Which is, like, way more interesting to me. Yes. So much more yep. interesting. Um, yep. Anyway, yeah. Um, so, Leon and Luis end up going going their separate ways. <laughs> and um, <laughs> they end up going their separate ways. And um, as Leon makes his way throughout the village, he has another encounter with our boy, the Big Cheese, um, which I keep calling him that because I genuinely forget his name. Uh, uh, Vitoris Mendes. Thank you, thank you. He has another encounter with Mendes where he actually finds out that he's been infected by uh, by the infection that they simply call a plaga. And um, it's at that point that like, you know, it's at that point that he actually knows that there's like an infection that he has now and that it's going to be like affecting him throughout the campaign. And if I recall correctly, if, forgive me if I'm all over the place, this game is very big, so I'm trying to remember everything without missing my new details. Um, mm -hmm. Right, okay. So after after he finds out he's infected, that's when he works his way towards the friggin' lake, right? Yes. Because he, right, because he arrives at the church that... <laughs> Fucking quick time. Uh, he, he arrives at the church <laughs> where he knows that Ashley is being held, but there's no way inside. So he has to find a workaround and he makes his way towards this lake where he sees, oh shit, these guys in boats. They're throwing bodies of the cops from earlier into the water. What's up with that? Um, and can I just say immediately whenever we see the thing that they're feeding, how much I love it that no matter what the fucking Resident Evil game, no matter what the infection is, we get big animals. It just makes it big. Again. <laughs> like, I'm waiting for it. Waiting this for it. is not the T-Virus, by the way, but the, but whatever the fuck is infecting the locals of the area also created a giant fucking salamander. This is a salamander, by the way. It's like a thing that's like smaller than your finger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love Del Lago. Yeah, it's um, called the Lago, which means from the lake in Spanish. Yep. Oh, that's really cool. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> Leon, in order to get into the friggin' church, he ends up fighting this big salamander thing on a boat full of harpoons that he has an infinite supply of. This game is fucking stupid. Uh, I love Resident Evil 4 <laughs> so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there he is. I'm so glad that the remake didn't cut a single fucking thing from it, by the way. Like, they kept all the stupid shit in there. I was afraid that the Lago wasn't going to be a boss fight, and they just they just recreated it one for one. I am so happy with Resident Evil 4 Remake. Perfect. Yep. And, okay, this has nothing perfect. to do with, like, the lore recap, but can I talk about one of my favorite Easter eggs from any game with Del Lago? Sure. Because that shit is so fun. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh. Okay, so... You, in order to get to the Del Lago boss fight, there, you, there's obviously like the boat that you need to get the gas for. Yes. And um, while you're going through that area, you can stand by the dock <laughs> oh, where the yeah. boat is. And if you just so happen for whatever dumb reason, decide to pull out your pistol and start shooting at All the water, right. 
if you do it enough times, Del Lago just jumps out of the water and fucking kills you. <laughs> Let me show that right here. I am very glad that I am able to just pull up random videos from the internet. I I, I didn't find this when I was a kid. I think. I don't <laughs> it took remember me a very while well. To find out about it. If you just happen to see some fishies in the lake. Right. You shoot at them to get to like kill them. Get fucked! <laughs> <laughs> and okay, 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 I will say, I think the remake ruined this Easter egg. Yep, yep. Yep, absolutely. because when you go down here and then you start shooting at the fishies that are over here. It yeah. changes the camera angle. Like, you know something's gonna instantly. happen. It's like you triggered a cutscene. The whole point of the Easter egg is it's supposed to jump scare you. Yeah. yeah. Which is like one of the few things that the remake dropped the ball on, but that's fine. <laughs> I mean, yeah, a minute Easter egg. If that's the thing we're complaining about the remake doing wrong, the remake did a lot right. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Anyway, so yeah. that whole thing happens. So that whole thing happens, and one thing that's important to note is that after Del Lago dies, yeah, um, Leon friggin' has this one of these episodes that he gets frequently throughout this game, where right. he, like, he blacks out and starts seeing these, like, hallucinations. Um, and I forget if it happens in the original, because the remake's more what's on my mind. But, uh, like, it's the first time where he actively sees Sadler talking to him through his mind. Yeah, that's the remake. Uh, essentially, uh, the... The person who's controlling the uh, members of the village in this game is able to telepathically communicate with every single infected person, which also includes Leon, because he himself is also infected by the parasite. The parasite, by the way, can explode your fucking head. That's pretty cool. Uh, so, in the re the remake like builds up Sadler's connection to the villagers a lot more than the original. Uh, mm -hmm. I like I, I I am showing off the original footage right now because like I feel like it's a lot more succinct, but the remake includes a bunch of different and new details that I love. It's not that the uh -huh. the original is like superior to the remake. The the remake is actually vastly superior to the original, but mm -hmm. I, I I have more deeper connections to the original, so I'm showing it there's off also, right now. There's also like there's just some things I do just think the original does better too mm -hmm. like i i think i think narratively the remake is a stronger game and i think gameplay wise it is much like it's just much stronger mechanically especially with like some of the later stuff i cannot but go I think, back like, to a game without parrying that shit is fucking so yo. fucking cool no dude I'm, I'm in the same ballpark i can't play re4 without the knife parrying however i will say i think atmospherically and with a lot of the game's horror the original actually was stronger the visuals are like, much more unique because they had to they couldn't achieve the hyper realism of the remakes. Yeah, and like on top of that, I also think like just the atmosphere of like the regenerators when we get to those things, uh the novista doors like a lot of the enemies just I don't know, I just felt like they were a lot scarier in the original. Oh yeah, uh the infection here in Resident Evil 4 actually makes giants. Yeah, that's what I was getting at yeah. earlier. So this infection um at this point, at, th at this point, do we know that they're parasites? We, we know that they're parasites. Yeah, they're parasites. They, like, they explode out of their fucking heads. Yeah, so, um, at this, at this point in the game, we find out that the infection is not a virus, but rather it is a parasite. And one, and one thing that we find out, uh, with this freaking boss fight, El Gigante, I don't know if I said that name right. Yeah, is that, um, it's it's awesome, fine. okay. Um, one thing we find out about, like, bosses like this guy is that there were experiments done by this cult where essentially they would put multiple of these parasites into like a single body and it would cause the bodies to like mutate and get bigger resulting in like these giant humanoid monsters or the friggin' salamander. Like there's, there's a bunch of different types of these parasites and a bunch of different experiments they've done with them to create completely unique monsters, which is just one of the reasons I think the Plaga is such a cool like concept for an infection because it isn't just your typical, oh, it makes zombies. Oh, it infects an animal. It's a zombie animal. Also, the doggy. Dog. In the, in the, hey, at the start of the game, 
at the start of the game, you can rescue a little white dog that, like, is trapped in a in a bear trap, like, at the very beginning of the game. And if you're very gracious and, like, actually go out of your way to save the doggy, he later comes back right here. I love the doggy. I think the, the remake it had him like a lightning strike behind him too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fucking cool doggo. He's called Huey in my mind. Anyways, he's a good good, good doggo. So you I and fail. Huey kick this guy's ass. The what? Remember when they like baited us? Oh in the demo, yeah. Making us think that the dog was fucking dead. I did not believe that that was true. Okay, so essentially for the. Uh, Resident Evil 4 remake uh, promotional material, they showed off an area to the reviewers and like game critics uh, to, you know, to promote the video game. And those dumb motherfucking game critics uh, wanted to do a fun fact, you can actually find the Resident Evil 4 dog from the original game, but now he's dead because in the area where, you, where the bear trap is, you actually fa find a dog dead. Huey is dead here because this remake is so much darker than the original. Woo! Even though and it's so, even though it's so obviously not the fucking dog because it's just a regular gray wolf. It's not even a dog. It's a fucking wolf trapped in the bear trap. And then you go into chapter two of the remake when it actually releases, and it, it's she's just right there. Yeah, he's it, moved. It was, it was, yeah. He's slightly moved, like, forward into the story, but aside from that, it's just the exact same dog. Because Capcom actually gives a shit about the keeping themselves faithful to the original game's release, because this game fucking rocks! Which so, was so funny, by the way, because, like, that was in the Chainsaw demo, right? Yes. Yeah. Right, okay. Because I remember, I played the Chainsaw demo when it came out. And literally, I was screen sharing to my friends, and I saw that dead, like, wolf model, and I actually just went, no! Oh. <laughs> I fell for it. Yep. I mean, they do, I they do put him, they, killed him. they do put him in the exact same spot that Huey was in the original game, but still, there's no fucking way. I am, I am so happy that the B team that made Resident Evil 3 Remake either did not return for the Resident Evil 4 remake, or they got their shit together. Either way, good job. Because, holy shit, if this game had gotten the Resident Evil 3 remake treatment, I would... I, I would spiral, because this game is precious, precious to me. I don't think they ever would have allowed that to happen, because unlike Resident Evil 4, or unlike Resident Evil 3, Capcom actually gives a shit about this one. This game is like, you have to do it right, or it doesn't come out. Exactly, like, Resident Evil 3... The original Resident Evil 3 was already a rushed game. It was notorious for that. Mm -hmm. Like, Resident Evil 4 was their baby. Yep. Anyways, let's continue. Yeah, so, okay. After friggin' killing the lake monster and the giant, Leon is able to get into the church where he meets Ashley, and oh my god, in the original, she's annoying. Uh <laughs> Extremely annoying, huge as ears. Yeah, oh my... I, I actually forgot about how big her ears were in the original. Look at her. Um... Okay, okay. So here, here's where things are gonna get hard for me. By the way, mm -hmm. to like recap, I'm just gonna be real because the footage is of the original game, and if I recall correctly, the pacing of the original after this point is very different right. from the remake, which is more fresh on my mind. I mean, they still go to the cabin, right? Because they he he saves Ashley, and then after they save Ashley, um, they work their way through the village together. Um, you get your fun escort mechanics, which this game did freaking escort quest better than like anything else I played, by the way. Yes. Um, and right. So they, they make their way towards the cabin. They do the little sequence with Luis because he was in there with them. They survive together. Um, they escape the cabin and we get the friggin' chainsaw sisters fight, with, which is like my favorite thing ever. These um, are two blind, like female ganado that because I, I guess they were exceptionally angry or some shit were given chainsaws and they're like exceptionally powerful and durable and they're super fucking scary yep can we, we please can we please show the cutscene yes. that introduces them in the remake yes <laughs> yes 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 yes, yes. yes. <laughs> jesus christ it is so funny here's the regular cutscene in the original game which is like yeah they drop down 
from a thing, which is like, fair enough. Actually, you know what? You want to just change over to the remake cutscenes? That sure? I, I, I know I know the original is like easier, but genuinely that would be nicer for me if we did the remake because I the remake's the one I played more and is more I mean, fresh in I mean, I love both, so whatever. Okay. Right. Anyway, so this is how the Chainsaw Sisters are introduced in the remake. One of the, it was so, it's so unnecessarily cool. <laughs> hey, Leo. <laughs> Leo. Like, like, uh, I love this game. Unless it was yours. I just, the thing I love about Leon as a protagonist so much is the fact that he always does shit that's so much more dangerous than the obvious thing to do just because it looks cool. And I genuinely yeah. think that he thinks it looks cool. That's the thing too. He knows he looks cool doing it. Like that's just such a common thing with him specifically that no other Resident Evil protagonist does is he'll just do dumb shit to look cool and uh, like potentially get him killed. So uh, like you, here's a thing that the Resident Evil 2 remake introduced, and this is something that is actually expressly said in for remake. It, it was kind of like a fanon interpretation in the original releases of this game, but in for remake, they actually really leaned into it. The fact that Leon is so cool and has like such a pretty boy, like, like distant aura, is actually completely intended by the developers. After the re after Resident Evil 2 remake, Leon was fucked up. He went through emotional trauma. He feels guilty about what happened in Raccoon City, even though like you can't really shoulder the blame of an entire city fucking falling down and getting bombed. But whatever, Leon, fucking savior complex. And he goes through the entirety of Resident Evil 4 remake, essentially working through his trauma of Raccoon City. He starts the game out with Marvin's knife that he gave him at the very beginning of Resident Evil 2, and he carries that throughout the entirety of the game until he replaces it later at the final, like, the final, the final few chapters of the game. Throughout this entire thing, he's literally carrying the weight of Raccoon City in his pocket, trying to, for once in his life, actually save someone. His mission to rescue Ashley from Los Illuminados is not just, you know, I have to do my job, I have to go rescue the president's daughter. It's actually also an emotional quest for Leon in which he is trying to essentially rewrite what happened in Raccoon City and save someone from one of these, like, nightmare situations. I love that. I love that they actually took the bad shit that happened to Leon in Resident Evil 2 and actually made it a core part of his character in the fourth game. It's so fucking yeah. good. Yeah, I love it. And like, he builds his entire persona around being cool and being prepared and being a fighter and being this cool badass guy that's like, like, is there to like save, save like the president's daughter and like being like the hero and shit like that. But like, eventually you'll find out like, <sighs> I'll talk about that later. Anyways. Um, yeah. Long story short, the cop inside him died that day. Yeah. Let's continue <laughs> with the remake cutscenes because Asak is more attuned to this game. And honestly, same here. I've played this game literally dozens of times over and over again. It's peak. Can't go firm. Fucking peak. Yeah, I've, I've played this one so many times. You flame me in my DMs over the difficulty I played it on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Let's continue. <laughs> Which <laughs> did you play it on? I was playing on hardcore. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Was, hopefully, that's true. <laughs> it was true. He was getting mad at me for not playing professional. You have to play professional, Zach. I mean, I will. To, I will. Don't you have to beat hardcore? Shh, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, he saves Ashley, and she's she's much she, she's much less annoying, and she's much prettier looking in this in this remake. And she hides um, her ears. She she hides her ears. Thank goodness. Um, I love so yeah, the um, ears. I don't We're know. She looks way prettier in the remake. I mean, um, yeah. But yeah. So they get to the friggin' village survival sequence over here in the remake. 
Uh, they meet back up Lu with Luis, and this is actually a really important moment because after this, when they survive this Luis, is when he properly explains the kind of thing that they're dealing with and actually gives them a way out of it. Because right. that's another thing, is it's found out that not only is Leon infected, but Ashley is too. Let and... me show this part. There we mm -hmm. go. Perfect. Ashley. What's happening to me? <laughs> Ashley, is this the first time you've coughed on blood like this? Do you want to start explaining? A cough in the blood is caused by something called a plaga. That literally just means plague in Spanish. Yep. Okay. You saw those people, right? But you have the same thing inside you. The same thing that made them like that. These, what you're experiencing, these symptoms, they're only the beginning. I don't want to become like them. But you are, well, lucky. You see, at this early stage, the parasite, the plaga, it is possible to remove it with the surgical procedure. And all you need is some know-how. <laughs> no, yeah. The right equipment. Wait, you too? No worries. See? I have a plan. But you're going to have to trust me. Great. We're partners then. Yay! Hey, why are you in time <laughs> for any questions? The clock is ticking. Why are you helping us? Because it makes me feel better. Let's leave it at that. We'll contact you later. What a good goddamn character. Yeah, you see, like, this I really wanted to bring attention to that cutscene because, like, Whenever I was playing through this remake, this cutscene made me so fascinated by what they were doing with Luis this time around. Because, like, they they set him up at the start. They take away that whole cop backstory that's no longer a part of his character. He used to work for Umbrella. And now, after surviving that village sequence with him, suddenly he knows exactly what a Plaga is. He knows how to surgically remove one and did it, like, himself. And the moment Leon tries prying any further on why he would even help him... He just immediately dismisses the question with a super vague answer. Like, so fucking good. I was so hooked on Luis's character. I wanted to know everything about him in this game. Static um, Soul donates $5 and says, Pastra, are you kind of jealous how good the remake of RE4 is compared to how poorly RE4 was, RE3 was remade? Since you have more of a connection to 3 than 4. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm really jealous. <laughs> I feel really lucky, personally. <laughs> Yeah, like no shit, really like, really good. oh yeah, my my favorite out of like the original Resident Evil games was remade and it was the only remake that was actually fucking garbage. Yeah, am I a little jealous? Am I a little? I mean, am I a little I jealous that the only modern interpretation of my favorite original Resident Evil game is the only one that's dog shit? And mine is the best one. I feel really Congrats! lucky. Congrats! <laughs> I mean, I kind of wish all of them were good. But, you know... Oh, I'm fine with this outcome. Also... Guess who's back? Look at that okay. ass hair. The bitch. Got a smoke? The bitch in the red dress! Yeah! Now where's the amber? She looks so much better here. But she sounds so much worse. Oh, yeah, I yeah, was yeah. gonna say, she looks better, but her voice acting is... <laughs> So, Don't remind me of that. Ada, like we said back like fucking three hours ago, is alive and is working for someone, infiltrating the Spanish village to get a sample of the Plaga. Uh, for those that don't understand why we made fun of her voice, uh, she has a new voice actress compared to Resident Evil 2. Resident Evil 2's remakes, uh, Ada was perfect, and the actress didn't come back for the remake. They got a different voice actress that is actually the actor, actress for Ada in Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City, which is a fucking movie that came out and nobody liked. And she and does it, a good job in that movie, but in here she does a piss poor fucking job at it. 
That's my job. That's my job. Well, that other one's pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> it, it's different from the older Resident Evil bad voice acting, which was fucking iconic, because it just she just sounds bored and that she's just phoning it in. I think that she actually did try, but the script told her that she had to sound like dejected and distant. But the way that she tried to do that is just ugh, I don't yeah. like it at all. Yeah, wow. like it, whether it's the actress or just the like the the, the directing, there is just something about the way Ada's done in this game where her voice is just not it. Yeah, but that's the, the actual writing of. That's the only yeah, that thing. Gonna... Yeah, that's the thing. The actual writing of Ada in this game is Whoop. great. Um, her involvement in the story is great. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, Luis Luis is working with Ada though. Um, and they have some kind of arrangement where. He provides her with some kind of sample of the Plaga for the mysterious person she's working for this time. We actually have an identity, by the way, of it. It's not the rival company to Los Illuminados. Um, yeah. We actually have a person she's working for this time. But yeah, um, Luis can get her a sample of it. Then Luis is able to go free. Um, which is like a main motivator. But yeah, after after that meetup where they're given their incentive, yeah, uh, friggin' Big Cheese Mendez, who has a hat now. Um, <laughs> I love this detail, by the way, because th this is a like a design detail that carries over from the remake. In Resident Evil 2 Remake, one of the design decisions of the remake is Capcom decided to give Mr. X a hat. Like, before mm -hmm. he was bald in the original, he, he, like they gave him a hat to like go incognito, I guess, even though he's like a two-foot... Like a, like a fucking two meter tall fucking monster, whatever. So, in that game, you can shoot the, the hat off. And now, in Resident Evil 4 Remake, because the, because the tyrant of Resident Evil 2 had a hat, they decided to give Mr. X also a hat. Because they, because the thematic connection here is that Vitoris Mendes is like, based off of, or like, inspired off of the tyrants of Resident Evil 2. I don't think, like, there's an actual logical connection there, but, like, the thematic element of him being, like, the Plaga's version of a tyrant is still carried over in the remake. I really love that detail. Yeah, it's really fucking cool. Um, and speaking of him, we get to the end of the village sequence after that friggin', like, crazy-ass chase you go through with him, and he attacks Leon in this friggin', like, barn? And we get one of my favorite designs in the entire series coming up here because as the two of them are like trapped in this place together, Leon realizes, yeah, shit, bullets ain't gonna work. So instead he decides to kick this flaming barrel towards him to try and blow him up. He's gonna say, and as, hmm? let's say. He's so fucking cool. I love this guy. To crush your enemies. Some bitch. Ashley, run! Okay. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. <laughs> yeah, there's this. Yeah. So then we get this fucking design, which I love so much. The centipede plaga. I love it so much how his friggin' spinal cord gets replaced with like the plaga that looks like a centipede. It's so fucking cool. Um, so we get this fucking fight scene. Uh, we get this fucking boss fight where you fight him in a flaming barn as the whole thing is like erupting in more fire. All the while he's throwing flaming tanks and explosive barrels and Leon's saying shit like, looks like your tap dancing days are over. <laughs> it's my favorite line from him in this game. Um, so yeah, uh, Village Chief is dead. And, you know, you're probably thinking, okay, you know, <laughs> random village in the middle uh, in the middle of Spain. That's pretty, that's pretty crazy for a Resident Evil game. Surely it can't get any more campy than this. Surely they won't go to a fucking medieval castle in the middle of nowhere that is being ruled over by a tiny freak with a Napoleon complex who also happens to have two xenomorph bodyguards. They would never do that. Come on. The second sec main section of Resident Evil 4 is a fucking old ass Spaniard castle. <laughs> you go into a giant castle 
that is ruled over by this fuck, who is my favorite villain in the entire game, by the way. You get fucking introduced to this guy. To my castle. Such a pleasure to finally make your acquaintance, Mr. Kennedy. What a fucking gremlin. You? Me? Oh, please, call me Ramon. And allow me to get straight to the point. I love his new voice actor. I would like you to hand it He's so... Over to even. Isn't yeah. it the same voice actor? Yeah, fat chance, Ramon. The girl's just fine. You mean with me? From my I don't think so. I thought it was the same person. No. It's no way. Oh yeah, he has two big ass Verdugo bodyguards. Girl must be ours. With a girl as the very source. Your United States and then the entire world. For that is the iron will of my master, the most holy. Lord Sadler. So then you will comply. Yes? Never. You are the lady. How unfortunate. Do make sure our guest feels at home now that he has chosen death. <laughs> what a fucking guy. So, I I love this villain and I love this entire area. The castle's my favorite part of Resident Evil 4 because the actual world building with the Salazar family and the purpose of this castle is so incredibly interesting to me. Cause like, you know, when we go to the village, when we go to the village, we we kind of just get like a basic understanding of the Plaga. We know that it's this parasite that when implanted into uh, some kind of like living organism becomes part of this hive mind that Lord Sadler has control over. And they planted one inside of like Leon and Ashley. But it's at, at the castle where we start to sort of understand like the background of the Plaga and like the sort of history of the Salazar family and what they did about it. Because there was a point in time where the Plaga was actually, like, sealed away and controlled by this family who wanted to stop it from, like, you know, spreading and taking control of people for this very purpose. Um, and, like, the Salazar family had a bunch of different methods by which they sealed away the Plaga. Like, for example, uh, a lot of the time in this castle, you'll see blue torches. Blue torches and blue fire. And when the Plaga are exposed to these, like, blue torches, you'd see that, um, you know, they freeze up in place. Um, I don't, I don't remember how they fucking made blue fire torches, but I just know that, like, the Salazar family created those to contain the Plaga and stop it from causing any more harm. It is legitimately never explained why that fire makes them stop in place. It's never even explained, like, what it is. Yup. Apparently, also the merchant has said, oh, by the way, this game has a merchant, which is a guy that sells you weaponry that is around, I guess. I love him. He's my favorite character in the game. Uh, the merchant is just um, some guy in a hood that goes around the different areas of the game and sells you weaponry. Never question why he's there. He's just a cool guy. Everyone loves the merchant. He also has a pirate merchants. hyperfixation. Yeah, he's a pirate. He... There is no backstory to him. He just has a pirate accent and has like a shooting gallery, like a, like a pirate themed shooting gallery. And he just sells you weapons and he's super, super fucking cool. He's not part of the lore. Like, I, I know there's like a stream about the lore. Uh, the merchant doesn't, doesn't have any lore. He's like part of the mechanics of the game, but he's cool. And I, I like know, him. He's, he's, <laughs> he has no involvement in the actual story, but he's my favorite character in Resident Evil 4. I yep. love him so much. Uh, the Average um, Crusader super chats five Canadian dollars and says, important question. No thanks, bro, or yeah, fat chance, Ramon. Which one do you like more? No thanks, bro. <laughs> you know, that also just like reminds me while I'm talking about friggin' Ramon and the Salazar family. I think one of my favorite things about like Salazar as a villain is the fact that like, He's always talking to Leon and Ashley over these like speakers, acting all evil and nefarious. But every single time Leon and Ashley talk back or talk about him, they're like, God, this guy's cringe. It's like, he's so, he's a fucking asshole. They don't take him seriously they're at all. so annoyed at Salazar. And not they, only they that, just... but everyone fucking hates Salazar because in the story of the Salazar family, they were supposed to be the heroes of this 
Spanish territory. Like, the, yeah. the Salazar family and the Salazar castle was once a place where, like, the people were supposed to be, like, held... They were held up as heroes for essentially beating back the Plaga and, like, helping this essentially... Like, they... Back in the 1700s, the Salazar family, with fucking swords and spears, managed to beat back the Plaga, which is an alien fucking parasite that mutates people and, like, makes them into, like, a hive mind. They managed to beat that with fucking swords and sticks, and sealed them underneath, deep in the caverns of Salazar Castle. What the fuck?! Imagine a, yeah. a, 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 a like a medieval Resident Evil game taking place where they have just swords and sticks to kill these alien parasites and they're so fuck the Salazar family was so fucking badass that they managed to do that. Then over the decades the bloodline starts to fucking like go a little bit corrupt and eventually you go from really cool guys that make really cool puzzles because they 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 they, are, they made the castle fill with like puzzles and traps because of course they did and they get to eventually uh members of the Salazar family that start torturing people and like uh trying to control the whole area with uh, with an iron fist they start going into like they start like actually Getting into like the the religion of the whole area, which is Los Illuminados, that wants to actually resurrect the plagas that they themselves beat back, and then finally you have Ramon Salazar, the latest in the Salazar family, which is an abject piece of shit little goblin, fucking twenty year old like little guy, that completely bought on the bullshit that the pla that the Los Illuminados was like peddling, and Salazar finally allowed the cult entry inside of the Salazar castle, and they managed to get and free up the Plagas from the castle. Piece of shit, which, Ramon Salazar! Nobody which, liked him! <laughs> yeah, adding on to that, the, the reason why Salazar even ended up falling into that, it wasn't even for any, like, legitimately good reason. It was just because he had such a fucking fragile ego and was so full of himself that the second Lord Sadler appealed to his ego and pride in any way and made him feel important, he fucking just, like, crumbled and just let him in. Yeah. Like, Salazar is such a, like, sad piece of shit, and he's also responsible for essentially everything that's happening in this game, because Sadler wouldn't have the power he does if not for Salazar being such a pathetic little piece of shit. And I also, know. in the middle of this, we get finally the reunion of a lifetime. Oh yeah, right. While Leon is exploring right the castle. Leon. Would it make me use this? Would you? Ada! Well, after six years, that is one hell of a greeting. Ada. You don't seem surprised. Interesting. Damn. Try using knives next time. Better for close encounters. She likes Not that. A bad move. Very smooth. So who are you working for this time? Oh, Leon. You know I don't work in town. So bad. <laughs> <laughs> Leave the girl. She's lost no matter what. You walk away now. And who knows? Maybe you'll live to meet me again. And then I might get you that greeting you were looking for. Ooh! You think I'm gonna give up? Hey, <laughs> yo! Yeah. Right. How about we continue this discussion another time? If only the uh, the fucking remake two VA came back. Mm -hmm. Oh well. So yeah, now Ada is involved and Leon knows. And he, I like it how he just like is not even surprised at all. He does not give a shit. He's cynical. Mm -hmm. He's jaded. The cop inside him died that day. Exactly. <laughs> he has no reason to care anymore. <laughs> and okay, okay. One thing I will say, when, uh, since like I feel like. 
people in chat have already seen it. And also like, it's a big part of the Salazar castle. I don't really know much about the friggin' like black liquid that Salazar was experimenting with in this castle. If I'm oh, being yeah, real. Yeah. Oh, this, I'm not very well this, versed fucking, in it. this fucking thing. Cause I know, I know that it was very like integral to a lot of the stuff that we see later on because like it gets used on Ashley. It was used to create the Novisadors. I actually don't know much about it though. Mm -hmm. I think that that's just Plaga's ca caviar. Like that's just a bunch of eggs crunched up into water or some shit. I don't really know myself, but yeah, they don't really explain a lot about it. About it's some that. weird cultish ritual that Los Illuminados like made. Like Ashley is supposed to be have kidnapped, and then she got infected with the plagas, and then after that, she was taken to the castle so that like a weird ritual would happen, so that she was. I guess better able to receive the plagas into her body, even though she was already infected. I don't know. They just force a weird black liquid into her mouth for some reason, and it doesn't seem to do I, anything. What right. I assume that was is that it just like speeds up the process of the infection. Either That's speeds what? it yeah. up, or it gives her the ability to be like, you know, like kind of like Vitoris Mendes or like Ramon Salazar, like it gives her like a little bit more power or something. I don't know. Yeah, because right. I'm, I'm seeing people in chat saying that it like, it's used to like accelerate the uh, like, it's used to like accelerate the Plaga or it's used to like incubate them. The only, the only reason I'm asking is because I want to talk about the Novistadors really, really, really bad. Oh, and I know they're literally yeah. created using them because, okay, I don't know if I've ever talked about this. The Novistadors are like literally my favorite, like, like, if we're, if we're not talking, like, stalker enemies or, like, named monsters where there's just, like, oh, there's just the one. The Novisadors are, like, my favorite basic enemy in the entire franchise. These guys are so annoying. Like, I find, I find the Novisadors to be, like, so legitimately scary and interesting whenever you, like, learn about, like, how they're created and their anatomy and whatnot. Essentially. Because, okay. uh, yeah, you go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Okay, so... Basically, that black that black liquid that we were seeing earlier that I was asking about, the Novistadors are these like special creatures that were created by this one um, by this one scientist who used to work for Salazar. Um, and I'm trying to remember his name because he's really fucking important. Um, Let's see. Uh, he was called uh, Iberdugo. Hold on a second. Is this the story of Resident Evil 4 original? Yep, there. In the original, the Verdugo doesn't don't really have like a fucking name. Hold on. Why am I getting Spanish results? I mean, I guess the Hold game on. takes place in Spain. Sorry for. I know his name started with like a U. Um. Oh, hey, David Barron. Thank you for coming in and checking up on us. <laughs> We've been going for a while. Is it what? Isidro Uriarte? Oh, yeah! Isidro. Isidro. So, um, I don't know if I can pronounce that name, but there was a scientist. Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. There was a scientist who was working for Salazar and was extremely devout to the cult. And it was his intention to essentially create a new species through the Plaga that would impress Lord Sadler as well as Salazar. And through his experiments, he essentially conducted this one experiment where he would take women that were part of the cult who were pregnant, and he would have them consume the black liquid that we saw and, ah. effect and effectively like infect their like unborn children with like the Plaga before yeah. they were even born. And those women would give birth to creatures called Novistadors. Which are just and giant ass bog monsters that also have camouflaging capabilities for some reason and build nests and shit. And the, the really freaky thing about them that I love so much, Novistadors are insectoid creatures that have all those abilities, but they have human anatomy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So these creatures, they are these giant, like, four-legged insects. They fly around, they have the ability to camouflage, they can jump out at you. But the thing is, there was a friggin' piece of concept art that showcased how their actual biology works. 
And because they are born from human, like, mothers, mm -hmm. their entire skeletal structure and anatomy is a contorted human body that has been reshaped into an insect's, like, Ooh. shape. So, like, I can see if I can get the drawing. But, like, the, the, the for example, their head, the actual stalks where their antenna come out of, that is an upside down human skull and the antenna are coming out of the eye sockets. I've never um, noticed this. Hold on, I can get no, you the picture. I will They're, show it the, off the, on the, the shells, the shells that go around their wings, those are contorted human rib cages that are moving outward to protect the wings. Um, their forelegs are friggin' contorted human arms that are stretched out uh, to create these insect legs. And they've even got these tiny little nubs that stick out of the back of their torso. And those are supposed to be what, like th that. Those are supposed to be like what the human legs would have been if they were born human. So essentially, the entire anatomy of a novistador is just an upside, like a human corpse lying on its back that is just trapped inside of this insect's body. Fuck yeah. And it is so fucking creepy. Yeah, yeah. Look, look. Um, hold on, hold on. This picture is really tiny. I can get a higher res version of it. In the um, meantime. Uh, after also the creation of the Novistadors in the Resident Evil 4 remake, it is also revealed that Isidro went so crazy for the devotion to Los Illuminados that not only did he create an entirely new species of creatures to impress Lord Sadler and Salazar, but also he decided to go one step beyond... Uh, hold on. Yep. These yeah. are the concept art for... The bugs, Novistadors. So yeah, you'll Ew. notice the antenna oh. are coming out of human eye sockets. The friggin' shells on the wings are a human rib cage. The little nubs on the back are human legs, and the ar and the friggin' forearms are like actual con con like contorted human arms. That's fucking cool. I didn't oh. give the, or the I didn't give the remakes design enough credit. That's I awesome. I love the Novistador so much. Like I've already, I've always loved insectoid monsters, but the fact that they have human anatomy is so fucking scary. They were just babies born into a, born with the plague as already infected, already infected. So they, instead of becoming just a mindless husk of a human being following orders, they just became their own different kind of species created by this one scientist. Yeah, and the thing I find so interesting about that too, and you, you were getting into it, is that like, the scientist, this scientist who created them, created them to show his devotion to Lord Sadler. And we see throughout the game, and it even gets brought up, that the Novistadors, Sadler took such a strong liking to the Novistadors because of like, the supposed purity that they had being born of Plaga, that like, they became his like henchmen. Anytime we see Sadler with like any minions, it's the Novistadors that swarm around him because he views them as being like these pure creatures born of Plaga blood. A combination and between human nice and Plaga. Sense. That yeah. because the Plagas usually are parasites, you know? They are mm -hmm. they are they rely on humans to be able to continue living and reproduce. But the Novistadors are just creatures that can live on their own without a host. They are a combination of human and, like, Plaga born from the womb, which means that they don't need a host to feed themselves off of. They can just be the bog monsters that, like, Sadler always wanted. And yeah, because they were born with the DNA of Plaga, they are inherently a part of his hive mind from birth. Eventually... Like, they are the perfect minions. Uh, do we talk? Can you talk about the Verdugo? Fuck it. You yeah, talk uh, about the Verdugo. Yeah. So this this freaking scientist, he uh, he he took very very well to um, he took very very well to Sadler taking such a strong liking of his work, to the point that eventually he was actually chosen. Oh my God! Here's the note that actually talks about it. Um. Yeah, literally, uh, nine years since my awakening upon the release of this vow, black liquid shall enter. Oh, Hold oh on. bring it back, bring it back. Hold on. I'm just gonna... Yeah, let's just read it. Yeah, it's, it's right here. I figured it may as well be easier. Yeah, this is uh, the laboratory where the Novistadors were created inside of the castle, by the way. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, 
Nine years since my awakening, upon the release of this valve, black liquid shall enter my veins and circulate through my entire body. Oh my god, this person reads them so fast. How they do so that? fucking fast. <laughs> Let me be pause. dramatic. All right, I'll just I'll just pause. <laughs> Leon, uh, like constantly getting like sprung with fucking like ice cold water. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Upon the release of this valve, black liquid shall enter my veins and circulate through my entire body. I expect this will be the most painful experience of my life. Fucking masochist. I await the trial with great anticipation. It's an honor to suffer through the holy labor of rebirth. The next time I, re I awaken, it will be as a true servant of Master Ramon. And... Why did he go back? Why did he go back? He's rereading the thing. Yeah, bro, realized he was being too fast. Uh-huh. Uh. There we go. I, oh, please, some, someone else read the name. I, I, there we go. <laughs> I, I could never read that shit, I'm too white. Uh, make this vow. I will surpass the limitations Sorry? of man and become a true servant of God. I will find the heretics and serve as their executioner, their verdugo. And I this, love this note so much. crazy motherfucker actually managed to successfully pull off what trillions of dollars in research from an American company could never fucking do, which is actually successfully turned himself into a super mega super warrior species thing. The Verdugo is like nigh invulnerable? Pretty much, it is one of the best bio weapons ever in the existence of Resident Evil, which is so fucking funny because Umbrella has been spending so much time and test subjects creating their tyrants. Meanwhile, a fucking like bug in the middle of the Spain gets unearthed, and a fucking scientist finds it and goes like, "Ooh, me likey! I'm gonna make this into a black liquid lemonade, and I'm gonna fucking pour it on myself." And then this fucking thing comes out of it. Yep. And this was only like this was only the second of three experiments he did. Every single one of his experiments created something insane. Honestly, I think turning him into a friggin' monster was actually a waste on the cult's part, because everything he made was terrifying. Not even that, because, like, you gotta understand, Isidro, even though he is a monster right now and is chasing Leon and is trying to kill him and all that, he still is 100% conscious in there, and he doesn't even feel pain. He is just a Superman right now. He is completely conscious. Obviously, he's still crazy and he still follows the cult, because, you know, he's a crazy person, but Isidro did what many in the Umbrella Corporation desperately tried to do, become a super mega ultimate bioweapon while retaining their full consciousness. And he didn't even have to sit in a vat for 10 fucking years. Yo. Also, this player is a <laughs> pussy. Yep, you're supposed to kill him. Kill him, asshole. Don't run away. <laughs> pussy. But yeah, uh, I just find it so hilarious that, like, the escalation in, like, threat level from Resident Evil got to the point where after, like, Umbrella look like the biggest chumps ever now. Because after they died, after they go bankrupt, in pops up fucking Lord Sadler and, like, his associates from Los Illuminados, who make the creepiest, most scariest, most functional bioweapons in the entirety of the franchise, and they do it by essentially grabbing a fucking bug and injecting it into a person in a weird way. And they just it pops up like a like a like a brand new bioweapon baby out of it. It's so ridiculous. And, if, and then you think Los Illuminados is bad. When you get later in the series, it's like umbrella. After hundreds upon hundreds of trials, finally we created a monster that's capable of regenerating. Some old guy <laughs> in Louisiana. Yeah, some old guy in Louisiana who just fucking shoots himself in the head just for fun. Like, the, the, like, the power escalation of viruses in the Resident Evil series is fucking ridiculous. And it just makes Umbrella look like idiots. And it gets I to know. the point in Resident Evil 8, I'm not gonna spoil it, we're gonna get to there no. in the next stream. But yeah. it gets to the point where it retroactively makes Oswell E. Spencer look like such a f such a prick, like such a dumbass. Such a fucking dumbass. 
Like, when oh we get to God. him, Jack Baker makes both, like, Los Illuminados and Umbrella so much funnier to me just by existing. It just... You, you know, the, like, the end of Resident Evil 4, you know, like, the island and, you know, the labs of the island? Like, they look, like, dingy, piece of shit, wasteful, completely horrible locations to work at. Like, Isidro worked in a goddamn sewer, again. But that's, this- That's the other thing. Like, these- these scientists that are creating these horrifying monsters for the cult, th th the labs they're working in are so bad by dingy, comparison to what- Dingy, disgusting! Like, they're, like, they're actual just, like, borderline meth labs. Like, like, they like are Umbrella working in such disgusting has the conditions. Nest. Umbrella has the nest. They have like sentient AI controlling all the different parts of their super research bases. And they have like they these- They have nest too. They have nest too. They have like <laughs> like a proper test tubes. They have like super clean environment with like cafeterias and pizza and giant chasms that lead to like infinite drops into nothingness. And then after all that fucking government budget was wasted, in comes once again, Isidro here, working off a fucking meth lab to create something that Umbrella could never in their fucking dreams achieve. Fuck! <laughs> yeah, like, I find it so interesting that this character, we never actually see him aside from, you know, him as the Verdugo, and yet he's one of the most fascinating scientist characters in, like, the whole series purely just because of the shit he made. <laughs> Awesome. Also, thank you, Sapphire Jade, for the $10. Good evening, Phil Impostor. I hope your day has been well. Had a great time at our MTG event. Great to see Resident Evil come up on here and give me inspiration for my art and writing. Let's go! Hell yeah, thank Let's you. Let's go, that's awesome. Anyways, moving oh. on from Isidro. Yeah, um, actually getting into what was happening there, too, because we were talking about the friggin', like, lore of, like, the backstory and everything, but... Yeah, so Leon ends up walking in on Ashley being, like, force-fed that black liquid from before to, I guess, accelerate her infection and connection to the cult. That's what I assume is going on here. She's um, not turning into a bug, so whatever. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, Ramon is essentially trying to speed up the process of her getting infected for the cult. Um, because, I mean, like he said it himself earlier, the entire point of this operation is that they intend on fully infecting Ashley. And once she's fully become committed to this cult and is a part of their hive mind, they intend on sending her back to America so that she can then infect the entirety of the United States and the cult can spread globally. Oh yeah, um, I forgot. Resident Evil 4 is the stupidest, most like villain plot ever. It's like, yeah, we're literally gonna take over the world. Yeah, we're gonna take over the what? world with our evil alien parasites. What? <laughs> I mean, they had a more of a chance that fucking Umbrella. They actually had real. a chance though. Yeah. And like, somehow- like, This is, is so least. Looney Tunes. And yet somehow the villain plot of the next game is even more Looney Tunes. Oh, like what? Like it, it's so fascinating because Resident Evil 4 as a story is so separated from the rest of the Resident Evil canon. Like, like the rest, the Resident Evil main universe is all about like corporations and backstabbing and like like double crossing and spies and like paramilitary groups and like pharmaceutical companies that are covering up their tracks and stuff like that. But Resident Evil 4 is like a fucking like adventure game. Where like the superhero and like the superhero knight in shining armor is going around Spain liberating the president's daughter from a fucking alien invasion, and then once the plot of Resident Evil Four resolves, then the rest of the Resident Evil universe has to react to that. They have to go. Oh wait, what's going on over here? There's some fucking alien parasites. Fucking yoink and grabs the Plagas and goes, okay, now you're part of our world now. And they integrate the Plagas into the story of the other Resident Evil games. And then just shit goes off the rails after that. Cause they, mm -hmm. now that they have the Plagas, they can just make whatever the fuck. They can, they, 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 they can make the stupidest bioweapons imaginable now. And you know what I think about a lot with that too? Like the Raccoon City incident was like, you know, the biggest moment in like, re history yes. in like this universe a million 911s could you imagine what it would have been like for everyone in the resident evil universe 
once it got found out that some cult was planning to take over the world with aliens. That that, that was kept a secret because like, the, the, Leon ki killed it. Leon fucking nailed this operation all by himself. But like, imagine after the Raccoon City incident, like Leon dies in the Raccoon City incident and then it secretly like the thing from John Carpenter's The Thing starts like taking over everyone in the entire world. Like the rest evil Earth is a nightmare to live in. If these super powered yeah, like badass characters weren't here, the entire world would be like a fucking like Cronenberg like nightmare fucking apocalyptic world. Yeah, and that's not even getting into the amount of times America's been bombed like, Several in times. this universe. Or fucking Terra Grigia, which we're gonna talk about in next week's lore stream. Oh, <laughs> my god. I genuinely think all the people in this chat... I genuinely think all the people in this chat who were freaking out over the lore of, like, every other game we've talked about up to this point are actually not going to believe us when we get to that. I get genuinely don't think they're right. gonna believe us. Because they haven't played Revelations. If you haven't played Revelations, you will not believe the plot of Revelations is real. I, I wholeheartedly believe that. I understand that we. I understand that we're talking about aliens taking over the Earth right now, but it's still does. It's still not as stupid as this fucking series can get. I promise you. I haven't. It is actually tame by comparison. Anyways, hey Sci-Fi yeah. Jade, thank you for the five dollars. <laughs> no, you Side should, tangent of a... You should not play uh, Revelations, by the way, because it's not really that good of a game. It's just get, getting the plot synopsis is good enough, in my opinion, Nick. Yeah, mm, I okay. agree. Like, Revelations has crazy-ass lore, and that's, like, the main appeal of it. Uh, Sapphire uh, Jade donates $5 and says, Phil and Co, odd question. Do you think that the Plagas are aliens? They do look like aliens from another world. No, I'm convinced. Like, there's no fucking doubt in my mind. Because, like, one, they do look like aliens, and two, in the original Resident Evil 4, it's just straight up said that they came from a fucking meteorite, and they, All like, right. inf infected fucking dinosaurs and shit, and then mm. eventually, like, they got, they, they, like, like, in the, in the millions of years of Earth's evolution, they were, they had to be pushed back, and they, they, they hibernated into these little fossil thingies that got, like, like, put into the Earth. And then the Salazar family, like, dug them up, like, centuries, centuries later. So, like, yeah, they're 100% space aliens. And you can't say otherwise, because where the fuck else do they come from? Mm, yeah. They, they came from the like, ground. Yeah. They dug them up. I mean, there's yep. also, like, the fucking Mutamycete, which I guess is from Earth, but it's also fucking around in Europe, causing shit at this time. Oh, my God. <laughs> Shout out to Europe. Europe! <laughs> Just, okay, you know what? Fuck it. Resident Evil 9, we need to nuke Europe. Yeah. Off yeah, the map! <laughs> the entirety of Europe. <laughs> Not only- Honestly. Okay, Zach, is it, isn't the parasite that Nemesis, like, has, like, makes Nemesis Nemesis, also coming from fucking Europe? I believe yeah. so, yes. It was a parasite they, like, originally got from Europe and experimented on to create the Nemesis Alpha. So, like, just delete Europe off the map. Lewis was, like, speculated to, to be involved in that, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Lewis and the Resident Evil 4 remake is part of Umbrella's European Research Division, which is also connected to Nemesis and Resident Evil 3 because... Nemesis was a product of Umbrella's French research team. So, mm -hmm. because, you know, Louise is from Europe, and Nemesis was created from a parasite that they got from France, therefore, it is speculated that Louise was part of the research team that created the Nemesis, which neatly oh, yeah. ties the, the, this character into the rest of the universe, which is very nice. Yeah, I, I don't even think it's, like, theorized. I think it's just downright confirmed because right. the photo that we see of Luis that shows him with the other Umbrella staff, it specifies what district he was in. Mm -hmm. And that district is the exact same one that Resident Evil 3 said Nemesis came from. Oh, that's perfect. That's absolutely Aww. perfect then. So Excellent. it outright confirms that Luis was on the team that created the Nemesis, which makes so much sense because he has experience with parasites. Yeah. Right. Also, uh, I love chat saying like, yes, 
the French. This makes sense. <laughs> Nemesis is French. This makes oh, sense to that me. That makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah, don't you guys remember whenever he chases you around and goes, ho, 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 stop. Wee, wee, yeah. Me listening to this, not knowing Resident Evil lore at all. Dude, if you came into this stream trying to understand Resident Evil lore and you're just like in the middle of it, and you haven't been with us the entire uh, time, we sound like uh, fucking crazy fun. people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're not gonna get anything now. It's been it's seven out. hours! Oh, oh. Like, if you wanna watch the next stream, you're gonna have to do your homework and watch this whole stream. Dude. From the beginning. Dude. Alright. Uh, okay, so Krauser now. Oh shit. Zach. Shout out to the people. Sorry, sorry. I was just gonna say shout out to the people in chat saying, ooh, French. My family's French Canadian. Chat, come <laughs> on. Don't be mean. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, from Res Resident Evil 9 Apocalypse takes place dur in the entirety of Europe, and at the end, they just nuke Europe to make sure that no other fucking weird parasites come about. Yeah. Genuinely, yeah. Okay, but yeah. Um, so, long story short, uh, Pastor outing himself like that, shut the fuck up. <laughs> but, um, so, Ashley is friggin' forced to drink that black liquid. Uh, Leon, uh, friggin' kills the Verdugo if you're not a coward. And, um, it's here where we get introduced to, like, I don't want to say the, I don't want to say the friggin', like, real main villain of this game, because it's still Sadler, but, like, the twist villain of this game. Dun, dun, um, dun. Which, it's not really a twist, because we don't really know who this character is. Major this game, Krauser! Jack Krauser! Our, yeah, oh, yeah, Major they, Krauser, funny. the one responsible for pretty much this entire game's plot because the thing is obviously we've known from the start of the game that you know this cult kidnapped the, pre the the president's daughter but they never really explain how up until this point um whenever we get introduced to krauser we learn that we we, we learn how she was taken because krauser used to be a soldier that worked for the military. He was specifically the soldier that was responsible for training Leon, yes. which yes. Thank, the, uh, thank you to the remake for actually showing that in the flashback so we at least have an idea of who this guy is before he gets introduced as the villain. In um, the original Resident Evil 4, Krauser shows up in the middle of, like, on the further end of the story, and, like, Leon <laughs> goes, Krauser, you're here. I can't believe you survived Operation <laughs> Javier. And like everyone in the fucking, <laughs> everyone playing the game is like, who? What? Yeah. What? <laughs> Actually, uh, I remember back when I played that game for the first time, I DM'd Phil about it. Like, hey, do you know who this guy is? And he just said, nope. He he, he first appears in this game. Yeah, that's the first appearance uh, on like what Major the Krauser. It's yeah. to me like, Krauser in Resident Evil 4 feels like the equivalent of Code Veronica releasing with Wesker in it as a villain, but Resident Evil 1 doesn't exist. Yep. Yep. Like, yeah. like that's basically how Krauser's introduced. Is that how it's, that's how it feels. Um, but I digress. Krauser is introduced as the like big bad guy who was responsible for Ashley kidnapping. And he used to be a member of the military that trained uh, Leon until a military operation he was sent on called Operation Javier where essentially him and his squad was just sent to die. Um, they were sent into this friggin' like battlefield. I don't remember who they were fighting. I just remember it was a big bad operation. Um, mm -hmm. And essentially his entire squad was abandoned. They were left to die. And he watched every single person he cared about die being the only survivor. And after that happened, Krauser basically snapped really, really bad and basically realized that the only reason he survived and the thing that wiped out all those people and resulted in his trauma was, you know, the fact that they were just overwhelmed by a greater power than what they had. And so, so he needs like more a fucking power. Exactly, like a fucking <laughs> anime villain, he just decided that he needs to ally himself with whoever has the most power that can be offered to him, and he needs to become the most powerful super soldier that's ever existed. So Krauser was offered this power by the cult through the Plaga and in return for them giving him this power, he had to essentially help them kidnap the president's daughter so that they could spread their influence globally. 
So he helps them take over the world. He gets to be extremely powerful in this new world order they create. Uh, plot of the plot of the game happens. Um, I also would like to bring up the way he's introduced, which is like one of the saddest scenes in the entire game. Yep. Uh, Here we go. Because oh. yeah, let's just let this play out. Oh. Oh yeah, before this point, by the way, uh, Leon and Luisa are go in a fucking minecart. Like a minecart yeah. ride all throughout the caves of the Los Illuminados because this game is fucking Looney Tunes. Mm -hmm. And after that, the most emotional scene in the game. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like... <laughs> Somehow this game managed to OMG. be even the more Lord goofy Kennedy than the original. So good, LOL. Uh. Allies to enemies trip is heartbreaking and cruel daunt. Thank you, Sapphire J, for the five dollars. <sighs> Literally an emotional roller coaster. Too bad I even I even have like a sad sprite, so I'm stuck here with fucking popcorn. I don't get you. Why risk your life like this? You don't know us. I told you. It. Makes me feel better. Be straight with me for once. Los Illuminados. I was working for them. See, there you go. Helping the two of you doesn't make up for it. I know that. But still, I don't want anyone else to get hurt. In that case, you better get serious. <laughs> Harsh words for a squire. Out of that hell! Fresh air is calling our names. Por fin! Por fin! Gus, if we made it all this way, you know it means we're almost. <coughs> almost what? <coughs> Louis! <coughs> Long time no see. Major Krauser? What the hell? Yeah, what the fuck? Why? Recovering stolen goods. And killing a few rats along the way. That's Easy a really work. big knife. No, that's a knife. It was you. Get you quick. Didn't I teach you? Knives are faster. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually our, the real way people with actual knife training fight, but it just looks yep. ridiculous. <sighs> Thank God I say slowly is asleep. All right, so yeah, that's the, Krauser. Yeah, the way he gets introduced is friggin' heartbreaking. Um, Just killing off Louise actually, with best characters after his redemption arc. And actually, yeah. now that we're talking about Krauser and we've gotten to the scene, can we real quick skip forward to when we get to hear Louise's last words? Because, like, genuinely, the stuff that Louise says before dying and, like, the way it, like, the way it perfectly showcases the theme of the story is, like, my favorite part of RE4. Yep. So yeah, they just fight a little bit. They do a little slappy fight. Me, 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 me. And after all that is over, this player oh, chat shit talking sucks. the gameplay. Unforgivable. But that doesn't give you the right to hurt innocent people. This guy sucks so much. The player. Well then. <laughs> there we go. Enough play, rookie. You haven't changed a damn bit. <laughs> what a disappointment. <laughs> there we go. 
looking good, eh, my friend? And such a loss to the ladies of the world. Don't talk. Take this. The key to my laboratory. Go there and remove those damn parasites. <coughs> Help <coughs> Ashley. Yeah, so I I genuinely think like I think Luis's death is actually just the best scene in the remake because those last mm -hmm. words, that friggin' last line of people can change, right? Oh, that literally so to hard. me sums up the entire game's like story with its characters. Yeah. Because when you think about it, that single line, obviously it's supposed to be Luis is seeking validation from Leon in those final moments, basically asking him like, "Do you think I've changed?" Well, like it actually summarizes essentially every single major character in this entire game because it applies to Luis because Luis was a bad person who went through a redemption arc and became better. It applies to Krauser, who is the opposite. He was a good person that went mad with power and mm -hmm. turned evil. It applies to Leon because the entire game, he's convinced himself he's a different person. He's not a hero anymore, but he's actually the same person he always was. And it applies to Ada, who is the opposite of Leon, because Ada spends the entire campaign thinking, I don't care about anybody. But at the end, spoiler alert, she ends up doing the right thing. Oh. So that one line, that one single line before he dies, people can change, right? It applies to every single major character in Resident Evil 4 because they all go through their own unique story arcs that parallel the characters yeah. that are like opposite to them. Even in the it trailer. To Ashley. Oh yeah, Ashley getting more, Ashley more badass as she Ashley goes along in the adventure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Ashley starts out as this sort of coward that just wants to get away. But as she goes through it, she becomes more confident from her time with Leon. Her and Leon get better as a result of being around each other. She even so, like, says again, that she wants to become a, like an agent to protect yeah. the U.S. after the end of That's the fucking so story. Cute. It's yeah. super cute. Yeah, so like every, every major character that is involved in Resident Evil 4's story, the main thing with this game is that they all go through some kind of like major change in some way, whether it be for better or for worse. And like... When, when it comes to the end of Krauser's arc, I feel like Luis's last words hit really hard because the entirety of Krauser's arc in the story too is Leon realizing he's not the same guy anymore and that he needs to kill him. Resident Evil 4, like the trailers for this remake that came out, emphasized Leon saying, this time, things have to be different. <laughs> Like, he is still reeling from the events of Raccoon City, and he is going through this entire game trying to make things different, trying to change things, trying to be better. And the line of Luis just, like, hits super fucking hard. Like, yes, people can change. Yes, Leon, this time you can save the girl. This time you can become a hero. Yeah. Oh, like, it's so good! The last words of one character seeking validation applies to everyone else. Because even like, even Ada, later on in the game, she says to Leon, you think you ha you, like, you think you've changed, but you haven't changed a bit. Actually, like, we can, the, the, that cutscene is coming up soon after this boss fight. Yeah, after Louise dies, uh, Leon goes on a mad dash rampage against the entire castle, and has to fight this fucking thing, which is the true form of uh, Ramon Salazar. This Speaking uh, of change, you see this right here showcases the sh change with Salazar from an ugly little freak into an uglier freak. The, it's really, it's really oh, symbolic and fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot emphasize, I cannot emphasize how much of a piece of shit Salazar is, both on the inside and on the outside. Like there is a l tiny little detail in the Ramon lore that essentially. Oh, 
like uh, me and Nick talked about this, and it's like the funniest yeah. thing ever. Cause there was a point like before the Los Illuminados shit, where like Salazar was being like a tiny little goblin, and mm -hmm. one of the maid servants of the Salazar family really didn't oh. like Ramon, and at one point like she called them like Pulgarcito. Which means little thumb. Little, like, little tick. Like, little... Yeah. Little fucking piece of shit. And... Yep. Ramon, because he's a narcissist monster, took that so fucking personally that he sent that maidservant to die. And after that, throughout the entirety of this battle that he has with Leon, he calls... Leon, Leon. Pulgarcito. Pulgarcito. Yeah, he, he's like fucking, like, like... Pro like projecting. projecting onto Leon and this battle even though it's like very annoying and like very hard because like the boss HP is yeah. like through the roof like this entire mm -hmm. fight both him and Leon are going through these like trying to one-up each other like oh you you you're the hero of the story well I'm gonna crush you Leon like in the the, the script says that you have to die now and then like Leon says like, oh that is that is a shitty script who wrote the script I I will beat you now blah 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 and like they 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 have this entire fucking like one-liner battle this fucking metaphor going on through the entire fight that is just the stupid stupidest pettiest shit and ramon like gets increasingly more, more and more and mad more and more. at leon for not dying yeah. and like at one point yeah. he was like die 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 you fucking idiot and die <laughs> one detail i really like too about it is that as the fight goes at the start it's very clear that all of ramon's insults and everything he's saying are directed at Leon specifically. Mm -hmm. But as the fight goes and he it's clear that he's losing and he starts to have his friggin' mental breakdown, everything he's saying, it's like he's forgotten that he's fighting Leon because everything he's saying is just insults that he would have heard from like his father. Yep. yep. Because he starts talking to Leon like he's his dad all of a sudden, like halfway through the fight, because he's having such a bad mental breakdown that he's just projecting everything that he's insecure about onto Leon. Pulgarcito, Pulgarcito. And I, lo I love this, like, stage metaphor, like, oh, the stage is set for the final act. Oh, Le Mr. Kennedy, you're just an extra in my script. Oh, well, who wrote this sh This is a bad shitty script. And everyone, and they goes like, oh, don't worry, Mr. Kennedy. My scripts are the most, like, high first, first action grade fucking scripts in the land. And it's like, the it's just so fucking <laughs> Yeah. I think I think my favorite of the insults Leon has in this fight is when like Ramon starts cursing for the first time and he goes, Watch your language, my lord. What will others think of you? And Ramon just <laughs> fucking loses it. Anyway, the, the, this guy's this guy's just like I, I, he's not up there with Chief Irons when it comes to like being detestable, but he's just like the most hateable out of the villains in yeah. this game. Like you, you get you get Vitores Mendes, which is basically like a sentient Mr. X. You get Ramon Salazar, which is like a hateable piece of shit that like nobody likes. You get Krauser, which is like the emotional villain that has like actual real connections to Leon, and then you get Lord Sadler, which is like the actual mastermind behind the scenes. Like the 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 villain catalog of Resident Evil Four is masterful. No, oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Every single character feels so incredibly distinct and fulfills a completely different role in the story. Like every single one of them, I think, is a very strong villain for a completely different reason. All right, here we go. Ah, woman. All right, <laughs> this is a remake. Ah, oh, damn it. Ah, oh, damn it. Looking for something. Can't believe she's going through this entire game in heels. Yeah. She goes through every game in heels, and I can't believe it. Yeah, but especially here, it's it's like a village. There's no like road Mud or anything. Mud and shit. Yep. That's what the grappling hook's for. Right. You look like you've got something to say. I have something to ask you, but I don't think I'll get a straight answer. You'll get a gay answer. Do you, it, like, do you, Ada, you, do you like me? I've <laughs> <laughs> uh, got a question to ask you. I don't know if I'll get a straight answer. Will you go out with me? <laughs> and Ada just looks out, looks out from like, looks out into the sea. 
uh, what do you think? <laughs> Raccoon City. Oh, you know, after the incident, the world changed. Again, it was like a billion 9-11s. Try to save one person, a hundred others die. I guess I changed too. See, there it is again. You. Leon S. Kennedy. You haven't changed. You just think you have. Oh, see? There it is. And what's, what's amazing about that scene, right, is that, like, oh, uh, is I... my question. Thank you. Have you changed, Ada? Ah! Or are you just trying to use me again? What do you think? Oh, hello, Cecil. Hey, Cecil. Yeah, like, you see, that's what I'm getting at, right? Like, the, 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 like, what I love so much about, like, this scene and how it lines up with freaking Luis's last words is, like, Le Leon's convinced himself that he's changed and he's a different person than he was in Raccoon City, but he's still the same person he is. Like, he still has all the same core values that Leon did before. He just thinks he's different. And then when he asks if Ada's changed, she's convinced of the complete opposite, where she's convinced I've never changed once since Raccoon City. <sighs> but we see throughout this game that she gains a stronger moral compass and becomes a better person. So the two of them have complete parallel character arcs from each other. Also, uh, welcome to the island. This is God, like, I, this is essentially the lab section of Resident Evil 4 is like an entire third of the game. Uh, this area used to suck in Resident Evil 4 original, except bar for a few sequences, and it just becomes so much better in the remake. I yeah. love the way this place looks in the remake. I fucking love like industrial style settings in horror. So uh. to explain this place uh, for the people that do not know, uh, Lord Sadler, the main cult leader of this entire operation, does not work off like a random cave in Spain. He actually originated from this island. It is not actually named, I think. I don't think that this island ever cast a name specifically, but this is the island that uh, the cult members of Los Illuminados were banished from after the Salazars managed to beat back the plague and seal, them, seal it off in the castle. This island essentially became uh, the Sadler family's like, banishment uh, place where they lived for like centuries I think centuries uh, where they had like either like a smaller version of the Plaga in still in their family or they were just very committed to the fucking religion <laughs> thank, you. thank you Sapphire Jade for the five dollars the this island became after after the Plagas were unearthed back from the Salazar castle this became the main base of operations for the bigger part, the the actual military part of the Los Illuminatus cult. They took the most capable members of the village and the castle and turned them into soldiers that would be outposted in this island where like the researchers and the scientists would be taken to and stronger versions of Las Plagas would be created in this island to further, like, uh, Lord Sa Sadler's plan of TAKING OVER THE WORLD! So that's why you see all those, like, ganados with, like, crossbows and, like, pig masks and, like, like bulletproof vests and shit. Like, this is the peak of what Sadler has to offer when it comes to, like, actually keeping up with the modern world. They have, like, fucking laser turrets and shit. It's crazy. Yep. And like, I just, I thematically just adore too, how you spend the entire game in this like, like cultic, gothic, like village and castle. And the moment you get away from it, and you go to like the root of where it's coming from. It just completely shifts to this like industrial military base that is just completely conflicting with everything else. I just visually think that is so fucking cool for like an ending location to this game. Yep. All right. Uh, just make Here we go. So one of the experiments that were going on at this island after Leon finds Ashley locked up in here, Leon has to go through the labs of this facility. Sorry, fucked up. Jesus fucking Christ. Look at this. Oh, God. <laughs> 
That is so fucked up. <sighs> so, one of the experiments going on in this island is a stronger version of the Plagas, which honestly is not really that medically complicated. It is literally just they put a bunch of Plaga eggs into like a few corpses. Like, I think there's dozens of Plaga eggs all around the body of the host. And that ends up creating one of the scariest fucking creatures. There we go. In the entire Resident Evil universe. <clears throat> Subject analog analysis. Regenerador. Regenerator. Date, April 9th. At last, I have created new life. I call it Regener Regenerador. Its metabolic capacity is incredible. Unless all the parasites residing within its organism are destroyed, its tissue can regenerate indefinitely. April 10th. Upon examining the body with a biosensor scope, I was able to confirm that the parasites behave like vital organs for the host, almost as though it has multiple hearts. This new creation of mine is essentially immortal. Surely even Dr. Frankenstein himself would want to shake my hand in admiration. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, weird. April 13th. I shared the news of my achievement with that pretentious bastard colleague of mine. His face went white! Then he started scribbling something in his notebook. I thought he'd be impressed, but instead he actually had the nerve to warn me of the so-called dangers. <laughs> He's a fool. I have everything <laughs> under control. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, the subject went wild and escaped its cryogenic tank. I was the real fool. <laughs> oh my god. So you know, you know what's fucking crazy about these notes? Yeah. I think what's fucking crazy about these notes is that there's two of these in Resident uh. Evil 4. Because separate ways is another note. Separate oh. Ways has another note with the monster that appears at the end of that DLC that is exactly that too, where it's like, we created this monster, but don't worry, we have it under control. That's the regenerator. Shit, we did not. <laughs> <That>. <laughs> like, Resident Evil 3 Remake also had that of the guy creating the, 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 the Hunter Gammas in like the sewers, and he went like, oh, my precious little Hunter Gammas, they would never attack me. Page two. Oh. Ah, shit, it escaped. I was the real <laughs> fool. And now this motherfucker working for Sadler is like, oh my god, I have created the ultimate bioweapon. The, the essentially immortal monster. I will call it the Regenerador. They, it, they're so advanced and evil and like fucked up. There's no way that, that there's no way that this could possibly go wrong. I had a guy tell me that this could go horribly wrong, but there's no way that this could go wrong. Page two, the, they escaped. Went wrong. I was the real. <laughs> I love the regenerators specifically in terms of their lore because, like, the regenerator note it literally reads like some guy saying, "Yeah, so um, I've actually created a new type of monster called the Hell Spawn. I learned about it from this book called Don't Create the Hell Spawn: A Cautionary Tale. I opened it up and decided I'd create one." Honestly, I don't know what they were on about. I think it was a good idea. Page two, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> My God. Uh, every time, every fucking time, people thought, people on Twitter when they saw that fucking meme thought that that was just an exaggeration. No, it literally happens no. in most of the games. <laughs> Thank you, Ultima, for the 10 months. Uh, I fucked up. 90% of the researchers and scientists and fucking in this fucking universe. So yeah, I created this. I created this super mega gorilla that's like has AK-47 forearms and is like twice the size of a regular gorilla. We have it locked up in the basement and we're poking with sticks. It gets really mad, but there's no way that it got out. Page two, it got out. Ah, oh, so fucking good. Anyways, Leon gets the key card and frees Ashley from the prison and, in, and like injects her with a, like a little antivirus, anti anti plaga, anti parasite thing. You yep. temporary fix. You want to continue, yep. Sack? <laughs> yeah, I got you. I got you. So yeah. Um, he gives her the friggin' he gives her the temporary fix that allows them to be able to suppress the plaga for the time being. Because at this point. Now that they're on the island, the main goal is getting to Luis's lab with the key he gave them, so that they can uh, so that they can surgically remove the plaga. Um, 
So, okay, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm trying to remember the timeline of events here. It's at this point that the two of them end up running into Sadler. Yep, they use yeah. a fucking wrecking ball because this game is awesome. Right, so, yeah. And they, they bust through a wall. They go through this freaking amazing wrecking ball sequence. And as they're on the way, they end up running into the fucking Amber, which houses like, what's it like? The fucking like, it's not the Queen Plaga. That was that was in the original, but it wasn't in the remake. Uh, the the, um, the, ma the main story here, yeah, people get wires crossed because they're very similar. So uh, in the remake story, the Plagas were essentially preserved inside of Amber. And this little bit, this big ass piece of shit over there contains like hundreds of Plaga like specimens, like just dormantly lying in the amber. And inside of one of those little pieces, they actually find one of the boss plagas, the 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 controller plagas. Like it like they, they have like this like little little stones, like amber stones. And one of those is Hey Sapphire J, thank you for the five dollars. Is a controller plaga, which can give the host the ability to control other subservient plagas without the uh, with the ability to still re like remain conscious. Like uh, Vitores Mendes, Ramon Salazar, uh, Krauser, and Lord Sadler all have different variations of this controller plaga that gives them the abilities of the plaga while still keeping their mental faculties in check. So, <laughs> Lewis has the possession of that amber which has the has the plaga that can control all the plagas and ada is trying to get that amber so that she can sell it to bioweapon corporations that really want a way to control their bioweapons remotely and the plagas is like the one parasite that is able to actually do that which is why there's it's so desperately seeked by corporations outside of Los Illuminados. Mm-hmm. Yes. So yeah, they they stumble across it, and they also stumble across uh, Lord Sadler, finally in the flesh, because that's something I think about a lot with this remake, is this is the first time we see him in person, unlike the original game. I think um, this is better, though. Like, I, I, I agree. Yeah. He makes like, him more spooky instead of just some dude. Yeah, I don't know about you, but in the original, I, th I thought that Sadler was like the sidekick of the real final boss or, or something. Yeah. He didn't really feel like the final boss. He just looked like me. some pope. Until I saw him at the end and and he turned into that thing, you know? Uh, he, yeah, no, I, he, in, in this I one, he looks like a, lot, a lot more regal and a lot more menacing. Yeah. Yeah, they make him so much more intimidating. And I just... I love how basically every vision of him before this moment is just that, a vision where he's communicating through the character's minds. Like he's just this distant yeah. presence that is like sort of this representation of their infection getting stronger until the end where they finally arrive at him. And like, I mean, literally right here, he's able to just raise up his hand and mind control Ashley into pointing her gun, like the Leon's gun at him. That's some Star Wars bullshit. Like I was, I was actually just about to say they make him into fucking Palpatine. Yup. Like, yes, I was about Palpatine. to fucking say that. And I love him so much for that as a villain. He's awesome. I love this cutscene um, specifically as well, because in this moment, Ashley is actually showing her willpower here because she is resisting control from the main Plaga. Now, not only that, but she is able to not only prevent herself from shooting Leon, but also take out two of the like servants behind Leon as well. Yeah. Like, like, like she desperately fights for control in this scenario, and it's just so fucking badass. And eventually, one, once, like, she has no chance, the gun, like, jams. Because she's, like, shaking, desperately trying not to shoot Leon. And, like, with, with gun, with these types of guns, like, if you don't hold them straight, like, it, they just fucking jam. The, the, the bullet just jams in there. In the casing. So like she like, she essentially like saves Leon's life in this moment. It's cool too because like earlier in the game, she can't even resist against Sadler's control when the Plaga inside of her was weaker, and now it's like a stronger state where it's more developed and she's able to resist still. Like, <laughs> so fucking cool. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so oh, yes. like Sadler kidnaps Ashley because like you know, 
He's still fucking strong. Thank you, China Ball, for the one gifted. And where else are we going now? Yeah, I'm trying to remember the lead up because I just remember like I just remember whenever Leon <gasps> saved yeah, her. Yeah, fucking sa fucking Krauser. Okay, back to Krauser. Oh yeah, that was right. That was yeah. Krauser was in the lead up to that. I forgot if you fought Krauser before or after saving Ashley from Sadler. Holy shit, the shit with Krauser. I love this. This is so, so fucking gay. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, every yep, every yeah, single no Resident doubt. Evil protagonist has their gay villain that has it out for them. <laughs> <laughs> every single one. All right, so, here we go. Yeah, Krauser at this point in the game has essentially created this like massive like obstacle field of death for Leon to essentially recreate like all of the training that the two of them went together and simulate the kind of like um, missions that the two of them would have went on together as like a way to test to see if he's still like a rookie in his mind or if he's actually learned, which just as a premise for a level is so fucking cool. Here is the actual details of what actually made Krauser evil. So who's going to read it? <coughs> Zach, you want to read it? You, do you want me to read sure, it? Sure, I, I, I can read it. I can read it. Okay. I'll read it with a shitty uh, Krauser voice. <clears throat> Hold on, let me get a drink of water first. <clears throat> Operation Javier. Oh, shit. Few people have heard the name, oh. even within the highest ranks of the U.S. government. And little wonder, too. The operation was not made public. It was conducted in secret and then buried. The reason being, it was too inhumane. And we need to let the Let's Player move on the... There we go. It all started back in 2002, when a small unit of U.S. Special Forces was sent to infiltrate an area of South America. Their mission was to eradicate the drug cartels. The whole operation took several years to prepare for and only the most elite soldiers were selected to participate. I don't know if the mission was a failure or not, but I do know the fate of those elite soldiers once it was over. Apparently, the entire unit was wiped out except for the commanding officer, Major Redacted. Yeah, that's right, I'm an SCP now. And not by the cartels, by the US. It shouldn't have been difficult to extract a single stranded unit. All it would have taken was a single helicopter. But for some reason, the military didn't act. Rumors say that the decision was the outcome of a power struggle among the top brass. Others say it was a directive from the former president himself. But we may never know the truth since it was all covered up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I'm certain of one thing. The US government let those people die. Brave young people who dedicated their lives to protect their country. I want to expose this crime. Not because it's my responsibility as a reporter. Wait, this isn't Krauser talking. <laughs> Oh, fuck, this wasn't Krauser talking. <laughs> ah, shit. This, oh, just, shit. this is just, this is just John Residence at it again. Ah, yeah. Yeah, John, John Residence. <laughs> man, I was putting my heart and soul into that too. Come on, man, you can't do that to me. Uh... Uh, <laughs> uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh damn it! Anyway, so yeah, uh, so Krauser and Leon were part of Operation Javier, which, by the way, was a thing in the original timeline of the games. Operation Javier actually gets shown in Resident Evil Dark Side Chronicles, but it is a completely different operation than the one mm -hmm. shown in this game, or the one talked about in this game, because... So that one isn't canon anymore. It isn't canon anymore, because Operation Javier in Darkseid Chronicles is, like, not fucked up, 
like it was both Leon and Krauser getting sent into like South Africa to like rescue a people from a bioterrorist attack in South America and like rescuing a lady that was infected with the T Veronica virus and eventually like she used her T Veronica power powers to like kill a huge ass monster in the middle of like the South American like like a like huge dam in South America. Like the operation went fine actually like in the original timeline, Operation Javier was actually pretty cool. But then, yeah. Krauser saw what happened with the T. Veronica virus and thought, Mmm, that's pretty powerful. I, I too would like to get some of that power dick, please. So then he went yeah. on to, like, contact Los Illuminados. So I, I, like, actually, I, I like that in the remake, it actually shows, like, Oh my god, no, like, he's actually really fucked up from this, like, very corrupt, uh, like, like traumatizing experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like you can basically treat Dark Side Dark Side Chronicles as not canon. Oof. Which, like, by the way, can I just say, mm -hmm. I love Krauser so much for everything he is as a villain in this game, but I also kind of hate Krauser because Krauser was such a good villain in this game yep. that like every single Resident Evil villain, especially in the movies, is just Krauser again. Yep. Like. So many Resident Evil villains after RE4 are like, you think I'm evil? Wait till you hear about my trauma that explains why I want to end the world. Oh my god, the evil umbrella or the evil government traumatized me by going through this event that showed me that I act that you need to have power to be able to survive in this world. I will now take the virus and infect this random part of the world to show that you yeah you need to be powerful. It's like every single fucking movie is about that. Every movie's about that. It's all because of Krauser. Krauser's the one that started that trend. Yep. Uh, also, gay fucking Krauser becoming so obsessed with like rookie cop Leon that he took under his wing that after Operation, Operation Javier he fucking has like post-it notes and like images of Leon in his fucking like training camp and he fucking is writing with like red lipstick I guess the 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 <laughs> the, the, the words I'm waiting in front of like Leon's pictures picture of Leon, red lipstick, I'm waiting, heart emoji. Like, what the fuck? Like, who are you kidding here, Krauser? Oh, yeah, uh, this is uh, Krauser talking to Leon because he knew that he was going to get here because, of course. Unwell to yeah. make it this far, rookie. I've prepared a battlefield up ahead just for us soldiers. Watered by the blood of generations, hundreds. The perfect place to put an end to what happened two years ago. I also put some rose petals along on the trail for you. Don't think too hard about that, rookie. At the end of a trail, you'll see a beautiful candle lit dinner. <laughs> Yeah, I and put a seat with I, your name on it. I I I I, I prepared a, a, a heart shaped bed for your rookie in case you needed to rest up before our final battle. I want to make sure you're treated well. Anyway, so th that this essentially lines up the whole plan to adopt Ashley Graham and like put her into the cult's control and then send her back out into America and be able to control the world by using the president of the United States. Boy, this was written like before the current political landscape. Whenever people thought that fucking America was like the one true power of the entire world that could change everyone's minds and. F Oh my fucking god, like, people thought the US was the shit back then. Anyways, here we go. I've been waiting for you, uh, rookie. Oh, worried about the girl, is that it? That's just like you. You always had poor judgment. Should have known men were the better option. If you think I'm gonna let <laughs> yeah. you out of here, <laughs> you're even more naive than I Oh, Ark the Green Wolf makes an excellent point. Reminder, he was actually shirtless in the original. Don't worry, he will go shirtless. Oh, yeah. You yeah. Can't save her. You can't save anyone. Give it up, Krauser. 
Being a lackey for these maniacs won't bring your men back. And what the hell for? Revenge on the government? You think they would want that? Revenge. You think I'm doing all this for revenge? Yes. Isn't that what this is all about? Yeah, pretty much. In that jungle, I had a revelation. The most important thing in this world is pure, unadulterated power. God. Shout out to his theme song. Me that. You know you were always an asshole. But at least you had some kind of code. Some honor. <laughs> Look at you now. He changed. Enough reminiscing. Move out and draw fire, soldier. <laughs> Cool backflip. Anyway, so Krauser, am I right? Yeah. <sighs> Love this guy so much. It never actually clicked with me until you said it, Zach. Yeah, no, that's totally the main motivation of every single shitty fucking Resident Evil CGI movie villain. They're all just every Krauser. Yep. Every single one, it's it's all the same, like, cutting, like, it's all the same, like, rinse and repeated origin story. I was some soldier in some big battle. Evil corporation traumatized me because I got to watch my friends die. Now I'm a bioterrorist. Yep. And it's all because Krauser was such a good villain. They're like, oh, well, if we do Krauser again, people will like this villain. But the problem is, Every everyone single just one of them Krauser. Shit. Yep. <laughs> huh. And Krauser's just better than them, too. Like... <laughs> Yep. Oh, here we go. Let's shout out to this. I told you. Again. And again. Look at my nips. Ew. Uh. You're too soft to do what's necessary. And these nipples are rock hard. <laughs> That's the difference between you and me, rookie. I'm rock hard. I never go soft. Oh, I really like one of these lines. From now. Time to finish Not your training. Actual slight horror, horror movie sequence here. <laughs> Krauser has my favorite voice actor in this entire game. He does so well. I was not convinced, but I actually really like him now. What was the line? So your true power? This. Oh, I'd ask for a refund. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, Leon. <laughs> yes. It's not wrong. So eventually they move out into this big ass arena and they have a fight. And yeah, actually he's not wrong. Like Krauser spent those two years desperately trying to find more power for himself after what happened with Operation Javier. And then comes in fucking Leon S. Kennedy, rookie badass cop extraordinaire without any fucking superpowers, just comes in, shoots him a bunch of times and kills him. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, you really didn't fucking plan this out, did you? That's Resident Evil bosses in a nutshell, really. Oh, like, yeah! Heisenberg yeah, just turns into a monster for no reason. Have the fucking yeah. villains in this goddamn series yeah. inject themselves with superpower, DNA, fucking altering bioweapons, and a guy with a gun and, and shoots them. And becomes a bigger target. <laughs> and then I always, I always think, too, like, what's their plan after the boss fight. Yeah! Like, yeah. congrats, Krauser, you have a sword for an arm now. What are you gonna fucking do with that? I'm pretty sure that he can regenerate back the arm, but then there's shit like, like, fucking Irving in Resident Evil 5. I was gonna say, what the fuck about Irving? Where, like, Irving just injects himself and becomes, like, a giant sea monster, and he's or just Heisenberg. stuck like that, and he's super happy about it. Heisenberg. Or Heisenberg that destroys his body and mangles himself up to become like a giant mech. And then just, Heisen just like, look at me now, he Ethan. He Heisenberg, like, Heisenberg, I can accept more just because, like, he was clearly going, like, I'm going to take over the world. And so, like, obviously he was going to be doing stuff with that body he had, as stupid as it looked. I just love that Krauser is, like, the perfect encapsulation of, like, oh, 
I need more power. I will I will acquire more power using this evil virus slash parasite slash mold thing. And then I, once again, some guy with a with a with a shotgun and some nades just absolutely destroys him. No questions yeah, and asked. Like, and like jokes aside to, with that too, like the the way he's defeated is so fucking cool too, because like after Leon finally beats him and he's on the ground, like, waiting to die, it's the one and only time he calls him by his actual name instead of Rookie. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is one of the best lines in the game. That when when this happened in my original Resident Evil 4 playthrough, my fucking neurons, my neurons fucking exploded at this line. Because it's such a perfect, like, oh, wow, you're actually saying what you felt like at this moment. You know you know how he has, like, a bravado and he shows himself, like, oh, man, I need more power, blah, 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 blah. Like, you know how he's, he's like, a fucking Resident Evil villain that tries to hype himself up, right? Mm -hmm. This is the one line that actually shows what Krause's problem really is. There. There it is. There it is. That's the inferiority complex laid bare for everyone to see. So even though Leon is like a rookie cop, he was raised up as basically becoming like the best agent in the entire like fucking US military, right hand to the president and like the person that was going to protect the entire family. Like Krauser got spited being the mentor to Leon and not being able to reach the same heights that he did. He saw Leon's potential better than anyone. And after Operation Javier, he realized, oh wait, I'm nothing compared to Leon. Like that is so fucking good. Because unlike all these other CGI movie villains, this is actually a personal story between Krauser and Leon. Krauser is legitimately even, even hurt. What? And even, even if they don't show it. Yeah, it's like, come on, rookie. Show me what you got that I don't. Show me what you got that I didn't have that made me lose all my men in that operation, that made me get abandoned by my government, that made me get thrown aside for you it's like oh it's so good you know and it's and it's like it's 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 such a good like personal struggle between villain and hero too because like this also like I, again i keep going back to i just find this plot detail so cool it goes back to what luis said too in his last words about people changing because like this entire fight is essentially just showing leon like just how much this guy just like slipped into madness after this entire thing happened. So you've got like the two different perspectives of a bad person can become good and a good person can just completely lose their mind and become evil too. God, I fucking love this game. Anyway, like, so... Oh my god. You beat Krauser's face in really, really badly with like a pistol and a shotgun compared to his giant fucking Plaga arm. Fucking love that line. It's so small. And down. You what you have to do. I love it. Yep.
Oh. Oh. There it is. And from then on, Leon stops carrying the Marvin's knife. And carries now, instead now carries Krauser's knife. The fighting knife. Which is his original. And that's the original knife, knife that he had. RE4. From, yep, from the original RE4. And it is such a perfect way to like show Leon's character development throughout the game. Like after finally defeating his mentor. He is able to move on from Raccoon City and gain the power that he desperately seeked after the events of RE2 to finally be able to change the story and be able to save someone at the end. It's like, it's so perfect, you know, like, beat the mentor, gain the knife, gain the power, move on from your past trauma, become the hero that the world needs. It's like, yeah, like this that that fight to me feels way more like the final boss than the actual final boss. If I'm being real, oh, there's uh, you you just need to like take care of like the the alien queen now, basically. Like the emotional through line of Leon's story ends there. Like that that's the moment where like the hero gets the sword to like defeat the 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 the, the evil villain at the end. Like that's the moment where like the the hero is reassured that he can in fact do this. It's yeah, perfect. Can't believe it that they somehow tied Resident Evil 4 into the greater Resident Evil canon by actually making it a personal story for Leon that carried from Resident Evil 2. Also, shout out to the greatest character in Resident Evil lore, Mike. Oh yeah, fucking Mike. Yeah. Hold on. Fuck yeah, Mike. I genuinely appreciate how much more helpful he is in the remake. Holy shit. Yeah, so Leon calls in for, like, backup, like, at the very fucking beginning of the game, back in the village, and it takes, like, literally, like, 12, more than 12 hours for, like, Mike to arrive. They send one chopper to rescue the <laughs> president's daughter. They send one more guy in there, because I guess they were short-staffed back then. Nah, Mike's all they needed. I mean, yeah, yeah he's doing pretty know. good fucking work. I just love the idea that the president's daughter is being held up and kidnapped by a bunch of crazy cultists. And after this, this information is laid out by the special, like, special, like, agent guy, Leon S. Kennedy, and he's calling for help. Like, they send one guy in there. They don't, like, the, you know, the president's daughter, like, you would figure, like, the entire fucking armada of the U.S. would be after these guys. But no, they just send one guy. I just love one that. One guy. They sent the one-man army, Mike, to go deal with it so they can help the other one-man army, Leon. Anyway, so after going through a whole gauntlet, they get to the end there. Motherfucker! That shot is so good. Yep. Da na 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 na. And then all the fucking no beast doors, his friggin' servants come out of the fire. So yeah, that sets up Sadler to be the final villain that you have to face at the end of the game. Uh, originally in the original Resident Evil 4, uh, Mike gets shot out of the sky by a fucking rocket launcher, which is way goofier. I feel like that's mm -hmm. much better, honestly. Yes. Uh huh. All right, here we go. Oh, bitch. You have come, my child. What do you want? I simply wish to share this gift 
with as many as possible. I like Anthony Oliver's comment. Fall. Yeah, like Sadler has that kind of like lich kind of vibe to him. <laughs> that he can just do one single command and just controls your body and fucking renders you completely unable to move. I fucking love that about him. <laughs> you humble yes, don't you think? You see, we are all connected through the holy body. And now your flesh and bones, your very thoughts, are already one with us. Creepy oh, guy. Shit. Why do you reject serenity when you need only accept the sacred gift? She did. Sadler! <laughs> ah, yes. The time has come. All this lamb to join our covenant. Oh, blessings on him and the sweet Here we go. Exalt all and let, let it be so. Leon! Ada! I love that detail of him fucking moving all the bullets into his palm. So Ooh. unnecessary. So I mean, goddamn unnecessary. It is <laughs> one of his attacks in separate ways. But yeah. So this is like for speedrunners, this is like the worst part of the game because like it's a scripted like walk around sequence, uh, but yeah. emotionally this is the best. Mm -hmm. Ashley. After all that shit, after the village. After the castle, after the island, Leon gets to Laboratory B, the offices of Luis Serra, and he is like about to fall to the Plaga, clutching Ashley in his arms, and he's hallucinating and going through visions and seeing like specters of like other Plaga's members, like around him and he's just like fucking going through it trying to like save Ashley as desperately as he possibly can like it really makes you feel like Leon is like fighting through every single fucking shred of force of will he has to be able to save Ashley here it's such a good fucking sequence mm -hmm. and at the end here He finally gets here, and he uses Luis's key that he gives you. This time, it has to be different. God. Louise helps out one last time. Yeah, exactly, Noel. You go first. No way. Like I told you, I'm gonna get you home safe. Here goes nothing. Oh yeah, this is like a super mega extra machine. They kill the Plagas with radiation. And it looks so painful. It is so Yo. fucking painful. Why didn't the cult destroy this thing? Oh, no, because, like, this is a research lab. Like, they need this thing so that they are able to, like, 
remove the parasites from test subjects and reinsert it again and like be able to understand like the weaknesses of the plaga like this is actually really necessary for their research it was also locked up mm -hmm. yeah it was also locked up like who the fuck thinks that like a fucking guy from the village is going to be able to get here you know in time mm -hmm. yeah also, I love it, the moment that he sees that Ashley is now safe and the Plagas is off of her body, he just... Then he collapses. Collapses. Like, he sees the he sees the monitor and goes like, Oh, yes, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> All the exhaustion hits him at once. Yep. No, literally, though. Like, he fucking collapsed. And after that, I mean... Ashley saves him by getting the Plagas off of his body. So, you know, an eye for an eye, I guess. You help me, I help you. I like, mm -hmm. I like, the, I like the relationship in the remake. Like, it's much more of a team scenario instead of just a yeah. damsel in distress. I know. The two of them feel like they both go through an arc as a result of being around each other rather than just, like, Leon saves the girl and that's about it. Yep. Yeah, it's really cool. I don't hate the original, but this is way better. It is objectively a better game in every single way than the original RE4, which is fucked up for me to say because RE4 original was my favorite game of all time, and then this surpassed it. Easily. God. His favorite game went from Resident Evil 4 to Resident Evil 4. <laughs> no kidding, huh? That's crazy. <laughs> well, that's about it. Uh, this is pretty much the end of the game. Wow, we spent a lot of time in this one. I told yeah. you we were going to spend the most time on Resident Evil 4. I mean, mm -hmm. this game is fucking worth it. Uh, we're still not even done, so let's keep going. Oh yeah, uh, we got uh, everything that had to do with Louise here. The lore room. The lo this is yeah, the, the lab lore room for the entirety of Resident Evil 4. Yeah, this is where this is where it's confirmed that Louise was the like one of the people responsible for the creation of Nemesis, which was actually so huge to realize the first time you play this. Uh, this also explains the role of the Plagas for the entirety of the Resident Evil series moving forward, because once again, even though this was a very contained story in and of itself and completely ignored the rest of the Resident Evil canon, after the Plagas are introduced, they become the hot ticket item for every single other bioweapons manufacturer like terrorist organization specifically because of this <coughs> do not be fooled into thinking that the last plagas are merely tools for creating powerful bioweapons their true value lies in their ability to control no matter how hostile the subject a single injection can turn anyone into a faithful servant who needs spies when you can turn yesterday's enemy into today's ally Uh, controlling just one insider can bring an entire organization, an entire country, to its knees. Mass production of the superior species has made this possible. We have empowered Sadler. It is clear what he intends to do next. Uh, can you imagine if Sadler had that much control? Six billion loyal servants at his sole command. There would be no opposition, no war. Maybe for the first time in human history, the world would know peace. But I know how Sadler and the others have oppressed the people of this island for generations. I know how he treats them. That is no way to live. And because of that, I won't let it happen. Fuck yeah, Luis. Let's go, Luis. Oh yeah, he is, yeah, literally, Europe Laboratory 6 Dream Team, Umbrella Corporation, that right there smack dab in the middle of it is Luis Serra. Yeah, there you go. Fuck. And if I look up, I look up Resident Evil, uh, Europe Laboratory 6. Hold on. This sample, which I've come to call the Amber, was just sitting in the storeroom collecting dust. We used to have ample specimens for experimentation in the past, so it makes sense that, that this one was overlooked. 
In fact, the only reason I brought it back to my lab was because of its peculiar shape. Uh, uh. I think it was time reading that one. After a basic analysis, I've changed my mind. The amber possesses a very unique quality. Although small and in a suspended state, it contains the same organ found in the nominant species, which I've only seen in Sadler himself. When fully developed, the amber may rival or even perhaps surpass Sadler's power. So this is the shit that Ada's boss wants. Because it's really the only Plaga that matters. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the Amber was confiscated by Sadler before I could make any further progress on my research. He may be on to me. I need to get my hands on that sample again and escape in order to continue my research elsewhere. It's the only way to counter Sadler. Yeah, because, like, Luis saw the fucking superpower that was going on here and said, like, yeah, yeah, no, I need to... Sh I need to turn over a new leaf. This is way too much. I need to become a hero. I need to make up for my past crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I don't think I can trust this outside group either, but I've already come this far. Hopefully I can sweet talk my way out of this one too. I'll have to, for the world's sake. <sighs> Man. Just a little bit more. Anyways. Finally. Oh yeah, uh, by the way, uh <laughs> Yeah, one of the uh members Adam's of <laughs> Yeah, one of the members of the Los Illuminados, I think one of the founding members of Los Illuminados is called fucking Adam Sadler. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so fucking funny if you know the actor Adam Sandler from the fucking Adam Sandler movies. I just it's just a really fucking funny detail. Anyways, the final confrontation between uh, good and evil. Leon sees Ada dangling from a fucking beam in the middle of an arena that's very clearly, obviously a trap. He says, "He's gonna lure me out." Uh, time, time to rescue the Asian bitch once again. He thinks he's going to lure me out. Stay here. Proceeds Goes to lure into the trap. <laughs> This uh, is such a good upgrade from the original's boss fight, by the way, because, like, the way that Sadler talks to you during this entire fight makes him so fucking scary. Yeah. The unhinged yeah, but... nature of Monster Sadler is the best. Yeah, but I also really like the, the original's line that Sadler says that it's like, Oh, Mr. Kennedy, you entertain me! Yes! And something like that. Uh, the I really miss that line. The original Sadler and Resident Evil 4 original game is like a fucking movie villain, and he knows it, and he's so fucking smug about it. In the, origi in the original, he kind of looked like he didn't really give, him, give much of a shit about the cult, and he was just yeah. using it for his own purposes. In the remake, he actually feels like he's really into the cult and genuinely believes the cause of Los Illuminados. Yes. He feels way more evil. Yes. Yeah. In I, in, in, in the original, he felt like a fucking con artist that just kind of like yeah. accidentally fell into the position of a cult leader because he's like, oh, I watched your American movies and this is how the hero ends up winning at the end. But I don't think so, Mr. Kennedy. It's like, he's such a piece of shit in the original. Such a smug shit. And here he actually feels like a threatening, imposing he's influence. so angry in this one. Yeah, like, the cult for him is not a facade. It is, like, genuinely what he wants for the world, and that's, like, way scarier. Yep. yep. Like, no fucking hesitation, just die. The power couple!
Okay, uh, yeah, before, so before, cool. I, before I mute this, just listen to how fucking psychotic Sadler sounds here. Like, holy fucking shit, Sadler. Calm down, yeah, bro. Like... Yeah, throughout this entirety of the fight, I remember, like, if people want to go back into, like, the VOD that I had for Resident Evil 4 Remake, like, I was going through this entirety of the fight, freaking the fuck out, because his voice actor goes so crazy on this fight. Like, he genuinely believes the, the cause of Los Illuminados here, so he's, like, the most imposing villain. Also... A design detail about this fight, uh, this giant monster that's like, what, fucking seven feet tall? He's way taller than in the original game. Uh, it's actually just a giant version of the, the Plaga popping out of the heads of the small, yeah. uh, the, the, the small Ganado. Like, even though he's like this giant ass super mega monster what he really is is just a bigger version of the plagas that pop out of people's yeah, like cause... heads like you can yeah, see the tiny little legs, legs. Yeah. you can see the tiny little legs at the bottom there yeah. oh my god yeah, the body's still there it's it's way more visible Boy. in the original uh mm -hmm. because you know the, the original like has like less polygons to work with but sadler even though he is posing himself as this like giant god leader thing that's gonna bring out the end of the universe he really is just another fucking guy that got taken over by like these parasites he's just his like tiny little human body is just dangling off at the bottom there i just find that very cool that he's like the ultimate version of the plaga parasite that pops out of people's heads i find that very cool huh i never noticed that at any point while playing these games it's very, if you go into like a Sadler original version in the original like game, it's extremely noticeable because his purple robes are still hanging from the bottom of his body. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let me look at this. God. This is so fucking climatic. Like, look at this shit. Ah, I love this. He just walks on like a fucking superhero. This job. Yay! In the middle of all these fleshiness and stuff, and there's just like one big weak spot. See, this is like probably my favorite version of the whole like super cinematic final boss because like there's a real final boss that leads into the super cinematic shoot the shit out of this loser yeah. type of like cutscene. And you can actually die here if you don't evade the attacks very much. Uh, th I think this is uh, this remade boss fight was actually kind of inspired by Dead Space because like this final specific part oh, of the final boss yeah, kind of reminds me a lot about. of Dead Space. Yeah, even the attack. Yep, even the attacks where you have to like dodge around in the arena. Though this is way smaller than Dead Space. Anyway, yeah. after. Finally, after like this entire ordeal, Leon gets the coolest, stupidest fucking line of out of any Resident Evil protagonist right here, right now. Oh god. Oh yeah, I know. I know which one. This is my favorite. Badass! Oh, I love that, that he shot. I'll give you a whole fucking shit. You, you would, like, I, in my mind, in my mind's eye, I'm thinking, like, yeah, Leon has been cooking that up in the back of his head ever <laughs> since Sadler said, oh, I, I, you were blessed with the holly body, child. Uh, and Leon is just thinking in the back of his head, oh, I'll, I'll give you a holly body. 
Oh yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> tell that to him. He's gonna fucking cry. That's so lame. And then <sighs> Ada. What the hell are you doing? Nothing personal, Leon. Louis <sighs> made an arrangement. Don't worry, I'll take good care of it. Right here. You coming? You coming? I think we both know this. Where we go our separate ways. Get it? Because that's uh. the DLC that Ada Ada's campaign is called. Fuck the DLC. When this game released, we didn't even know that we were gonna get it. Yup. It just news came out out of nowhere, and it was the coolest shit. Oh yeah, of course, because it's Resident Evil. Of course, oh the teddy bear. Because this is Resident Evil, uh, Ada blows up the island at the end. It sets up the the uh, island's like remote detonation, fucking self destruction sequence. Because of course. Because of course. At this yes. point, I might have that planned. He had that point. planned, even though he was planning to take over the world. So like, yeah. why the fuck would you have a self destruct system going on in here? Whatever. Of course, yeah. Leon and Ashley have to escape in a fucking boat. From the island. Fun fact: When I was doing my Resident Evil fucking oh, that reminds me. yeah, when I was doing my Resident Evil like S plus professional run here on the channel, like yeah. before the season started, I was I did like twelve hours of this fucking game uninterrupted, yeah. and I got to this very last bit without saving, and I died I at the very. There for like Hours I at died year. at the fucking very end of the fucking boat, and I've never done that ever. Not in the original, not in this one. That was the first I time that I actually failed the boat sequence. I saw you die. It was just... And, and I didn't know what to, what to say. Honestly, it was kind of iconic in its own way. Yeah. I will eventually but go it, through it again, but yeah. The, the way you sink so slowly and anticlimactic. Ah, oh, that really hurt. Yep. You alright? I am not sure that was insane. Yay! Explosions! <laughs> oh yeah, another thing that we didn't talk about is... Mm -hmm. When you're escaping, mm -hmm. you see all these, like, um, villagers and shit oh, that yeah. are just on the floor because uh, the host is dead now, you know? Yeah, one of the weaknesses That's of the really control cool. plaga is that once the main controlling host of the plaga dies, every single plaga that was under Sadler's control just keels over and dies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's very cool. Leon says something like, oh, they don't have their master anymore. Yep. Mission accomplished, right? Mission accomplished. When you're home safe. Yeah. Thank you for saving me. Don't mention it. You know, I could put in a word with my dad. Have you assigned to my detail, if you're interested. You don't need me. You proved you could handle yourself. Even if you could use a lesson in knife safety. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Let's go home. Right off into the sunset. Yay. Condor one? Bruce to Condor one, do you read me? Come in. What Bruce a good goddamn Condor game. Uh, Sorry, I just I love Leon, I love how she was like, yeah, right. I could put in a word with my dad, Where get you get you into like uh, get you into protecting me. And everyone in chat just started going, no thanks, bro. No, no thanks, thanks, bro. <laughs> I mean, in the original remake, it was way more blatant. Like Ashley, like like that they are in the same boat, and Ashley goes like, hey Leon, oh fuck, hey Leon, after after this is all over, do you want to go back to my place and and get some overtime? 
It's like the most blatant, like, hey, Leon, you're, you, you're so fucking hot after this. Can you come to my place and rock my fucking pussy? And Leon says, no way, dude. <laughs> it's like, no dude, way, dude. No, no way, God. dude. <laughs> no. Uh, in, in, the, in the remake, it's like much less obvious, but it's like still pretty obvious that Ashley has like a massive crush on this guy because like, of course. Yeah, of course she would. Leon is like the hottest, hottest motherfucker ever. Who the fuck doesn't? So, but but yeah, I just find it cute. Like this is a cute way of doing it. It's like, hey Leon, we could like get more time together. Like I could have you assigned as like my personal bodyguard. And Leon is like, whatever. I want my Asian wife. God. She flew away. She flew away with the parasite. She, she left me again. She's gonna kill billions, Ashley, but she's such a bad bitch. <laughs> she, she, she's such a bad bitch, though. I can't get mad at her. She's so hot. <laughs> no, Ashley, I only want women that don't want to fuck me. <laughs> that's the thing, Ashley. You're nice and all, but that's the problem. I that's want the, the evil ones. She needs to hate me, Ashley. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's the story of Leon and Ashley and our Re Resident Evil 4. How much time did we spend on this fucking game? Like three three hours. hours? Worth it! <laughs> I mean, it's one of the best ones out there. I, I, we, we spent like 20 minutes, like 10 minutes talking about like Resident Evil Survivor because who the fuck cares about that, that game? This one's the main one. God. And after the credits, after all is said and done, and after everything's wrapped up, you get one of the... I, I, I freaked out because I didn't know much about the background of the Resident Evil lore at this point. Like, I thought that this was, like, completely diverging off the timeline, but no, but... The, the, this emphasizes the themes of change in the characters. <laughs> it's a very cool cutscene, regardless. me through. I've obtained the amber. Excellent. Yeah! Just one question. What are you planning to do with this? We do not pay you to ask questions. All you need to know is a new dawn is breaking. A hundred will give their lives so that just one may live. I am expediting that change. So, we're talking millions of casualties. Billions. Jesus, fuck. How ambitious. She's like, nope, no, nope. uh, none of that. Not no dealing with this. Oh, Leon. Oh my god. Okay, but like, Wesker's kind of a dumbass for telling her that. He yeah. was just really feeling himself that day. He was really proud of himself. He was real excited. Anyway, so yeah, that is the final scene of Resident Evil 4, in which it's actually revealed that the person that Ada was working for this whole time is... Albert freaking Wesker. Oh my god. Oh no. Heard some shit going on in Spain and realized, oh my god, I can get the Plagas from myself and become even more powerful. Holy shit. And so he sent out Ada to get the Amber or the Plaga sample for himself, for his own purposes. Basically for Resident Evil 5. Um, yeah. Now you may ask, hey, Phil, what the fuck? If Ada changed her mind about giving Al, like, Wesker the, the Plaga's Amber, 
how the hell did Wesker manage to do the whole thing with RE5, with like the Ouroboros and shit? Well, dear, dear viewer, turns out Wesker had a whole other plan going, cooking up behind the scenes. <laughs> because while Ada wasn't looking, Wesker went into that island and yoinked fucking Krauser's corpse. Yep. So that he could use the dead Plaga from the corpse. As Just like he did in with Steve. What with, with the with Veronica. Like from the from the he could get the controller plug from Krauser, just like he did with Steve back in Code Veronica. Mm -hmm. And just like he did with the G virus. It's like he mm -hmm. does that every single time. Ada just... went against my plans. All according to plan. <laughs> 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 every time he just like resurrects himself every time that people fuck him over with the plans he says no nah, I was actually my plan the whole time Chris you don't you don't even know he's the mastermind after all I love it because it's like Resident Evil 1 what was his plan gather combat data kill the stars members whoops turns out the tyrant killed him back turns out no whoops double whoops Double plot twist. It was actually his whole plan all along to get killed by the tyrant <laughs> to activate his fucking virus bullshit. Then, with the fucking Code Veronica operation, he wanted to get Alexia and, like, get the, the T Veronica from Alexia. Whoops! Alexia broke out of containment and fucking tried to kill him, and he's not powerful enough to beat Alexia. Guess I'll just yoink Steve's corpse. It was my plan all along to get Steve's corpse with the fucking T Veronica virus. And then with this one, it's like, oh, I actually planned all along for fucking Ada to betray me. Yoink grabs Krause's corpse. Like. I, I swear, the only time he's ever been called the mastermind, it was because he called himself that to make yep. him feel better. Turns out that even though, like, Albert Wesker, like, Albert Wesker hypes himself up as, like, the biggest, baddest bitch out of the entire lineup of bad guys in Resident Evil 5, but if you really pay attention to the story, he's just an idiot that has been bumble-fucking his way through the entire storyline since the first fucking game. He's just been like going over there, give me that corpse. Going over there, give me that corpse. Give me this <laughs> virus. Give me this other virus. I'm gonna get the T virus. I'm gonna get the, the G virus. I'm gonna get the T Veronica. I'm gonna get the Plagas. Oh, it's all going according to my master plan. I'm so smart. Even when I lose, I win. Sure, Wesker. <laughs> <laughs> I love him so much. All right. <laughs> and that is. Now. Resident, Resident Evil 5. That is Resident Evil 4. And we gotta end it off there. We no, got we too mad. Team. We've gone mad with power. We did too much. We talked a we bit. Did. We talked a bit game. A big game. We said that oh we were gonna cover the entirety of the Resident Evil storyline today. It's been eight hours. It's been nine hours. And yeah, we're only through Phil, the fourth game. Phil, let's keep going. It's only almost 4 a.m. after all. Nuh-uh. Uh -uh. my, my throat is shredded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I... Probably not even because you talk a, a lot, but because you did that crosser impression. No, no, dude. I'm, I am I kid you not. I was doing fine the entire stream until yeah. I did the Krauser voice, and that ruined my throat. And it wasn't even Krauser. It so. wasn't even Krauser! <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, man. Fucking damn Drink it. some water. So, will. we will probably reschedule the rest of this stream for, like, maybe some, next week? Or... Some other day. Yeah, wherever you two have the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll be kind of, like, kind of fun to have, like, a... Like, a cross-channel promotion or some shit where, like... The, the the second part is on, like, is on, like, sax channel or something. I don't fucking know. E oh, either. that'd be fun. That would, be fuck, that would be fucking fun. I would love to, like, not be behind the wheel of this thing. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, that was fun. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. We're only through the fourth game. Uh, if you guys are interested in what we're going to be talking about, hopefully next week. I don't know. We just need to, like, line it up, the schedules. Uh, mm -hmm. We still have, like, the entirety of Trisol. We have to talk about 
<sighs> Vladimir Sergei, which is actually the real villain of the Resident Evil story that you all didn't know. He was actually the secret villain all along that planned everything out from the very beginning. That was like the, the, the commander coronal of the Umbrella Corporation and was Wait. actually researching everything going on at the Arclay Mountains to be, to create the super mega tyrant of Talos project. You, you don't even fucking know what happened in there. Wait. And then you got Resident Evil 5 with Tricell and Albert Wesker and the Ouroboros project. And then you got Resident Evil Revelations with the T-Abyss virus and Resident Evil Revelations 2 with the Super Fear virus that I don't even know what the fuck the name of that one is. And Terra Grigia, the, flo the floating city in the, in the sea that got killed by like a giant satellite by like fucking ray weapon, solar weapon. Oh, and... Let's not forget about the A virus in the movies that was uh, the, created uh, by the poisoning virus. the entire water supply of America. And then you got the C uh, virus, which is like also another T virus strain. And then you got Simmons, which is like the super mega actual real villain that actually was the one responsible for everything all along. <laughs> And that, he's also an incel. That, that he is also an oh, incel that mm. is in love with Ada Wong and also is like he the leader. He is also like the leader of the of the fucking Illuminati, not loose Illuminatos, but like the actual oh, Illuminati right. of the uh, the lost Illuminati, the, the Illuminati oh, right. of the Resident Evil universe called the Family. And there's also the connections, and there's the Mutamycid with like with like uh, with Mother Miranda back in fucking. Europe again, and there's also like uh, like Evelyn with Resident Evil 7 and Louisiana And there's fucking Jake Mueller <laughs> Which oh. is Wesker's son uh, No, 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 shut do up, not, shut up, do shut not up, even shut up, get up. when we get to Resident Evil 6 no. I'm gonna pop a blood vessel. Okay, so All of that is a teaser because we're gonna talk about that on the next stream yeah. You think it got, you think this is stupid? Parts. I think we, we can might. I think we can hack it out in two. I think we can Don't hack it, it out in two. Don't jinx it. So hopefully you've enjoyed the first part of this series. <laughs> Holy <A> series. fuck. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, this was fun though, but yeah. I need to recover from this. Yep. And it wasn't yeah, even me the one too. That, that talked the most. Far from it. Really. <laughs> I, I need to chill. I'm streaming again tomorrow. Holy fuck. Oh, I'm sorry. My, oh my god. <laughs> nah, it's fine. We had fun. I'm also streaming tomorrow. <laughs> oh, so we're in the same boat. I'm the not streaming tomorrow. I don't stream ever. Thank you, time. Thank you, Susie Bell, for the five dollars. Hey, can you repeat everything in extreme? It wasn't this. <laughs> all right, so it all started at the no! Spencer Mansion. So basically, it was a string of murders Stop! happening at the Arkley Mountain. Stop! <laughs> Uh, all right so this has been this has been capcom's biohazard aka resident evil we'll be back next part time one. part one we'll be back next time with fucking vladimir sergey and the umbrella chronicles and resident evil 5 and every, every fucking everything else thank you for listening to our <laughs> Dumb hyperfixation bullshit. This was fun. It was wonderful to be able to just like air it out. It's like it's like it's like all my it's like all my pent up hyperfixation neurodivergent energy just got spent over eight hours. Yep. <sighs> and we get to do it all over again next time. It's probably gonna be also next. the same the same length. We went to four. Yeah. Next like the latest game of the franchise is eight, so we are literally halfway, halfway through. Halfway through. Yay! Oh yeah. It'll be peak autism. <laughs> peak autism. Uh, All right, okay. everybody. That That's it. All right. <laughs> Time to go. I'll see y'all later. Go. Thank you All for right. staying with us. Thank you. Thank bye you bye. so much. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Umbrella. Uh, umbrella. Uh, umbrella.
Oh, Barry! That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. Barry, thanks for saving my life.